This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kevin, a neural engine by Amazon Web Services. In conjunction with Laude Corpus, Software Safety, Audiobook Library Essentials, and Project Gutenberg. The Veil of Isis. Chapter 13. Alchemist. Thou always speakest riddles. Tell me if thou art that fountain of which Bernard Laura Trevigan writ? Mercury. I am not that fountain, but I am the water. The fountain compasseth me about. Sand of Aegeus, new light of alchemy. All that we profess to do is this, to find out the secrets of the human frame, to know why the parts ossify and the blood stagnates, and to apply continual preventatives to the effects of time. This is not magic, it is the art of medicine rightly understood. Bull or light in. Lo, warrior. Now the cross of red. Points to the grave of the mighty dead. Within it burns a wondrous light. To chase the spirits that love the night. That lamp shall burn unquenchably. Until the eternal doom shall be. No earthly flame blaze air so bright. Sir Walter Scott. There are persons whose minds would be incapable of appreciating the intellectual grandeur of the ancients, even in physical science, were they to receive the most complete demonstration of their profound learning and achievements. Notwithstanding the lesson of caution which more than one unexpected discovery has taught them, they still pursue their old plan of denying, and, what is still worse, of ridiculing that which they have no means of either proving or disproving. So, for instance, they will poo-poo the idea of talismans having any efficacy one way or the other. That the seven spirits of the apocalypse have direct relation to the seven occult powers in nature, appears incomprehensible and absurd to their feeble intellects, and the bare thought of a magician claiming to work wonders through certain cabalistic rites convulses them with laughter. Perceiving only a geometrical figure traced upon a paper, a bit of metal, or other substance, they cannot imagine how any reasonable being should ascribe to either any occult potency. But those who have taken the pains to inform themselves know that the ancients achieved as great discoveries in psychology as in physics, and that their explorations left few secrets to be discovered. For our part, when we realize that a pentacle is a synthetic figure which expresses in concrete form a profound truth of nature, we can see nothing more ridiculous in it than in the figures of Euclid, and nothing half so comical as the symbols in a modern work on chemistry. What to the uninitiated reader can appear more absurd than that the symbol? P. 462. Not 2, CO, 2, means soda. And that C2H6O is but another way of writing alcohol. How very amusing that the alchemists should express their as of, or creative principle of nature, astral light, by the symbol. Which embraces three things. First, the divine hypothesis, 2D, the philosophical synthesis, 3D, the physical synthesis that is to say, a belief, an idea, and a force. But how perfectly natural that a modern chemist who wishes to indicate to the students in his laboratory the reaction of a sodic carbonate with cream of tartar in solution, should employ the following symbol. Not 2, CO, 3 plus 2 HKC 4 H4 O6 plus AC equals 2 NOC 4 H4 O6 plus H2 O plus AC plus CO, 2 If the uninspired reader may be pardoned for looking aghast at this abracadabra of chemical science, why should not its teachers restrain their mirth until they have learned the philosophical value of the symbolism of the ancients? At least they might spare themselves from being as ridiculous as Monsieur de Merville, who, confounding the azoth of the hermetic philosophers with the azote of the chemists, asserted that the former worshipped nitrogen gas. Apply a piece of iron to a magnet, and it becomes imbued with its subtle principle and capable of imparting it to other iron in its turn. It neither weighs more nor appears different from what it was before. And yet, one of the most subtle potencies of nature has entered into its substance. A talisman, and itself perhaps a worthless bit of metal, a scrap of paper, or a shred of any fabric, has nevertheless been imbued by the influence of that greatest of all magnets, the human will, with a potency for good or ill just as recognizable and as real in its effects as the subtle property which the iron acquired by contact with the physical magnet. Let the bloodhound snuff an article of clothing that has been worn by the fugitive, and he will track him through swamp and forest to his hiding place. Give one of Professor Buchanan's psychometers a manuscript, no matter how old, and he will describe to you the character. p. 463. Of the writer, and perhaps even his personal appearance. 
Hand a clairvoyant a lock of hair or some article that has been in contact with the person of whom it is desired to know something, and she will come into sympathy with him so intimate that she may trace him through his whole life. Breeders tell us that young animals should not be herded with old ones, and intelligent physicians forbid parents to have young children occupy their own beds. When David was old and feeble his vital forces were recruited by having a young person brought in close contact with him so that he could absorb her strength. The late Empress of Russia, the sister of the present German Emperor, was so feeble the last years of her life that she was seriously advised by her physicians to keep in her bed at night a robust and healthy young peasant girl. Whoever has read the description given by Dr. Kerner of the seeress of Provorst, Madame Hof, must well remember her words. She repeatedly stated that she supported life merely on the atmosphere of the people surrounding her and their magnetic emanations, which were quickened in an extraordinary way by her presence. The seeress was very plainly a magnetic vampire, who absorbed by drawing to herself the life of those who were strong enough to spare her their vitality in the shape of volatilized blood. Dr. Kerner remarks that these persons were all more or less affected by this forcible loss. With these familiar illustrations of the possibility of a subtle fluid communicated from one individual to another, or to substances which he touches, it becomes less difficult to understand that by a determined concentration of the will an otherwise inert object may become imbued with protective or destructive power according to the purpose directing. A magnetic emanation, unconsciously produced, is sure to be overpowered by any stronger one with which it may come into opposition. But when an intelligent and powerful will directs the blind force, and concentrates it upon a given spot, the weaker emanation will often master the stronger. A human will has the same effect on the akasha. Upon one occasion, we witness in Bengal an exhibition of willpower that illustrates a highly interesting phase of the subject. An adept in magic made a few passes over a piece of common tin, the inside of a dish cover, that lay conveniently by, and while regarding it attentively for a few moments, seemed to grasp the imponderable fluid by handfuls and throw it against the surface. When the tin had been exposed to the full glare of light for about six seconds, the bright surface was suddenly covered as with a film. Then patches of a darker hue began coming out on its surface, and when in about three minutes the tin was handed back to us, we found imprinted upon it a picture, or p. 464. Rather a photograph, of the landscape that stretched out before us, faithful as nature itself, and every color perfect. It remained for about 48 hours and then slowly faded away. This phenomenon is easily explained. The will of the adept condensed upon the tin a film of akasha which made it for the time being like a sensitized photographic plate. Light did the rest. Such an exhibition as this of the potency of the will to affect even objective physical results, will prepare the student to comprehend its efficacy in the cure of disease by imparting the desired virtue to inanimate objects which are placed in contact with the patient. When we see such psychologists as Maudsley quoting, without contradiction, the stories of some miraculous cures affected by Swedenborg's father stories which do not differ from hundreds of other cures by other fanatics as he calls them magicians, and natural healers, and, without attempting to explain their facts, stooping to laugh at the intensity of their faith, without asking himself whether the secret of that healing potency were not in the control given by that faith over occult forces we grieve that there should be so much learning and so little philosophy, in our time. Upon our word, we cannot see that the modern chemist is any less a magician than the ancient theurgist or hermetic philosopher, except in this, that the latter, recognizing the duality of nature, had twice as wide a field for experimental research as the chemist. The ancients animated statues, and the hermetists called into being, out of the elements, the shapes of salamanders, gnomes, undines, and sylphs, which they did not pretend to create, but simply to make visible by holding open the door of nature, so that, under favoring conditions, they might step into view. The chemist brings into contact two elements contained in the atmosphere, and by developing a latent force of affinity, creates a new body water. In the spheroidal and diaphanous pearls which are born of this union of gases, come the germs of organic life, and in their molecular interstices lurk heat, electricity, and light, just as they do in the human body. Whence comes this life into the drop of water just born of the union of two gases, and what is the water itself? Have the oxygen and hydrogen undergone some transformation which obliterates their quality simultaneously with the obliteration of their form? Here is the answer of modern science, whether the oxygen and hydrogen exist as such, in the water, or whether they are produced by some unknown and unconceived transformation of its substance, 
is a question about which we may speculate, but in regard to which we have no knowledge. 9. p. 465. Nothing about so simple a matter as the molecular constitution of water, or the deeper problem of the appearance of life within it, would it not be well for Mr. Maudsley to exemplify his own principle, and maintain a calm acquiescence and ignorance until light comes? The claims of the friends of esoteric science, that Paracelsus produced, chemically, homunculi from certain combinations as yet unknown to exact science, are, as a matter of course, relegated to the storehouse of exploded humbugs. But why should they? If the homunculi were not made by Paracelsus they were developed by other adepts, and that not a thousand years ago. They were produced, in fact, upon exactly the same principle as that by which the chemist and physicist calls to life his animalcula. A few years ago, an English gentleman, Andrew Cross, of Somersetshire produced a car in the following manner, black flint burned to redness and reduced to powder was mixed with carbonate of potash, and exposed to a strong heat for fifteen minutes, and the mixture was poured into a black lead crucible in an air furnace. It was reduced to powder while warm, mixed with boiling water, kept boiling for some minutes, and then hydrochloric acid was added to supersaturation. After being exposed to voltaic action for twenty-six days, a perfect insect of the Ikari tribe made its appearance, and in the course of a few weeks about a hundred more. The experiment was repeated with other chemical fluids with like results. A Mr. Weeks also produced the Ikari and ferrocyanide of potassium. This discovery produced a great excitement. Mr. Cross was now accused of impiety and aiming at creation. He replied, denying the implication and saying he considered to create was to form a something out of a nothing. Another gentleman, considered by several persons as a man of great science, has told us repeatedly that he was on the eve of proving that even unfructified eggs could be hatched by having a negative electric current caused to pass through them. The mandrakes, due to more love fruit, found in the field by Reuben, Jacob's son, which excited the fancy of Rachel, was the cabalistic mandragora, notwithstanding denial, and the verses which refer to it belong to the crudest passages, in their esoteric meaning, of the whole work. The mandrake is a plant having the rudimentary shape of a human creature, with a head, two arms, and two legs forming roots. The superstition that when pulled out of the ground it cries with a human voice, is not utterly baseless. It does produce a kind of squeaking sound, on p. 466. Account of the resinous substance of its root which it is rather difficult to extract, and it has more than one hidden property and a perfectly unknown to the botanist. The reader who would obtain a clear idea of the commutation of forces and the resemblance between the life principles of plants, animals, and human beings, may profitably consult a paper on the correlation of nervous and mental forces by Professor Alexander Bain, of the University of Aberdeen. This mandragora seems to occupy upon earth the point where the vegetable and animal kingdoms touch, as the zoophytes and polypi do in the sea, the boundary being in each case so indistinct as to make it almost imperceptible where the one ceases and the other begins. It may seem improbable that there should be homunculi, but will any naturalist, in view of the recent expansion of science, dare say it is impossible? Who, says Bain, is to limit the possibilities of existence? The unexplained mysteries of nature are many and of those presumably explained hardly one may be said to have become absolutely intelligible. There is not a plant or mineral which has disclosed the last of its properties to the scientists. What do the naturalists know of the intimate nature of the vegetable and mineral kingdoms? How can they feel confident that for every one of the discovered properties there may not be many powers concealed in the inner nature of the plant or stone? And that they are only waiting to be brought in relation with some other plant, mineral, or force of nature to manifest themselves in what is termed a supernatural manner. Wherever Pliny, the naturalist, alien, and even Diodorus, who sought with such a laudable perseverance to extricate historical truth from its medley of exaggerations and fables, have attributed to some plant or mineral an occult property unknown to our modern botanists and physicists. Their assertions have been laid aside without further ceremony as absurd, and no more referred to. It has been the speculation of men of science from time immemorial what this vital force or life principle is. To our mind the secret doctrine alone is able to furnish the clue. Exact science recognizes only five powers in nature one molar, and four molecular, cabalist, seven, and in these two additional ones is enwrapped the whole mystery of life. One of these is a mortal spirit, whose reflection is connected by invisible links even with inorganic matter, the other, we leave to every one to discover for himself. 
says Professor Joseph Leconti. What is the nature of the difference between the living organism and the dead organism? We can detect none, physical or chemical. All the physical and chemical forces withdrawn from the common fund of nature, and embodied in the living organism, seem to be still embodied. p. 467. In the dead, until little by little it is returned by decomposition. Yet the difference is immense, is inconceivably great. What is the nature of this difference expressed in the formula of material science? What is that that is gone, and whither is it gone? There is something here that science cannot yet understand. Yet it is just this loss which takes place in death, and before decomposition, which is in the highest sense vital force. Difficult, nay impossible, as it seems to science to find out the invisible, universal motor of all life, to explain its nature, or even to suggest a reasonable hypothesis for the same. The mystery is but half a mystery, not merely for the great adepts and seers, but even for true and firm believers in a spiritual world. To the simple believer, unblessed with a personal organism, the delicate, nervous sensitiveness of which would enable him as it enables a seer to perceive the visible universe reflected as in a clear glass in the invisible one, and, as it were, objectively, there remains divine faith. The latter is firmly rooted in his inner senses, in his unerring intuition, with which cold reason has not to do, he feels it cannot play him false. Let human-born, erroneous dogmas, and theological sophistry contradict each other, let one crowd off the other, and the subtle casuistry of one creed fell to the ground the crafty reasoning of another one, truth remains one, and there is not a religion, whether Christian or heathen, that is not firmly built upon the rock of ages God and immortal spirit. Every animal is more or less endowed with the faculty of perceiving, if not spirits, at least something which remains for the time being invisible to common men, and can only be discerned by a clairvoyant. We have made hundreds of experiments with cats, dogs, monkeys of various kinds, and, once, with a tame tiger. A round black mirror, known as the magic crystal, was strongly mesmerized by a native Hindu gentleman, formerly an inhabitant of Dindigul, and now residing in a more secluded spot, among the mountains known as the Western Gods. He had tamed a young cub, brought to him from the Malabar coast, in which part of India the tigers are proverbially ferocious, and it is with this interesting animal that we made our experiments. Like the ancient Marcian Silly, the renowned serpent charmers, this gentleman claimed to be possessed of the mysterious power of taming any kind of animal. The tiger was reduced to a chronic mental numbness, so to say, he had become as inoffensive and harmless as a dog. Children could tease and pull him by the ears, and he would only shake himself and howl like a dog but whenever forced to look into the p. 468. Magic mirror, the poor animal was instantly excited to a sort of frenzy. His eyes became full of a human terror, howling in despair, unable to turn away from the mirror to which his gaze seemed riveted as by a magnetic spell. He would writhe and tremble till he convulsed with fear at some vision which to us remained unknown. He would then lie down, feebly groaning but still gazing in the glass. When it was taken away from him, the animal would lie panting and seemingly prostrated for about two hours. What did he see? What spirit picture from his own invisible, animal world, could produce such a terrific effect on the wild and naturally ferocious and daring beast? Who can tell? Perhaps he who produced the scene. The same effect on animals was observed during spiritual seances with some holy mendicants, the same one Assyrian, half heathen and half Christian, from Kanan Kolam, Cochin State, a reputed sorcerer, who was invited to join us for the sake of experimenting. We were nine persons and all seven men and two women, one of the latter a native. Besides us, there were in the room, the young tiger, intensely occupied on a bone, a wanderer, or lion monkey, which, with its black coat and snow-white goatee and whiskers, and cunning, sparkling eyes, looked the personification of mischief, and a beautiful golden oriole, quietly cleaning its radiant-colored tail on a perch, placed near a large window of the veranda. In India, spiritual seances are not held in the dark, as in America, and no conditions, but perfect silence and harmony, are required. It was in the full glare of daylight streaming through the open doors and windows, with a faraway buzz of life from the neighboring forest, and jungles sending us the echo of myriads of insects, birds, and animals. We sat in the midst of a garden in which the house was built, and instead of breathing the stifling atmosphere of a seance room, we were amid the fire-colored clusters of the erythrina the coral tree inhaling the fragrant aromas of trees and shrubs, and the flowers of the bignonia, 
whose white blossoms trembled in the soft breeze. In short, we were surrounded with light, harmony, and perfumes. Large nosegays of flowers and shrubs, sacred to the native gods, were gathered for the purpose, and brought into the rooms. We had the sweet basil, the Vishnu flower, without which no religious ceremony in Bengal will ever take place, and the branches of the ficus religiosa, the tree dedicated to the same bright deity, intermingling their leaves with the rosy blossoms of the sacred lotus and the Indian tuberose, profusely ornamented the walls. While the blessed one represented by a very dirty, but, nevertheless, really holy fakir remained plunged in self-contemplation, and some spiritual wonders were taking place under the direction of his will. P. 469. The monkey and the bird exhibited but few signs of restlessness. The tiger alone visibly trembled at intervals, and stared around the room, as if his phosphorically shining green orbs were following some invisible presence as it floated up and down. That which was as yet unperceived by human eyes, must have therefore been objective to him. As to the wanderer, all its liveliness had fled, it seemed drowsy, and sat crouching and motionless. The bird gave few, if any, signs of uneasiness. There was a sound as of gently flapping wings in the air, the flowers went traveling about the room, displaced by invisible hands, and, as a glorious azure-tinted flower fell on the folded paws of the monkey, it gave a nervous start, and sought refuge under its master's white robe. These displays lasted for an hour, and it would be too long to relate all of them, the most curious of all, being the one which closed that season of wonders. Somebody complaining of the heat, we had a shower of delicately perfumed dew. The drops fell fast and large, and conveyed a feeling of inexpressible refreshment, drawing the instant after touching our persons. When the fakir had brought his exhibition of white magic to a close, the sorcerer, or conjurer, as they are called, prepared to display his power. We are retreated to a succession of the wonders that the accounts of travelers have made familiar to the public, showing, among other things, the fact that animals naturally possess the clairvoyant faculty, and even, it would seem, the ability to discern between the good and the bad spirits. All of the sorcerer's feats were preceded by fumigations. He burned branches of resinous trees and shrubs, which sent up volumes of smoke. Although there was nothing about this calculated to a frightened animal using only his natural eyes, the tiger, monkey, and bird exhibited an indescribable terror. We suggested that the animals might be frightened at the blazing brands, the familiar custom of burning fires round the camp to keep off wild beasts, recurring to our mind. To leave no doubt upon this point, the Syrian approached the crouching tiger with a branch of the bale tree, sacred to Shiva, and waved it several times over his head, muttering, meanwhile, his incantations. The brute instantly displayed a panic of terror beyond description. His eyes started from their sockets like blazing fireballs, he foamed at the mouth, he flung himself upon the floor, as if seeking some hole in which to hide himself, he uttered scream after scream, that awoke a hundred responsive echoes from the jungle and the woods. Finally, Taking a last look at the spot from which his eyes had never wandered, he made a desperate plunge, which snapped his chain, and p. 470. Dashed through the window of the veranda, carrying a piece of the framework with him. The monkey had fled long before, and the bird fell from the perch as though paralyzed. We did not ask either the fakir or sorcerer for an explanation of the method by which their respective phenomena were affected. If we had, Unquestionably they would have replied as did a fakir to a French traveler, who tells his story in a recent number of a New York newspaper, called the Franco-American, as follows. Many of these Hindu jugglers who live in the silence of the pagodas perform feats far surpassing the prestidigitations of Robert Eugene, and there are many others who produce the most curious phenomena in magnetism and catalepsy upon the first objects that come across their way, that I have often wondered whether the Brahmins, with their occult sciences, have not made great discoveries in the questions which have recently been agitated in Europe. On one occasion, while I and others were in a cafe with Sir Maswell, he ordered his dobochi to introduce the charmer. In a few moments a lean Hindu, almost naked, with an ascetic face and bronze color entered. Round his neck, arms, thighs, and body were coiled serpents of different sizes. After saluting us, he said, God be with you, I am Chib Chandor, son of Chib Gantnail Mava. We desire to see what you can do, said our host. I obey the orders of Shiva, who has sent me here, replied the fakir, squatting down on one of the marble slabs. The serpents raised their heads and hissed, but without showing any anger. Then taking a small pipe, 
attached to a wick in his hair, he produced scarcely audible sounds, imitating the telopica, a bird that feeds upon bruised coconuts. Here the serpents uncoiled themselves, and one after another glided to the floor. As soon as they touched the ground they raised about one-third of their bodies, and began to keep time to their master's music. Suddenly the fakir dropped his instrument and made several passes with his hands over the serpents, of whom there were about ten, all of the most deadly species of Indian cobra. His eye assumed a strange expression. We all felt an undefinable uneasiness, and sought to turn away our gaze from him. At this moment a small chakra, monkey, whose business was to hand fire in a small brazier for lighting cigars, yielded to his influence, lay down, and fell asleep. Five minutes passed thus, and we felt that if the manipulations were to continue a few seconds more we should all fall asleep. Chandra then rose, and making two more passes over the chakra, said to it, Give. P. 471. The commander some fire. The young monkey rose, and without tottering, came and offered fire to its master. It was pinched, pulled about, till there was no doubt of its being actually asleep. Nor would it move from Sir Maswell's side till ordered to do so by the fakir. We then examined the cobras. Paralyzed by magnetic influence, they lay at full length on the ground. On taking them up we found them stiff as sticks. They were in a state of complete catalepsy. The fakir then awakened them, on which they returned and again coiled themselves round his body. We inquired whether he could make us feel his influence. He made a few passes over our legs, and instantly we lost the use of these limbs, we could not leave our seats. He released us as easily as he had paralyzed us. Cheap Chandra closed his seance by experimenting upon inanimate objects. By mere passes with his hands in the direction of the object to be acted upon, and without leaving his seat, he paled and extinguished lights in the furthest parts of the room, moved the furniture, including the divans upon which we sat, opened and closed doors. Catching sight of a Hindu who was drawing water from a well in the garden, he made a pass in his direction, and the rope suddenly stopped in its descent, resisting all the efforts of the astonished gardener. With another pass the rope again descended. I asked Chief Chandor, do you employ the same means in acting upon inanimate objects that you do upon living creatures? He replied, I have only one means. What is it? The will. Man, who is the end of all intellectual and material forces, must dominate over all. The Brahmins know nothing besides this. Soning Zetsin, says Colonel Yule, enumerates a variety of the wonderful acts which could be performed through the Dharani, mystic Hindu charms. Such were sticking a peg into solid rock, restoring the dead to life, turning a dead body into gold, penetrating everywhere as air does, in astral form, flying, catching wild beasts with the hand, reading thoughts, making water flow backward, eating tiles, sitting in the air with the legs doubled under, etc. Old legends ascribe to Simon Magus precisely the same powers. He made statues to walk, leapt into the fire without being burned, flew in the air, made bread of stones, changed his shape, assumed two faces at once, converted himself into a pillar, caused closed doors to fly open spontaneously, made the vessels in a house move of themselves, etc. The Jesuit Delrio laments. p. 472. That credulous princes, otherwise of pious repute, should have allowed diabolical tricks to be played before them, as for example, things of iron, and silver goblets, or other heavy articles, to be moved by bounds, from one end of the table to the other, without the use of a magnet, or of any attachment. We believe will power the most powerful of magnets. The existence of such magical power in certain persons is proved, but the existence of the devil is a fiction which no theology is able to demonstrate. There are certain men whom the Tartars honor above all in the world, says Friar Rickold, viz., the Baxidi, who are a kind of idol priests. These are men from India, persons of deep wisdom, well conducted and of the gravest morals. They are usually with magic arts, they exhibit many illusions, and predict future events. For instance, one of eminence among them was said to fly, but the truth, however, was as it proved, that he did not fly but did walk close to the surface of the ground without touching it, and would seem to sit down without having any substance to support him. This last performance was witnessed by Ibn Battuta, at Delhi, adds Colonel Yule, who quotes the friar in the book of Ser Marco Polo, in the presence of Sultan Muhammad Tuflok, and it was professedly exhibited by Abraham at Madras in the present century, a descendant doubtless of those Brahmins whom Apollonius saw walking two cubits from the ground. 
It is also described by the worthy Francis Valentine, as a performance known and practiced in his own day in India. It is related, he says, that a man will first go and sit on three sticks put together so as to form a tripod, after which, first one stick, then a second, then a third shall be removed from under him, and the man shall not fall but shall still remain sitting in the air. Yet I have spoken with two friends who had seen this at one and the same time, and one of them, I may add, mistrusting his own eyes, had taken the trouble to feel about with a long stick if there were nothing on which the body rested, yet, as the gentleman told me, he could neither feel nor see any such thing. We have stated elsewhere that the same thing was accomplished last year, before the Prince of Wales and his suite. Such feats as the above are nothing in comparison to what is done by professed jugglers, feats, remarks the above quoted author, which might be regarded as simply inventions if told by one author only, but which seem to deserve prominent notice from being recounted by a series of authors, certainly independent of one another, and writing at long intervals of time and place. Our first witness is Ibn Battuta, and p. 473. It will be necessary to quote him as well as the others in full, in order to show how closely their evidence tallies. The Arab traveler was present at a great entertainment at the court of the Viceroy of Kanza. That same night a juggler, who was one of the Khan's slaves, made his appearance, and the emir said to him, Come and show us some of your marvels. Upon this he took a wooden ball, with several holes in it, through which long columns were passed, and laying hold of one of these, slung it into the air. It went so high that we lost sight of it altogether. We were in the middle of the palace court, there now remained only a little of the end of a thong in the conjurer's hand, and he desired one of the boys who assisted him to lay hold of it and mount. He did so, climbing by the thong, and we lost sight of him also. The conjurer then called to him three times, but, getting no answer, he snatched up a knife as if in a great rage, laid hold of the thong, and disappeared also. By and by, he threw down one of the boy's hands, then a foot, then the other hand, and then the other foot, then the trunk, and last of all the head. Then he came down himself, puffing and panting, and with his clothes all bloody kissed the ground before the emir, and said something to him in Chinese. The emir gave some order in reply, and our friend then took the lad's limbs, laid them together in their places, and gave a kick, when, presto, there was the boy, who got up and stood before us. All this astonished me beyond measure, and I had an attack of palpitation like that which overcame me once before in the presence of the Sultan of India, when he showed me something of the same kind. They gave me a cordial, however, which cured the attack. The Kaji of Karudin was next to me, and quoth he, Walla. Tease my opinion there has been neither going up nor coming down, neither marring, nor mending. Tease all hocus-pocus. And who doubts but that it is a hocus-pocus, an illusion, or maya, as the Hindus express it? But when such an illusion can be forced on, say, ten thousand people at the same time, as we have seen it performed during a public festival, surely the means by which such an astounding hallucination can be produced merits the attention of science. When by such magic a man who stands before you, in a room, the doors of which you have closed and of which the keys are in your hand, suddenly disappears, vanishes like a flash of light, and you see him nowhere but hear his voice from different parts of the room addressing you and laughing at your perplexity, surely such an art is not unworthy either of Mr. Huxley or Dr. Carpenter. Is it not quite as well worth spending time over, as the lesser mystery why barnyard cocks crow at midnight? What had been bought to the more, saw in China about the year 1348, Colonel Yule shows Edward Melton, an Anglo-Dutch traveler, witnessing. p. 474. In Batavia about the year 1670, one of the same gang, of conjurers, says Melton, took a small ball of cord, and grasping one end of the cord in his hand slung the other up into the air with such force that its extremity was beyond reach of our sight. He then climbed up the cord with indescribable swiftness. I stood full of astonishment, not conceiving where he had disappeared, when lo! A leg came tumbling down out of the air. A moment later a hand came down, etc. In short, all the members of the body came successively tumbling from the air and were cast together by the attendant into the basket. The last fragment of all was the head, and no sooner had that touched the ground than he who had snatched up all the limbs and put them in the basket turn them all out again topsy-turvy. Then straightway we saw with these eyes all those limbs creep together again, and, in short, form a whole man, who at once could stand and go just as before without showing the least damage. Never in my life was I so astonished, 
and I doubted now no longer that these misguided men did it by the help of the devil. In the memoirs of the Emperor Jahangir, the performances of seven jugglers from Bengal, who exhibited before him, are thus described. Ninth, They produced a man whom they divided limb from limb, actually severing his head from the body. They scattered these mutilated members along the ground, and in this state they lay some time. They then extended a sheet over the spot, and one of the men putting himself under the sheet, in a few minutes came from below, followed by the individual supposed to have been cut into joints, in perfect health and condition. 23rd. They produced a chain of fifty cubits in length, and in my presence threw one end of it toward the sky, where it remained as if fastened to something in the air. A dog was then brought forward and being placed at the lower end of the chain, immediately ran up, and reaching the other end, immediately disappeared in the air. In the same manner a hog, a panther, a lion, and a tiger were successively sent up the chain, and all equally disappeared at the upper end of the chain. At last they took down the chain, and put it into the bag, no one ever discovering in what way the different animals were made to vanish into the air in the mysterious manner above described. We have in our possession a picture painted from such a Persian conjurer, with a man, or rather the various limbs of what was a minute before a man, scattered before him. We have seen such conjurers, and witnessed such performances more than once and in various places. p. 475. Bearing ever in mind that we repudiate the idea of a miracle and returning once more to phenomena more serious, we would now ask what logical objection can be urged against the claim that the reanimation of the dead was accomplished by many thaumaturgists? The fakir described in the Franco-American might have gone far enough to say that this willpower of man is so tremendously potential that it can reanimate a body apparently dead by drawing back the flitting soul that has not yet quite ruptured the thread that through life had bound the two together. Dozens of such fakirs have allowed themselves to be buried alive before thousands of witnesses, and weeks afterward have been resuscitated. And if fakirs have the secret of this artificial process, identical with, or analogous to, hibernation, why not allow that their ancestors, the Genosophis and Apollonius of Tiana, who had studied with the latter in India, and Jesus, and other prophets and seers, who all knew more about the mysteries of life and death than any of our modern men of science, might have resuscitated dead men and women? And being quite familiar with that power that mysterious something that science cannot yet understand, as Professor Leconte confesses knowing, moreover, whence it came and whither it was going, Elisha, Jesus, Paul, and Apollonius, enthusiastic ascetics and learned initiates, might have recalled to life with ease any man who was not dead but sleeping, and that without any miracle. If the molecules of the cadaver are imbued with the physical and chemical forces of the living organism, what is to prevent them from being set again in motion, provided we know the nature of the vital force, and how to command it? The materialist can certainly offer no objection, for with him it is no question of reinfusing a soul. For him the soul has no existence, and the human body may be regarded simply as a vital engine a locomotive which will start upon the application of heat and force, and stop when they are withdrawn. To the theologian the case offers greater difficulties, for, in his view, death cuts asunder the tie which binds soul and body, and the one can no more be returned into the other without miracle than the born and infant can be compelled to resume its fetal life after parturition and the severing of the umbilicus. But the hermetic philosopher stands between these two irreconcilable antagonists, master of the situation. He knows the nature of the soul a form composed of nervous fluid and atmospheric ether and knows how the vital force can be made active or passive at will, so long as there is no final destruction of some necessary organ. The claims of Gafferless which, by the by, appeared so preposterous in 1650 were later corroborated by science. p. 476. He maintained that every object existing in nature, provided it was not artificial, when once burned still retained its form in the ashes, in which it remained till raised again. Duchesne, an eminent chemist, assured himself of the fact. Kircher, Digby, and Valmont have demonstrated that the forms of plants could be resuscitated from their ashes. At a meeting of naturalists in 1834, at Stuttgart, a receipt for producing such experiments was found in the work of Uyner. Ashes of burned plants contained in vials, when heated, exhibited again their various forms. A small obscure cloud gradually rose in the vial, took a defined form, and presented to the eye the flower or plant the ashes consisted of. The earthly husk, wrote Udinger, remains in the retort, while the volatile essence ascends, like a spirit, perfect in form, but void of substance. 
and, if the astral form of even a plant when its body is dead still lingers in the ashes, while skeptics persist in saying that the soul of man, the inner ego, is after the death of the grosser form at once dissolved, and is no more? At death, says the philosopher, the one body exudes from the other, by osmos and through the brain, it is held near its old garment by a double attraction, physical and spiritual, until the latter decomposes, and if the proper conditions are given the soul can re-inhabit it and resume the suspended life. It does it in sleep, it does it more thoroughly in trance, most surprisingly at the command and with the assistance of the hermetic adept. Yamlikus declared that a person endowed with such resuscitating powers is full of God. All the subordinate spirits of the upper spheres are at his command, for he is no longer a mortal, but himself a god. In his epistle to the Corinthians, Paul remarks that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Some persons have the natural and some the acquired power of withdrawing the inner from the outer body, at will, and causing it to perform long journeys, and be seen by those whom it visits. Numerous are the instances recorded by unimpeachable witnesses of the doubles of persons having been seen and conversed with, hundreds of miles from the places where the persons themselves were known to be. Hermotimus, if we may credit Pliny and Plutarch, could I will fall into a trance and then his second soul proceeded to any distant place he chose. The Abbe Tridheim, the famous author of steganography, who lived in the 17th century, could converse with his friends by the mere power of his will. I can make my thoughts known to the initiated. p. 477. He wrote, at a distance of many hundred miles, without word, writing, or cipher, by any messenger. The latter cannot betray me, for he knows nothing. If needs be, I can dispense with the messenger. If any correspondent should be buried in the deepest dungeon, I could still convey to him my thoughts as clearly and as frequently as I chose, and this quite simply, without superstition, without the aid of spirits. Coordinates could also send his spirit, or any messages he chose. When he did so, he felt as if a door was opened, and I myself immediately passed through it, leaving the body behind me. The case of a high German official, a counselor Wesserman, was mentioned in a scientific paper. He claimed to be able to cause any friend or acquaintance, at any distance, to dream of every subject he chose, or see any person he liked. His claims were proved good, and testified to on several occasions by skeptics and learned professional persons. He could also cause his double to appear wherever he liked and be seen by several persons at one time, by whispering in their ears a sentence prepared and agreed upon beforehand by unbelievers, and for the purpose, his power to project the double was demonstrated beyond any cavil. According to Napier, Osborne, Major Laws, Kane Willett, Nikoforovich, and many other modern witnesses, the cures are now proved to be able, by a long course of diet, preparation, and repose to bring their bodies into a condition which enables them to be buried six feet underground for an indefinite period. Sir Claude Wade was present at the court of Ranjit Singh, when the fakir, mentioned by the Honorable Captain Osborne, was buried alive for six weeks, in a box placed in a cell three feet below the floor of the room. To prevent the chance of deception, the guard comprising two companies of soldiers had been detailed, and four sentries were furnished and relieved every two hours, night and day, to guard the building from intrusion. On opening it, says Sir Claude, we saw a figure enclosed in a bag of white linen fastened by a string over the head. The servant then began pouring warm water over the figure. The legs and arms of the body were shriveled and stiff, the face full, the head reclining on the shoulder like that of a corpse. I then called to the medical gentleman who was attending me, to come down and inspect the body, which he did, but could discover no pulsation in the heart, the temples, or the arm. There was, however, a heat about the region of the brain which no other part of the body exhibited. Regretting that the limits of our space forbid the quotation of the p. 478. Details of this interesting story, we will only add, that the process of resuscitation included bathing with hot water, friction, the removal of wax and cotton pledges from the nostrils and ears, the rubbing of the eyelids with ghee or clarified butter, and, what will appear most curious to many, the application of a hot wheaten cake, about an inch thick to the top of the head. After the cake had been applied for the third time, the body was violently convulsed, the nostrils became inflated, the respiration ensued, and the limbs assumed a natural fullness, but the pulsation was still faintly perceptible. The tongue was then anointed with ghee, the eyeballs became dilated and recovered their natural color, and the fakir recognized those present and spoke. It should be noticed that not only had the nostrils and ears been plugged, 
but the tongue had been thrust back so as to close the gullet, thus effectually stopping the orifices against the admission of atmospheric air. While in India, a fakir told us that this was done not only to prevent the action of the air upon the organic tissues, but also to guard against the deposit of the germs of decay, which in case of suspended animation would cause decomposition exactly as they do in any other meat exposed to air. There are also localities in which a fakir would refuse to be buried, such as the many spots in southern India infested with the white ants, which annoying termites are considered among the most dangerous enemies of man and his property. They are so voracious as to devour everything they find except perhaps metals. As to wood, there is no kind through which they would not burrow, and even bricks and mortar offer but little impediment to their formidable armies. They will patiently work through mortar, destroying it particle by particle, and a fakir, however holy himself, and strong as temporary coffin, would not risk finding his body devoured when it was time for his resuscitation. Then, here is a case, only one of many, substantiated by the testimony of two English noblemen one of them an army officer and a Hindu prince, who was as great a skeptic as themselves. It places science in this embarrassing dilemma, it must either give the lie to many unimpeachable witnesses, or admit that if one fakir can resuscitate after six weeks, any other fakir can also, and if a fakir, why not a Lazarus, a Shunammite boy, or the daughter of Jairus? p. 479. And now, perhaps, it may not be out of place to inquire what assurance can any physician have, beyond external evidence, that the body is really dead? The best authorities agree in saying that there are none. Dr. Todd Thompson, of London, says most positively that the immobility of the body, even its cadaverous aspect, the coldness of surface, the absence of respiration and pulsation, and the sunken state of the eye, are no unequivocal evidences that life is wholly extinct. Nothing but total decomposition is an irrefutable proof that life has fled forever and that the tabernacle is tenantless. Democritus asserted that there existed no certain signs of real death. Pliny maintained the same. Asclepiades, a learned physician and one of the most distinguished men of his day, held that the assurance was still more difficult in the cases of women than in those of men. Todd Thompson, above quoted, gives several remarkable cases of such a suspended animation. Among others he mentions a certain Francis Neville, a Norman gentleman, who twice apparently died, and was twice in the act of being buried. But, at the moment when the coffin was being lowered in the grave, he spontaneously revived. In the 17th century, Lady Russell, to all appearance died, and was about to be buried, but as the bell was tolling for her funeral, she sat up in her coffin and exclaimed, It is time to go to church. Dimorborok mentions a peasant who gave no signs of life for three days, but when placed in his coffin, near the grave, revived and lived many years afterward. In 1836, a respectable citizen of Brussels fell into a profound lethargy on a Sunday morning. On Monday, as his attendants were preparing to screw the lid of the coffin, the supposed corpse sat up, rubbed his eyes, and called for his coffee in a newspaper. Such cases of apparent death are not very infrequently reported in the newspaper press. As we write, April, 1877, we find in the London letter to the New York Times, the following paragraph, Miss Annie Goodale, the actress, died three weeks ago. Up to yesterday she was not buried. The corpse is warm and limp, and the features as soft and mobile as one in life. Several physicians have examined her, and have ordered that the body shall be watched night and day. The poor lady is evidently in a trance, but whether she is destined to come to life it is impossible to say. P. 480. Science regards man as an aggregation of atoms temporarily united by a mysterious force called the life principle. To the materialist, the only difference between a living and a dead body is, that in the one case, that force is active, and the other latent. When it is extinct or entirely latent the molecules obey a superior attraction, which draws them asunder and scatters them through space. This aspersion must be death, if it is possible to conceive such a thing as death where the very molecules of the dead body manifest an intense vital energy. If death is but the stoppage of a digesting, locomotive, and thought writing machine, how can death be actual and not relative, before that machine is thoroughly broken up and its particles dispersed? So long as any of them cling together, the centripetal vital force may overmatch the dispersive centrifugal action. Says Eliphas Levi, change attests movement, and movement only reveals life. The corpse would not decompose if it were dead. All the molecules which compose it are living and struggle to separate. 
And would you think that the spirit frees itself first of all to exist no more? That thought and love can die when the grossest forms of matter do not die? If the chain should be called death, we die and are born again every day, for every day our forms undergo change. The Kabbalists say that a man is not dead when his body is entombed. Death is never sudden, for, according to Hermes, nothing goes in nature by violent transitions. Everything is gradual, and as it required a long and gradual development to produce the living human being, so time is required to completely withdraw vitality from the carcass. Death can no more be an absolute end, than birth a real beginning. Birth proves the pre-existence of the being, as death proves immortality, says the same French Kabbalist. While implicitly believing in the restoration of the daughter of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, and in other Bible miracles, while educated Christians, who otherwise would feel indignant at being called superstitious, meet all such cases as that of Apollonius and the girl said by his biographer to have been recalled to life by him, with scornful skepticism. Diogenes Laertius, who mentions a woman restored to life by Empedocles, is treated with no more respect, and the name of pagan thaumaturgist, in the eyes of Christians, is but a synonym for imposter. Our scientists are at least one degree more rational, they embrace all Bible prophets and apostles, and the heathen miracle doers in two categories of hallucinated fools and deceitful tricksters. But Christians and materialists might, with a very little effort on their p. 481. Part, show themselves fair and logical at the same time. To produce such a miracle, they have but to consent to understand what they read, and submit it to the unprejudiced criticism of their best judgment. Let us see how far it is possible. Setting aside the incredible fiction of Lazarus, we will select two cases, the ruler's daughter, recalled to life by Jesus, and the Corinthian bride, resuscitated by Apollonius. In the former case, totally disregarding the significant expression of Jesus she is not dead but sleepeth, the clergy force their God to become a breaker of his own laws and grant unjustly to one what he denies to all others, and with no better object in view than to produce a useless miracle. In the second case, notwithstanding the words of the biographer of Apollonius, so plain and precise that there is not the slightest cause to misunderstand them, they charge Philostratus with deliberate imposture. Who could be fairer than he, who less open to the charge of mystification, when, in describing the resuscitation of the young girl by the Tyanian sage, in the presence of a large concourse of people, the biographer says, she had seemed to die. In other words, he very clearly indicates a case of suspended animation, and then adds immediately, as the rain fell very fast on the young girl, while she was being carried to the pile, with her face turned upwards, this, also, might have excited her senses. Does this not show most plainly that Philostratus saw no miracle in that resuscitation? Does it not rather imply, if anything, the great learning and skill of Apollonius, who like Asclepiades had the merit of distinguishing at a glance between real and apparent death? A resuscitation, after the soul and spirit have entirely separated from the body, and the last electric thread is severed, is as impossible as for a once disembodied spirit to reincarnate itself once more on this earth, except as described in previous chapters. A leaf, once fallen off, does not reattach itself to the branch, says Eliphas Levi. The caterpillar becomes a butterfly, but the butterfly does not again return to the grub. Nature closes the door behind all that passes, and pushes life forward. Forms pass, thought remains, and does not recall that which it has once exhausted. Why should it be imagined that Asclepiades and Apollonius enjoyed exceptional powers for the discernment of actual death? Has any modern school of medicine this knowledge to impart to its students? Let their authorities answer for them. These Prodigies of Jesus and Apollonius p. 482 are so well attested that they appear authentic. Whether in either or both cases life was simply suspended or not, the important fact remains that by some power, peculiar to themselves, both the wonder workers recalled the seemingly dead to life in an instant. Is it because the modern physician has not yet found the secret which the theurgists evidently possess that its possibility is denied? Neglected as psychology now is, and with the strangely chaotic state in which physiology is confessed to be by its most fair students, certainly it is not very likely that our men of science will soon rediscover the lost knowledge of the ancients. In the days of old, when prophets were not treated as charlatans, nor thaumaturgists as impostors, there were colleges instituted for teaching prophecy and occult sciences in general. Samuel is recorded as the chief of such an institution at Ramah. Elisha, also, 
at Jericho. The schools of Azim, prophets or seers, were celebrated throughout the country. Hillel had a regular academy, and Socrates is well known to have sent away several of his disciples to study mantisism. The study of magic, or wisdom, included every branch of science, the metaphysical as well as the physical, psychology and physiology in their common and occult phases, and the study of alchemy was universal, for it was both a physical and a spiritual science. Therefore I doubt or wonder that the ancients, who studied nature under its double aspect, achieved discoveries which to our modern physicists, who study but its dead letter, are a closed book? Thus, the question at issue is not whether a dead body can be resuscitated for, to assert that would be to assume the possibility of a miracle, which is absurd but, to assure ourselves whether the medical authorities pretend to determine the precise moment of death. The Kabbalists say that death occurs at the instant when both the astral body, or life principle, and the spirit part forever with the corporeal body. The scientific physician who denies both astral body and spirit, and admits the existence of nothing more than the life principle, judges death to occur when life is apparently extinct. When the beating of the heart and the action of the lungs cease, and rigor mortis is manifested, and especially when decomposition begins, they pronounce the patient dead. But the annals of medicine team with examples of suspended animation. p. 483. As a result of asphyxia by drowning, the inhalation of gases and other causes, life being restored in the case of drowning persons even after they had been apparently dead for 12 hours. In cases of somnambulic trance, none of the ordinary signs of death are lacking, breathing and the pulse are extinct, animal heat has disappeared, the muscles are rigid, the eye glazed, and the body is colorless. In the celebrated case of Colonel Townsend, he threw himself into this state in the presence of three medical men, who, after a time, were persuaded that he was really dead, and were about leaving the room when he slowly revived. He describes his peculiar gift by saying that he could die or expire when he pleased, and yet, by an effort, or somehow he could come to life again. There occurred in Moscow, a few years since, a remarkable instance of apparent death. The wife of a wealthy merchant lay in the cataleptic state seventeen days, during which the authorities made several attempts to bury her, but, as decomposition had not set in, the family averted the ceremony, and at the end of that time she was restored to life. The above instances show that the most learned men in the medical profession are unable to be certain when a person is dead. What they call suspended animation, is that state from which the patient spontaneously recovers, through an effort of his own spirit, which may be provoked by any one of many causes. In these cases, the astral body is not parted from the physical body, its external functions are simply suspended, the subject is in a state of torpor, and the restoration is nothing but a recovery from it. But, in the case of what physiologists would call real death, but which is not actually so, the astral body has withdrawn, perhaps local decomposition has set in. How shall the man be brought to life again? The answer is, the interior body must be forced back into the exterior one, and vitality reawaken in the latter. The clock has run down, it must be wound. If death is absolute, if the organs have not only ceased to act, but have lost the susceptibility of renewed action, then the whole universe would have to be thrown into chaos to resuscitate the corpse a miracle would be demanded. But, as we said before, the man is not dead when he is cold, stiff, pulseless, breathless, and even showing signs of decomposition, he is not dead when buried, nor afterward, until a certain point is reached. That point is, when the vital organs have become so decomposed, that if reanimated, they could not perform their customary functions, when the mainspring and cogs of the machine, so to speak, are so eaten away by rust, that they would snap upon the turning of the key. Until that point is reached, the astral body may be caused, without miracle, to re-enter its former tabernacle, either by an effort of its p. 484. Own will, or under the resistless impulse of the will of one who knows the potencies of nature and how to direct them. The spark is not extinguished, but only late and latent as the fire in the flint, or the heat in the cold iron. In cases of the most profound cataleptic clairvoyance, such as obtained by Dupatet, and described very graphically by the late Professor William Gregory, in his letters on animal magnetism, the spirit is so far disengaged from the body that it would be impossible for it to re-enter it without an effort of the mesmerizer's will. The subject is practically dead, and, if left to itself, the spirit would escape forever. Although independent of the torpid physical casing, 
the half-freed spirit is still tied to it by a magnetic cord, which is described by clairvoyance as appearing dark and smoky by contrast with the ineffable brightness of the astral atmosphere through which they look. Plutarch, relating the story of Thespesius, who fell from a great height, and lay three days apparently dead, gives us the experience of the latter during his state of partial decease. Thespesius, says he, then observed that he was different from the dead by whom he was surrounded. They were transparent and environed by radiance, but he seemed to trail after him a dark radiation or line of shadow. His whole description, minute and circumstantial in its details, appears to be corroborated by the clairvoyance of every period, and, so far as this class of testimony can be taken, is important. The Kabbalists, as we find them interpreted by Eliphas Levi, in his Science de Esprit, say that, when a man falls into the last sleep, he is plunged at first into a sort of dream, before gaining consciousness in the other side of life. He sees, then, either in a beautiful vision, or in a terrible nightmare, the paradise or hell, in which he believed during his mortal existence. This is why it often happens, that the affrighted soul breaks violently back into the terrestrial life it has just left, and why some who were really dead, i.e., who, if left alone and quiet, would have peaceably passed away forever in a state of unconscious lethargy, when entombed too soon, reawake to life in the grave. In this connection, the reader may perhaps recall the well-known case of the old man who had left some generous gifts in his will to his orphan nieces, which document, just before his death, he had confided to his rich son, with injunctions to carry out his wishes. But, he had not been dead more than a few hours before the son, finding himself alone with the corpse, tore the will and burned it. The sight of this impious deed apparently recalled the hovering spirit, and the old man, rising from his couch of death, uttered a fierce malediction upon the horror-stricken wretch, and then fell back again, and yielded up his spirit this time forever. Dion Bosico makes use of an incident of this kind in his powerful. p. 485. Drama Louis XI, and Charles King created a profound impression in the character of the French monarch, when the dead man revives for an instant and clutches the crown as the heir apparent approaches it. Levi says that resuscitation is not impossible while the vital organism remains undestroyed and the astral spirit is yet within reach. Nature, he says, accomplishes nothing by sudden jerks, and eternal death is always preceded by a state which partakes somewhat of the nature of lethargy. It is a torpor which a great shock or the magnetism of a powerful will can overcome. He accounts in this manner for the resuscitation of the dead man thrown upon the bones of Elisha. He explains it by saying that the soul was hovering at that moment near the body, the burial party, according to tradition, were attacked by robbers, and their fright communicating itself sympathetically to it, the soul was seized with horror at the idea of its remains being desecrated, and re-entered violently into its body to raise and save it. Those who believe in the survival of the soul can see in this incident nothing of a supernatural character it is only a perfect manifestation of natural law. To narrate to the materialist such a case, however well attested, would be but an idle talk. The theologian, always looking beyond nature for a special providence, regards it as a prodigy. Eliphas Levi says, they attributed the resuscitation to the contact with the bones of Elisha, and worship of relic states logically from his epic. Balfour Stewart is right scientists know nothing, or next to nothing, of the ultimate structure and properties of matter, whether organic or inorganic. We are now on such firm ground, that we will take another step in advance. The same knowledge and control of the occult forces, including the vital force which enabled the fakir temporarily to leave and then re-enter his body, and Jesus, Apollonius, and Elisha to recall their several subjects to life, made it possible for the ancient hierophants to animate statues, and cause them to act and speak like living creatures. It is the same knowledge and power which made it possible for Paracelsus to create his homunculi, for Aaron to change his rod into a serpent and a budding branch, Moses to cover Egypt with frogs and other pests, and the Egyptian theurgist of our day to vivify his pygmy mandragora, which has physical life but no soul. It was no more wonderful that upon presenting the necessary conditions Moses should call into life large reptiles and insects, than that, under like favoring conditions, the physical scientist should call into life the small ones which he names bacteria. And now, in connection with ancient miracle doers and prophets, let us bring forward the claims of the modern mediums. Nearly every form of phenomena recorded in the sacred and profane histories of the world. p. 486. We find them claiming to reproduce in our days. Selecting, among the variety of seeming wonders, 
levitation of ponderable inanimate objects as well as of human bodies, we will give our attention to the conditions under which the phenomenon is manifested. History records the names of pagan theurgists, Christian saints, Hindu fakirs, and spiritual mediums who have been thus levitated, and who remain suspended in the air, sometimes for a considerable time. The phenomenon has not been confined to one country or epoch, but almost invariably the subjects have been religious ecstatics, adepts in magic, or, as now, spiritual mediums. We assume the fact to be so well established as to require no labored effort on our part at this time to furnish proof that unconscious manifestations of spirit power, as well as conscious feats of high magic, have happened in all countries, in all ages, and with higher fans as well as through irresponsible mediums. When the present perfected European civilization was yet in an encoded state, occult philosophy, already hoary with age, speculated upon the attributes of man by analogy with those of his creator. Individuals later, whose names will remain forever immortal, inscribed on the portal of the spiritual history of man, have afforded in their persons examples of how far could be developed the godlike powers of the microcosmos. Describing the doctrines and principal teachers of the Alexandrian school, Professor A. Wilder says, Plotinus taught that there was in the soul a returning impulse, love, which attracted it inward toward its origin and center, the eternal good. While the person who does not understand how the soul contains the beautiful within itself will seek by laborious effort to realize beauty without, the wise man recognizes it within himself, develops the idea by withdrawal into himself, concentrating his attention, and so floating upward toward the divine fountain, the stream of which flows within him. The infinite is not known through the reason, but by a faculty superior to reason, by entering upon a state in which the individual, so to speak, ceases to be his finite self in which state divine essence is communicated to him. This is ecstasy. Of Apollonius, who asserted that he could see the present and the future in a clear mirror, on account of his abstemious mode of life, the professor very beautifully observes, this is what may be termed spiritual photography. The soul is the camera in which facts and events, future, past, and present, are alike fixed, and the mind becomes conscious of them. Beyond our everyday world of limits, all is as one day or state, the past and future comprised in the present. Were these godlike men mediums, as the orthodox spiritualists, p. 487, will have it? By no means, if by the term we understand those six sensitives who are born with a peculiar organization, and who in proportion as their powers are developed become more and more subject to the irresistible influence of miscellaneous spirits, purely human, elementary, or elemental. Unquestionably so, if we consider every individual a medium in whose magnetic atmosphere the denizens of higher invisible spheres can move, and act, and live. In such a sense every person is a medium. Mediumship may be either first, self-developed, 2D, by extraneous influences, or 3D, may remain latent throughout life. The reader must bear in mind the definition of the term, for, unless this is clearly understood, confusion will be inevitable. Mediumship of this kind may be either active or passive, repellent or receptive, positive or negative. Mediumship is measured by the quality of the aura with which the individual is surrounded. This may be dense, cloudy, noisome, mephitic, nauseating to the pure spirit, and attract only those foul beings who delight in it, as the eel does in turbid waters, or, it may be pure, crystalline, limpid, opalescent as the morning dew. All depends upon the moral character of the medium. About such men as Apollonius, Iamblichus, Plotinus, and Porphyry, there gathered this heavenly nimbus. It was evolved by the power of their own souls in close unison with their spirits, by the superhuman morality and sanctity of their lives, and aided by frequent anterior ecstatic contemplation. Such holy men pure spiritual influences could approach. Radiating around an atmosphere of divine beneficence, they caused evil spirits to flee before them. Not only is it not possible for such to exist in their aura, but they cannot even remain in that of obsessed persons, if the thaumaturgist exercises his will, or even approaches them. This is mediatorship, not mediumship. Such persons are temples in which dwells the spirit of the living God, but if the temple is defiled by the admission of an evil passion, thought or desire, the mediator falls into the sphere of sorcery. The door is opened, the pure spirits retire and the evil ones rush in. This is still mediatorship, evil as it is, the sorcerer, like the pure magician, forms his own aura and subjects to his will congenial inferior spirits. But mediumship, 
as now understood and manifested, is a different thing. Circumstances, independent of his own volition, may, either at birth or subsequently, modify a person's aura, so that strange manifestations, physical or mental, diabolical or angelic, may take place. Such mediumship, as well as the above-mentioned mediatorship, has existed on earth since the first appearance here of living man. The former is the yielding of weak, mortal flesh to the control and suggestions of spirits and intelligences other than one's own immortal demon. It is literally p. 488. Obsession and possession, and mediums who pride themselves on being the faithful slaves of their guides, and who repudiate with indignation the idea of controlling the manifestations, could not very well deny the fact without inconsistency. This mediumship is typified in the story of Eve succumbing to the reasonings of the serpent, of Pandora peeping in the forbidden casket and letting loose on the world, sorrow and evil, and by Mary Magdalene, who from having been obsessed by seven devils was finally redeemed by the triumphant struggle of her immortal spirit, touched by the presence of a holy mediator, against the dweller. This mediumship, whether beneficent or maleficent, is always passive. Happy are the pure in heart, who repel unconsciously, by that very cleanness of their inner nature, the dark spirits of evil. For verily they have no other weapons of defense but that inborn goodness and purity. Mediumism, as practiced in our days, is a more undesirable gift than the robe of Nessus. The tree is known by its fruits. Side by side with passive mediums in the progress of the world's history, appear active mediators. We designate them by this name for lack of a better one. The ancient witches and wizards, and those who had a familiar spirit, generally made of their gifts a trade, and the obi a woman of Endor, so well defined by Henry Moore, though she may have killed her calf for Saul, accepted hire from other visitors. In India, the jugglers, who by the way are less so than many a modern medium, and the Esawa or sorcerers and serpent charmers of Asia and Africa, all exercise their gifts for money. Not so with the mediators, or higher fans. Buddha was a mendicant and refused his father's throne. The Son of Man had not where to lay his head. The chosen apostles provided neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in their purses. Apollonius gave one half of his fortune to his relatives, the other half to the poor. Yonlikus and Plotinus were renowned for charity and self-denial. The fakirs, or holy mendicants, of India are fairly described by Jacolio. The Pythagorean Essenes in their beauty believed their hands defiled by the contact of money. When the apostles were offered money to impart their spiritual powers, Peter, notwithstanding that the Bible shows him a coward and thrice a renegade, still indignantly spurned the offer, saying, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. These men were mediators, guided merely by their own personal spirit, or divine soul, and availing themselves of the help of spirits but so far as these remain in the right path. Far from us be the thought of casting an unjust slur on physical mediums. Harassed by various intelligences, reduced by the overpowering. P. 489. Influence which their weak and nervous natures are unable to shake off to a morbid state, which at last becomes chronic. They are impeded by these influences from undertaking other occupation. They become mentally and physically unfit for any other. Who can judge them harshly when, driven to the last extremity, they are constrained to accept mediumship as a business? And heaven knows, as recent events have too well proved, whether the calling is one to be envied by anyone. It is not mediums, real, true, and genuine mediums that we would ever blame, but their patrons, the spiritualists. Plotinus, when asked to attend public worship of the gods, is said to have proudly answered, It is for them, the spirits, to come to me. Yonlikus asserted and proved in his own case, that her soul can attain communion with the highest intelligences, with natures loftier than itself, and carefully drove away from mysterical ceremonies every inferior spirit, or bad demon, which he taught his disciples to recognize. Proclus, who elaborated the entire theosophy and theurgy of his predecessors into a complete system, according to Professor Wilder, believed with Yonlikus in the attaining of a divine power, which, overcoming the mundane life, rendered the individual an organ of the deity. He even taught that there was a mystic password that would carry a person from one order of spiritual beings to another, higher and higher, till he arrived at the absolute divine. Apollonius spurned the sorcerers and common soothsayers, and declared that it was his peculiar abstemious mode of life which produced such an acuteness of the senses and created other faculties, so that the greatest and most remarkable things can take place. Jesus declared man the lord of the Sabbath, 
and at his command the terrestrial and elementary spirits fled from their temporary abodes. A power which was shared by Apollonius and many of the brotherhood of the Essenes of Judea and Mount Carmel. It is undeniable that there must have been some good reasons why the ancients persecuted unregulated mediums. Otherwise why, at the time of Moses and David and Samuel, should they have encouraged prophecy and divination, astrology and soothsaying, and maintained schools and colleges in which these natural gifts were strengthened and developed, while witches and those who divined by the spirit of Obi were put to death? Even at the time of Christ, the poor oppressed mediums were driven to the tombs in waste places without the city walls. Why this apparent gross injustice? Why should banishment, persecution, and death be the portion of the physical mediums of those days, and whole? p. 490. Communities of thaumaturgists like the Essenes be not merely tolerated but revered? It is because the ancients, unlike ourselves, could try the spirits and discern the difference between the good and the evil ones, the human and the elemental. They also knew that unregulated spirit intercourse brought ruin upon the individual and disaster to the community. This view of mediumship may be novel and perhaps repugnant to many modern spiritualists, but still it is the view taught in the ancient philosophy, and supported by the experience of mankind from time immemorial. It is erroneous to speak of a medium having powers developed. A passive medium has no power. He has a certain moral and physical condition which induces emanations, or an aura in which his controlling intelligences can live, and by which they manifest themselves. He is only the vehicle through which they display their power. This aura varies day by day, and, as would appear from Mr. Crook's experiments, even hour by hour. It is an external effect resulting from interior causes. The medium's moral state determines the kind of spirits that come, and the spirits that come reciprocally influence the medium, intellectually, physically, and morally. The perfection of his mediumship is in ratio to his passivity, and the danger he incurs is in equal degree. When he is fully developed perfectly passive his own astral spirit may be benumbed, and even crowded out of his body, which is then occupied by an elemental, or, what is worse, by a human fiend of the ace sphere, who proceeds to use it as his own. But too often the cause of the most celebrated crime is to be sought in such possessions. Physical mediumship depending upon passivity, its antidote suggests itself naturally, let the medium cease being passive. Spirits never control persons of positive character who are determined to resist all extraneous influences. The weak and feeble-minded whom they can make their victims they drive into vice. If these miracle-making elementals and disembodied devils called elementary were indeed the guardian and angels that they have passed for, these last thirty years, why have they not given their faithful mediums at least good health and domestic happiness? Why do they desert them at the most critical moments of trial when under accusations of fraud? It is notorious that the best physical mediums are either sickly or, sometimes, what is still worse, inclined to some abnormal vice or other. Why do not these healing guides, who make their mediums play the therapeutists and thaumaturgists to others, give them the boon of robust physical vigor? The ancient thaumaturgists and apostle, generally, if not invariably, enjoyed good health. Their magnetism never conveyed to the sick patient any physical or moral taint, and they never were. p. 491. Accused of vampirism, which a spiritual paper very justly charges upon some medium healers. If we apply the above law of mediumship and mediatorship to the subject of levitation, with which we open our present discussion, what shall we find? Here we have a medium and one of the mediator class levitated the former at a seance, the latter at prayer, or an ecstatic contemplation. The medium being passive must be lifted up, the ecstatic being active must levitate himself. The former is elevated by his familiar spirits whoever or whatever they may be the latter, by the power of his own aspiring soul. Can both be indiscriminately termed mediums? But nevertheless we may be answered that the same phenomena are produced in the presence of a modern medium as of an ancient saint. Undoubtedly, and so it was in the days of Moses, for we believe that the triumph claimed for him an exodus over Pharaoh's magicians is simply a national boast on the part of the chosen people. That the power which produced his phenomena produced that of the magicians also, who were moreover the first tutors of Moses and instructed him in their wisdom, is most probable. But even in those days they seem to have well appreciated the difference between phenomena apparently identical. The tutelar national deity of the Hebrews, who is not the highest father, forbids expressly, in Deuteronomy, his people to learn to do after the abominations of other nations. To pass through the fire, 
or use divination, or be an observer of times or an enchanter, or a witch, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a necromancer. What difference was there then between all the above enumerated phenomena as performed by the other nations and when enacted by the prophets? Evidently, there was some good reason for it, and we find it in John's first epistle, 4, which says, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. p. 492. The only standard within the reach of spiritualists and present-day mediums by which they can try the spirits, is to judge one, by their actions and speech, two, by their readiness to manifest themselves, and three, whether the object in view is worthy of the apparition of a disembodied spirit, or can excuse any one for disturbing the dead. Saul was on the eve of destruction, himself and his sons, yet Samuel inquired of him, Why hast thou disquieted me, to bring me up? But the intelligences that visit the circle rooms, come at the beck of every trifler who would while away a tedious hour. In the number of the London Spiritualist for July 14th, we find a long article, in which the author seeks to prove that the marvelous wonders of the present day, which belong to so-called modern spiritualism, are identical in character with the experiences of the patriarchs and apostles of old. We are forced to contradict, point blank, such an assertion. They are identical only so far that the same forces and occult powers of nature produce them. But though these powers and forces may be, and most assuredly are, all directed by unseen intelligences, the latter differ more in essence, character, and purposes than mankind itself, composed, as it now stands, of white, black, brown, red, and yellow men, and numbering saints and criminals, geniuses and idiots. The writer may avail himself of the services of a tamarang outang or a South Sea Islander, but the fact alone that he has a servant makes neither the latter nor himself identical with Aristotle and Alexander. The writer compares Ezekiel lifted up and taken into the east gate of the Lord's house, with the levitations of certain mediums, and the three Hebrew used in the burning fiery furnace, with other fireproof mediums. The John King spirit light is assimilated with the burning lamp of Abraham, and finally, after many such comparisons, the case of the Davenport brothers, released from the jail of Oswego, is confronted with that of Peter delivered from prison by the angel of the Lord. Now, except the story of Saul and Samuel, there is not a case instance in the Bible of the evocation of the dead. As to being lawful, the assertion is contradicted by every prophet. Moses issues a decree of death against those who raise the spirits of the dead, the necromancers. Nor throughout the Old Testament, nor in Homer, nor Virgil's communion with the dead termed otherwise the necromancy. p. 493. Philo Judaeus makes Saul say, that if he banishes from the land every diviner and necromancer his name will survive him. One of the greatest reasons for it was the doctrine of the ancients, that no soul from the abode of the blessed will return to earth, unless, indeed, upon rare occasions its apparition might be required to accomplish some great object in view, and so bring benefit upon humanity. In this latter instance the soul has no need to be evoked. It sent its portentous message either by an evanescent simulacrum of itself, or through messengers, who could appear in material form, impersonate faithfully the departed. The souls that could so easily be evoked were deemed neither safe nor useful to commune with. They were the souls, or larvae rather, from the infernal region of the limbo the shoal, the region known by the Kabbalists as the Eighth Sphere, but far different from the orthodox hell or Hades of the ancient mythologists. Horace describes this evocation and the ceremonial accompanying it, and Maimonides gives us particulars of the Jewish rite. Every necromantic ceremony was performed on high places and hills, and blood was used for the purpose of placating these human ghouls. I cannot prevent the witches from picking up their bones, says the poet. See the blood they pour in the ditch to allure the souls that will utter their oracles. Cruor and fossum confuses, but on manes a siren, animus responsa datres. The souls, says Porphyry, prefer, to everything else, freshly spilled blood, which seems for a short time to restore to them some of the faculties of life. As for materializations, they are many and various in the sacred records. But, were they affected under the same conditions as at modern seances? Darkness, it appears, was not required in those days of patriarchs and magic powers. The three angels who appeared to Abraham drank in the full blaze of the sun, for he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day says the book of Genesis. The spirits of Elias and Moses appeared equally in daytime, as it is not probable that Christ and the apostles would be climbing a high mountain during the night. 
Jesus is represented as having appeared to Mary Magdalene in the garden in the early morning, to the apostles, at three distinct times, and generally by day, once when the morning was come, John the 21st. 4. Even when the ass of Balaam saw the materialized angel, it was in the full light of noon. We are fully prepared to agree with the writer in question, that we find in the life of Christ and we may add in the Old Testament, too. p. 494. An uninterrupted record of spiritualistic manifestations, but nothing mediumistic, of a physical character though, if we accept the visit of Salta Sedecla, the Obia woman of Endor. This is a distinction of vital importance. True, the promise of the Master was clearly stated, I, in greater works than these shall you do works of mediatorship. According to Joel, the time would come when there would be an outpouring of the Divine Spirit, your sons and your daughters, says he, shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. The time has come and they do all these things now, spiritualism has its seers and martyrs, its prophets and healers. Like Moses, and David, and Jehoram, there are mediums who have direct writings from genuine planetary and human spirits, and the best of it brings the mediums no pecuniary recompense. The greatest friend of the cause in France, Lamery, now languishes in a prison cell, and, as he says with touching pathos, is no longer a man, but a number on the prison register. There are a few, a very few, orders on the spiritualistic platform who speak by inspiration, and if they know what is said at all they are in the condition described by Daniel, and I retain no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep. And there are mediums, these whom we have spoken of, for whom the prophecy in Samuel might have been written, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. But where, in the long line of Bible wonders, do we read of flying guitars, and tinkling tambourines, and jangling bells being offered in pitch-dark rooms as evidences of immortality? When Christ was accused of casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub, he denied it, and sharply retorted by asking, By whom do your sons or disciples cast them out? Again, spiritualists affirm that Jesus was a medium, that he was controlled by one or many spirits, but when the charge was made to him direct he said that he was nothing of the kind. Say we not well, that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? Daimonian, an obia, or familiar spirit in the Hebrew text. Jesus answered, I have not a devil. The writer from whom we have above quoted, attempts also a parallel between the aerial flights of Philip and Ezekiel and of Mrs. Guppy and other modern mediums. He is ignorant or oblivious of the fact that, p. 495. While levitation occurred as an effect in both classes of cases, the producing causes were totally dissimilar. The nature of this difference we have adverted to already. Levitation may be produced consciously or unconsciously to the subject. The juggler determines beforehand that he will be levitated, for how long a time, and to what height, he regulates the occult forces accordingly. The fakir produces the same effect by the power of his aspiration and will, and, except when in the ecstatic state, keeps control over his movements. So does the priest of Siam, when, in the sacred pagoda, he mounts fifty feet in the air with taper in hand, and flits from idol to idol, lighting up the niches, self-supported, and stepping as confidently as though he were upon solid ground. This, persons have seen and testify to. The officers of the Russian squadron which recently circumnavigated the globe, and was stationed for a long time in Japanese waters, relate the fact that, Besides many other marvels, they saw jugglers walk in midair from treetop to treetop, without the slightest support. They also saw the pole and tape climbing feats, described by Colonel Olke and his people from the other world, and which have been so much called in question by certain spiritualists and mediums whose zeal is greater than their learning. The quotations from Colonel Yule and other writers, elsewhere given in this work, seem to place the matter beyond doubt that these effects are produced. Such phenomena, when occurring apart from religious rites, in India, Japan, Tibet, Siam, and other heathen countries, phenomena a hundred times more various and astounding than ever seen in civilized Europe or America, are never attributed to the spirits of the departed. The Petrus have not to do with such public exhibitions. And we have but to consult the list of the principal demons or elemental spirits to find that their very names indicate their professions, or, to express it clearly, the tricks to which each variety is best adapted. So we have the Madon, a generic name indicating wicked elemental spirits, half-brutes, half-monsters, 
for Majan signifies one that looks like a cow. He is the friend of the malicious sorcerers and helps them to effect their evil purposes of revenge by striking men and cattle with sudden illness and death. The Shidala Madan, or Graveyard Fiend, answers to our goals. He delights where crime and murder were committed, near burial spots and places of execution. He helps the juggler in all the fire phenomena as well as Cuddy Shatten, the little juggling imps. Shidala, they say, is a half-fire, half-water demon for he received from Shiva permission to assume any shape he chose, transform one thing into another, and one. p. 496. He is not in fire, he is in water. It is he who blinds people to see that which they do not see. Shulamadan is another mischievous spook. He is the furnace demon, skilled in pottery and baking. If you keep friends with him, he will not injure you, but woe to him who incurs his wrath. Shula likes compliments and flattery and as he generally keeps underground it is to him that a juggler must look to help him raise a tree from a seed in a quarter of an hour and ripen its fruit. Kamel Madan, is the undine proper. He is an elemental spirit of the water, and his name means blowing like a bubble. He is a very merry imp, and will help a friend in anything relative to his department, he will shower rain and show the future in the present to those who will resort to hydromancy or divination by water. Porthu Madan, is the wrestling demon, he is the strongest of all, and whenever there are feats shown in which physical force is required, such as levitations, or taming of wild animals, he will help the performer by keeping him above the soil or will overpower a wild beast before the tamer has time to utter his incantation. So, every physical manifestation has its own class of elemental spirits to superintend them. Returning now to levitations of human bodies and inanimate bodies, in modern circle rooms, we must refer the reader to the introductory chapter of this work. See Ethrobacy, in connection with the story of Simon the Magician, we have shown the explanation of the ancients as to how the levitation and transport of heavy bodies could be produced. We will now try and suggest a hypothesis for the same in relation to mediums, i.e., persons supposed to be unconscious at the moment of the phenomena, which the believers claim to be produced by disembodied spirits. We need not repeat that which has been sufficiently explained before. Conscious ethrobacy under magneto-electrical conditions is possible only to adepts who can never be overpowered by an influence foreign to themselves, but remain sole masters of their will. Thus levitation, we will say, must always occur in obedience to law a law as inexorable as that which makes a body unaffected by it remain upon the ground. And where should we seek for that law outside of the theory of molecular attraction? It is a scientific hypothesis that the form of force which first brings nebulous or star matter together into a whirling vortex is electricity, and modern chemistry is being totally reconstructed upon the theory of electric polarities of atoms. The water spout, the tornado, the whirlwind, the cyclone, and the hurricane, are all doubtless the result of electrical action. This phenomenon has been studied from above as well as from below. Observations having been made both upon the ground and from a balloon floating above the vortex of a thunderstorm. p. 497. Observe now, that this force, under the conditions of a dry and warm atmosphere at the Earth's surface, can accumulate a dynamic energy capable of lifting enormous bodies of water, of compressing the particles of atmosphere, and of sweeping across a country, tearing up forests, lifting rocks, and scattering buildings and fragments over the ground. Wild's electric machine causes induced currents of magneto-electricity so enormously powerful as to produce light by which small print may be read, on a dark night, at a distance of two miles from the place where it is operating. As long ago as the year 1600, Gilbert, in his De Magnet, enunciated the principle that the globe itself is one vast magnet, and some of our advanced electricians are now beginning to realize that man, too, possesses this property and that the mutual attractions and repulsions of individuals toward each other may at least in part find their explanation in this fact. The experience of attendance upon spiritualistic circles corroborates this opinion. Says Professor Nicholas Wagner, of the University of St. Petersburg, heat, or perhaps the electricity of the investigators sitting in the circle, must concentrate itself in the table and gradually develop into motions. At the same time, or a little afterward, the psychical force unites to assist the two other powers. By psychical force, I mean that which evolves itself out of all the other forces of our organism. The combination into one general something of several separate forces, incapable, when combined, of manifesting itself in degree, according to the individuality. 
the progress of the phenomena he considers to be affected by the cold or the dryness of the atmosphere. Now, remembering what has been said as to the subtler forms of energy which the Hermetists have proved to exist in nature, and accepting the hypothesis enunciated by Mr. Wagner that the power which calls out these manifestations is centered in the mediums, may not the medium, but furnishing in himself a nucleus as perfect in its way as the system of permanent seal magnets and Wilde's battery, produce astral currents sufficiently strong to lift in their vortex a body even as ponderable as a human form? It is not necessary that the object lifted should assume a gyratory motion, for the phenomenon we are observing, unlike the whirlwind, is directed by an intelligence, which is capable of keeping the body to be raised within the ascending current and preventing its rotation. Levitation in this case would be a purely mechanical phenomenon. The inert body of the passive medium is lifted by a vortex created either by the elemental spirits possibly, in some cases, by human ones, and sometimes through purely morbific causes, as in the cases of Professor Purdy's six omnambules. The levitation of the adept is, on the contrary, a magnetoelectric effect, as we have just stated. He has made p. 498. The polarity of his body opposite to that of the atmosphere, and identical with that of the earth, hence, attractable by the former, retaining his consciousness the while. A like phenomenal levitation is possible, also, when disease has changed the corporeal polarity of a patient, as disease always does in a greater or lesser degree. But, in such case, the lifted person would not be likely to remain conscious. In one series of observations upon whirlwinds, made in 1859, in the basin of the Rocky Mountains, a newspaper was caught up, to a height of some 200 feet, and there it oscillated to and fro across the track for some considerable time, whilst accompanying the onward motion. Of course scientists will say that a parallel cannot be instituted between this case and that of human levitation, that no vortex can be formed in a room by which a medium could be raised, but this is a question of astral light and spirit, which have their own peculiar dynamical laws. Those who understand the latter, affirm that a concourse of people laboring under mental excitement, which reacts upon the physical system, throw off electromagnetic emanations, which, when sufficiently intense, can throw the whole circumambient atmosphere into perturbation. Force enough may actually be generated to create an electrical vortex, sufficiently powerful to produce many a strange phenomenon. With this hint, the whirling of the dervishes, and the wild dances, swayings, gesticulations, music, and shouts of devotees will be understood as all having a common object in view namely the creation of such astral conditions as favor psychological and physical phenomena. The rationale of religious revivals will also be better understood if this principle is borne in mind. But there is still another point to be considered. If the medium is a nucleus of magnetism and a conductor of that force, he would be subject to the same laws as a metallic conductor, and be attracted to his magnet. If, therefore, a magnetic center of the requisite power was formed directly over him by the unseen powers presiding over the manifestations, why should not his body be lifted toward it, despite terrestrial gravity? We know that, in the case of a medium who is unconscious of the progress of the operation, it is necessary to first admit the fact of such an intelligence, and next, the possibility of the experiment being conducted as described, but, in view of the multifarious evidences offered, not only in p. 499. Our own researches, which claim no authority, but also in those of Mr. Crooks, and a great number of others, in many lands and at different epochs, we shall not turn aside from the main object of offering this hypothesis in the profitless endeavor to strengthen a case which scientific men will not consider with patience, even when sanctioned by the most distinguished of their own body. As early as 1836, the public was apprised of certain phenomena which were as extraordinary, if not more so than all the manifestations which are produced in our days. The famous correspondence between two well-known mesmerizers, Deleuze and Billet, was published in France, and the wonder is discussed for a time in every society. Billet firmly believed in the apparition of spirits, for, as he says, he has both seen, heard, and felt them. Deleuze was as much convinced of this truth as Billet, and declared that man's immortality and the return of the dead, or rather of their shadows, was the best demonstrated fact in his opinion. Material objects were brought to him from distant places by invisible hands, and he communicated on most important subjects with the invisible intelligences. In regard to this, he remarks, I cannot conceive how spiritual beings are able to carry material objects. More skeptical, less intuitional than Billet, nevertheless, 
He agreed with the latter that the question of spiritualism is not one of opinions, but of facts. Such is precisely the conclusion to which Professor Wagner, of St. Petersburg, was finally driven. In the second pamphlet on mediumistic phenomena, issued by him in December, 1875, he administers the following rebuke to Mr. Shklyarevsky, one of his materialistic critics, so long as the spiritual manifestations were weak and sporadic, we men of science could afford to deceive ourselves with theories of unconscious muscular action, or unconscious cerebrations of our brains, and tumble the rest into one heap as juggleries. But now these wonders have grown too striking, the spirits show themselves in the shape of tangible, materialized forms, which can be touched and handled at will by any learned skeptic like yourself, and even be weighed and measured. We can struggle no longer, for every resistance becomes absurd it threatens lunacy. Try then to realize this, and to humble yourself before the possibility of impossible facts. Iron is only magnetized temporarily, but steel permanently, by contact with the lodestone. Now steel is but iron which has passed through a carbonizing process, and yet that process has quite changed the nature of the metal, so far as its relations to the lodestone are concerned. In like manner, it may be said that the medium is but an ordinary person who is magnetized by influx from the astral light, and as the permanence. p. 500. Of the magnetic property in the metal is measured by its more or less steel-like character, so may we not say that the intensity and permanency of mediumistic power is in proportion to the saturation of the medium with the magnetic or astral force? This condition of saturation may be congenital, or brought about in any one of these ways, by the mesmeric process, by spirit agency, or by self-will. Moreover, the condition seems hereditable, like any other physical or mental peculiarity, many, and we may even say most great mediums having had mediumship exhibited in some form by one or more progenitors. Mesmeric subjects easily pass into the higher forms of clairvoyance and mediumship, now so called, as Gregory, Thaluse, Puisigu, Dupitet, and other authorities inform us. As to the process of self-saturation, we have only to turn to the account of the priestly devotees of Japan, Siam, China, India, Tibet, and Egypt, as well as of European countries, to be satisfied of its reality. Long persistence in a fixed determination to subjugate matter, brings about a condition in which not only is one insensible to external impressions, but even death itself may be simulated, as we have already seen. The ecstatic so enormously reinforces his willpower, as to draw into himself, as into a vortex, the potencies resident in the astral light to supplement his own natural store. The phenomena of mesmerism are explicable upon no other hypothesis than the projection of a current of force from the operator into the subject. If a man can project this force by an exercise of the will, what prevents his attracting it toward himself by reversing the current? Unless, indeed, it be urged that the force is generated within his body and cannot be attracted from any supply without. But even under such an hypothesis, if he can generate a superabundant supply to saturate another person, or even an inanimate object by his will, why cannot he generate it in excess for self-saturation? In his work on anthropology, Professor J. R. Buchanan notes the tendency of the natural gestures to follow the direction of the phrenological organs, the attitude of combativeness being downward and backward, that of hope and spirituality upward and forward, that of firmness upward and backward, and so on. The adepts of hermetic science know this principle so well that they explain the levitation of their own bodies, whenever it happens unawares, by saying that the thought is so intently fixed upon a point above them, that when the body is thoroughly imbued with the astral influence, it follows the mental aspiration and rises into the air as easily as a cork held beneath the water rises to the surface when its buoyancy is allowed to assert itself. The giddiness felt by certain persons when standing upon the brink of a chasm is explained upon. p. 501. The same principle. Young children, who have little or no active imagination, and in whom experience has not had sufficient time to develop fear, are seldom, if ever, giddy, but the adult of a certain mental temperament, seeing the chasm and picturing in his imaginative fancy the consequences of a fall, allows himself to be drawn by the attraction of the earth, and unless the spell of fascination be broken, his body will follow his thought to the foot of the precipice. That this giddiness is purely a temperamental affair, is shown in the fact that some persons never experience the sensation and inquiry will probably reveal the fact that such are deficient in the imaginative faculty. We have a case in view a gentleman who, in 1858, had so firm a nerve that he horrified the witnesses by standing upon the coping of the Arc de Triomphe, in Paris, with folded arms, 
and his feet half over the edge, but, having since become short-sighted, was taken with a panic upon attempting to cross a plank walk over the courtyard of a hotel, where the footway was more than two feet and a half wide, and there was no danger. He looked at the flagging below, gave his fancy free play, and would have fallen had he not quickly sat down. It is a dogma of science that perpetual motion is impossible, it is another dogma, that the allegation that the Hermetists discovered the elixir of life, and that certain of them, but partaking of it, prolong their existence far beyond the usual term, is a superstitious absurdity. And the claim that the baser metals have been transmuted into gold, and that the universal solvent was discovered, excites only contemptuous derision in a century which has crowned the edifice of philosophy with a copestone of protoplasm. The first is declared a physical impossibility, as much so, according to Bob Binet, the astronomer, as the levitation of an object without contact, the second, a physiological vagary begotten of a disordered mind, the third, a chemical absurdity. Balfour Stewart says that while the man of science cannot assert that he is intimately acquainted with all the forces of nature, and cannot prove that perpetual motion is impossible, for, in truth, he knows very little of these forces, he does think that he has entered into the spirit and design of nature, and therefore he denies at once the possibility of such a machine. If he has discovered the design of nature, he certainly has not the spirit, for he denies its existence in one sense, in denying spirit he prevents that perfect understanding of universal law which would redeem modern philosophy from its thousand mortifying dilemmas and mistakes. If Professor B. Stewart's negation is founded. p. 502. Upon no better analogy than that of his French contemporary, Bobinet, he is in danger of a like humiliating catastrophe. The universe itself illustrates the actuality of perpetual motion, and the atomic theory, which has proved such a bomb to the exhausted minds of our cosmic explorers, is based upon it. The telescope searching through space, and the microscope probing the mysteries of the little world in a drop of water, reveal the same law in operation, and, as everything below is like everything above, who would presume to say that when the conservation of energy is better understood, and the two additional forces of the catalysts are added to the catalogue of orthodox science, it may not be discovered how to construct a machine which shall run without friction and supply itself with energy in proportion to its waste? Fifty years ago, says the venerable Mr. Delara, a Hamburg paper, quoting from an English one an account of the opening of the Manchester and Liverpool Railway, pronounced it a gross fabrication, capping the climax by saying, even so far extends the credulity of the English, the moral is apparent. The recent discovery of the compound called metalline, by an American chemist, makes it appear probable that friction can, in a large degree, be overcome. One thing is certain, when a man shall have discovered the perpetual motion he will be able to understand by analogy all the secrets of nature, progress and direct ratio with resistance. We may say the same of the elixir of life, by which is understood physical life, the soul being of course deathless only by reason of its divine immortal union with spirit. But continual or perpetual does not mean endless. The Kabbalists have never claimed that either an endless physical life or unending motion is possible. The Hermetic Axiom maintains that only the first cause and its direct emanations, our spirits, scintillas from the eternal central sun which will be reabsorbed by it at the end of time, are incorruptible and eternal. But, in possession of a knowledge of occult natural forces, yet undiscovered by the materialists, they asserted that both physical life and mechanical motion could be prolonged indefinitely. The philosopher's stone had more than one meaning attached to its mysterious origin. Says Professor Wilder, the study of alchemy was even more universal than the several writers upon it appeared to have known, and was always the auxiliary of, if not identical with, the occult sciences of magic, necromancy, and astrology, probably from the same fact that they were originally but forms of a spiritualism which was generally extant in all ages of human history. Our greatest wonder is, that the very men who view the human body simply as a digesting machine, should object to the idea that if some equivalent for metalline could be applied between its molecules, it p. 503 should run without friction. Man's body is taken from the earth, or dust, according to Genesis, which allegory bars the claims of modern analysts to original discovery of the nature of the inorganic constituents of human body. If the author of Genesis knew this, and Aristotle taught the identity between the life principle of plants, animals, and men, our affiliation with Mother Earth seems to have been settled long ago. Elie de Beaumont has recently reasserted the old doctrine of Hermes that there is a terrestrial circulation comparable to that of the blood of man. 
Now, since it is a doctrine as old as time, that nature is continually renewing her wasted energies by absorption from the source of energy, why should the child differ from the parent? Why may not man, by discovering the source and nature of this recuperative energy, extract from the earth herself the juice or quintessence with which to replenish his own forces? This may have been the great secret of the alchemists. Stop the circulation of the terrestrial fluids and we have stagnation, putrefaction, death, stop the circulation of the fluids in man, and stagnation, absorption, calcification from old age, and death ensue. If the alchemists had simply discovered some chemical compound capable of keeping the channels of our circulation unclogged, would not all the rest easily follow? And why, we ask, if the surface waters of certain mineral springs have such virtue in the cure of disease and the restoration of physical vigor, is it illogical to say that if we could get the first runnings from the alembic of nature in the bowels of the earth, we might, perhaps, find that the fountain of youth was no myth after all? Jennings asserts that the elixir was produced out of the secret chemical laboratories of nature by some adepts, and Robert Boyle, the chemist, mentions a medicated wine or cordial which Dr. Lefevre tried with wonderful effect upon an old woman. Alchemy is as old as tradition itself. The first authentic record on this subject, says William Godwin, is an edict of Diocletian, about 300 years after Christ, ordering a diligent search to be made in Egypt for all the ancient books which treated of the art of making gold and silver that they might be consigned to the flames. This edict necessarily presumes a certain antiquity to the pursuit, and fabulous history has recorded Solomon, Pythagoras, and Hermes among its distinguished votaries. And this question of transmutation this alkahest or universal solvent, which comes next after the elixir vitae in the order of the three alchemical agents? Is the idea so absurd as to be totally unworthy of consideration in this age of chemical discovery? How shall we dispose of the historical anecdotes of men who actually made gold and gave it away, and of those who testified to having seen them do it? Lubavius. p. 504. Geberus, Arnoldus, Thomas Aquinas, Bernardus Combs, Ioannes, Penedus, Persetinus Geber, the Arabian father of European alchemy, Eugenius Philolethes, Bacchis Saporta, Rubius, Dornasius, Vogelius, Ironies Philolitha Cosmopolita, and many medieval alchemists and hermetic philosophers assert the fact. Must we believe them all visionaries and lunatics, these otherwise great and learned scholars? Francesco Picus, in his work De Oro, gives 18 instances of gold being produced in his presence by artificial means, and Thomas Vaughn, going to a goldsmith to sell 1,200 marks worth of gold, when the man suspiciously remarked that the gold was too pure to have ever come out of a mine ran away, leaving the money behind him. In a preceding chapter we have brought forward the testimony of a number of authors to this effect. Marco Polo tells us that in some mounts of Tibet, which he calls Chinjintalis, there are veins of the substance from which salamander is made, for the real truth is, that the salamander is no beast, as they allege in our parts of the world, but is a substance found in the earth. Then he adds that a Turk of the name of Zorfakar, told him that he had been procuring salamanders for the great Khan in those regions, for the space of three years. He said that the way they got them was by digging in that mountain till they found a certain vein. The substance of this vein was then taken and crushed, and, when so treated, it divides, as it were, into fibers of wool, which they set forth to dry. When dry, these fibers were pounded and washed, so as to leave only the fibers, like fibers of wool. These were then spun. When first made, these napkins are not very white, but, by putting them into the fire for a while, they come out as white as snow. Therefore, as several authorities testify, this mineral substance is the famous asbestos, which the Reverend A. Williamson says is found in Shantung. But, it is not only incombustible thread which is made from it. An oil, having several most extraordinary properties, is extracted from it, and the secret of its virtues remains with certain lamas and Hindu adepts. When rubbed into the body, it leaves no external stain or mark. But, nevertheless, after having been so rubbed, the part can be scrubbed with soap and hot or cold water, without the virtue of the ointment being affected in the least. The person so rubbed may boldly step into the hottest fire, unless suffocated, he will remain uninjured. Another property of the oil is that, when combined with another substance, that we are. p. 505. Not at liberty to name, and left stagnant under the rays of the moon, on certain nights indicated by native astrologers, it will breed strange creatures. In Fusoria we may call them in one sense, 
but then these grow and develop. Speaking of Kashmir, Marco Polo observes that they have an astonishing acquaintance with the devilries of enchantment, insomuch that they make their idols to speak. To this day, the greatest Magian mystics of these regions may be found in Kashmir. The various religious sects of this country were always credited with preternatural powers, and were the resort of adepts and sages. As Colonel Yule remarks, Bombari tells us that even in our day, the Kashmiri dervishes are preeminent among their Mahometan brethren for cunning, secret arts, skill and exorcisms and magic. But, all modern chemists are not equally dogmatic in their negation of the possibility of such a transmutation. Dr. Pace, Depre, and even the all-denying Louis Figuier, of Paris, seem to be far from rejecting the idea. Dr. Wilder says, the possibility of reducing the elements to their primal form, as they are supposed to have existed in the igneous mass from which the earth crust is believed to have been formed, is not considered by physicists to be so absurd an idea as has been intimated. There is a relationship between metals, often so close as to indicate an original identity. Persons called alchemists may, therefore, have devoted their energies to investigations into these matters, as Lavoisier, Davy, Faraday, and others of our day have explained the mysteries of chemistry. A learned theosophist, a practicing physician of this country, one who has studied the occult sciences and alchemy for over thirty years, has succeeded in reducing the elements to their primal form, and made what is termed the pre-Adamite earth. It appears in the form of an earthy precipitate from pure water, which, on being disturbed, presents the most opalescent and vivid colors. The secret, say the alchemists, as if enjoying the ignorance of the uninitiated, is an amalgamation of the salt, sulfur, and mercury combined three times in Azov, by a triple sublimation and a triple fixation. How ridiculously absurd! will exclaim a learned modern chemist. Well, the disciples of the great Hermes understand the above as well as a graduate of Harvard University comprehends the meaning of his professor of chemistry, when the latter says, with one hydroxyl group we can only produce monatomic compounds, use two hydroxyl groups, and we can form around the same skeleton a number of diatomic compounds. p. 506. Attached to the nucleus three hydroxyl groups, and their result triatomic compounds, among which is a very familiar substance. Glycerin. Attach thyself, says the alchemist, to the four letters of the tetragram disposed in the following manner. The letters of the ineffable name are there, although thou mayest not discern them at first. The incommunicable axiom is cabalistically contained therein, and this is what is called the magic arcanum by the masters. The arcanum the fourth emanation of the akasha, the principle of life, which is represented in its third transmutation by the fiery sun, the eye of the world, or of Osiris, as the Egyptians termed it. And I tenderly watching its youngest daughter, wife, and sister Isis, our mother earth. See what Hermes, the thrice great master, says of her, her father is the sun, her mother is the moon. It attracts and caresses, and then repulses her by a projectile power. It is for the hermetic student to watch its motions, to catch its subtle currents, to guide and direct them with the help of the Athenor, the Archimedean lover of the alchemist. What is this mysterious Athenor? Can the physicist tell us he who sees and examines it daily? I, he sees but does he comprehend the secret ciphered characters traced by the divine finger on every seashell in the ocean's deep, on every leaf that trembles in the breeze, and the bright star, whose stellar lines are in his sight but so many more or less luminous lines of hydrogen? God geometrizes, said Plato. The laws of nature are the thoughts. p. 507. Of God, exclaimed Ersted, two thousand years later. His thoughts are immutable, repeated the solitary student of hermetic lore, Therefore it is in the perfect harmony and equilibrium of all things that we must seek the truth. And thus, proceeding from the indivisible unity, he found emanating from the two contrary forces, each acting through the other and producing equilibrium, and the three were but one, the Pythagorean eternal monad. The primordial point is a circle, the circle squaring itself from the four cardinal points becomes a quaternary, the perfect square, having at each of its four angles a letter of the mythic name, the sacred tetragram. It is the four Buddhas who came and have passed away, the Pythagorean tetrachies absorbed and resolved by the one eternal no-being. Tradition declares that on the dead body of Hermes, at Hebron, was found by an Asarum, an initiate, the tablet known as the Smaragdine. It contains, in a few sentences, the essence of the Hermetic wisdom. To those who read but with their bodily eyes, 
the precepts will suggest nothing new or extraordinary, for it merely begins by saying that it speaks not fictitious things, but that which is true and most certain. What is below is like that which is above, and what is above is similar to that which is below to accomplish the wonders of one thing. As all things were produced by the mediation of one being, so all things were produced from this one by adaptation. Its father is the sun, its mother is the moon. It is the cause of all perfection throughout the whole earth. Its power is perfect if it is changed into earth. Separate the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, acting prudently and with judgment. Ascend with the greatest sagacity from the earth to heaven, and then descend again to earth, and unite together the power of things inferior and superior, thus you will possess the light of the whole world, and all obscurity will fly away from you. This thing has more fortitude than fortitude itself, because it will overcome every subtle thing and penetrate every solid thing. By it the world was formed. This mysterious thing is the universal, magical agent, the astral light, which in the correlations of its forces furnishes the alkahest, the philosophers. p. 508. Stone, and the elixir of life. Hermetic philosophy names it Azoth, the soul of the world, the celestial virgin, the great Magnus, etc., etc. Physical science knows it as heat, light, electricity, and magnetism, but ignoring its spiritual properties and the occult potency contained in ether, rejects everything it ignores. It explains and depicts the crystalline forms of the snowflakes, their modifications of an hexagonal prism which shoot out an infinity of delicate needles. It has studied them so perfectly that it has even calculated, with the most wondrous mathematical precision, that all these needles diverge from each other at an angle of 60 degrees. Can it tell us as well the cause of this endless variety of the most exquisite forms, each of which is a most perfect geometrical figure in itself? These frozen, star-like and flower-like blossoms, may be, for all materialistic science knows, a shower of messages snowed by spiritual hands from the worlds above for spiritual eyes below to read. The philosophical cross, the two lines running in opposite directions, the horizontal and the perpendicular, the height and breadth, which the geometrizing deity divides at the intersecting point, and which forms the magical as well as the scientific quaternary, when it is inscribed within the perfect square, is the basis of the occultist. Within its mystical precinct lies the master key which opens the door of every science, physical as well as spiritual. It symbolizes our human existence, for the circle of life circumscribes the four points of the cross, which represent in succession birth, life, death, and immortality. Everything in this world is a trinity completed by the quaternary, and every element is divisible on this same principle. Physiology can divide man ad infinitum, as physical science has divided the four primal and principal elements and several dozens of others, she will not succeed in changing either. Birth, life, and death will ever be a trinity completed only at the cyclic end. Even were science to change the longed for immortality into annihilation, it still will ever be a quaternary, for God geometrizes. Therefore, perhaps alchemy will one day be allowed to talk of her salt, mercury, sulfur, and azoth, her symbols and mythic letters and repeat, with the exponent of the synthesis of organic compounds, that it must be remembered that the grouping is no play of fancy, and that a good reason can be given for the position of every letter. Dr. Pace, of Paris, wrote in 1863, the following. One word, apropos, of alchemy. What must we think of the Hermetic? p. 509. Art? Is it lawful to believe that we can transmute metals, make gold? Well, positive men, as three-fourths of the 19th century, know that Mr. Figuier, doctor of science and medicine, chemical analyst in the School of Pharmacy, of Paris, does not wish to express himself upon the subject. He doubts, he hesitates. He knows several alchemists, for there are such, who, basing themselves upon modern chemical discoveries, and especially on the singular circumstance of the equivalence demonstrated by M. Dumas, pretend that metals are not simple bodies, true elements in the absolute sense, and that in consequence they may be produced by the process of decomposition. This encourages me to take a step further, and candidly avow that I would be only moderately surprised to see someone make gold. I have only one reason to give, but sufficient it seems, which is, that gold has not always existed, it has been made by some chemical travail or other in the bosom of the fused matter of our globe, perhaps some of it may be even now in process of formation. The pretended simple bodies of our chemistry are very probably secondary products, 
and the formation of the terrestrial mass. It has been proved so with water, one of the most respectable elements of ancient physics. Today, we create water. Why should we not make gold? An eminent experimentalist, Mr. Depre, has made the diamond. True, this diamond is only a scientific diamond, a philosophical diamond, which would be worth nothing, but, no matter, my position holds good. Besides, we are not left to simple conjectures. There is a man living, who, in a paper addressed to the scientific bodies, in 1853, has underscored these words I have discovered the method of producing artificial gold, I have made gold. This adept is Mr. Theodore Tiffereau, ex-preparator of chemistry in the École Professionnelle et Supérieure of Nantes. Cardinal de Rohan, the famous victim of the diamond necklace conspiracy, testified that he had seen the Count Cagliostro make both gold and diamonds. We presume that those who agree with Professor T. Seri Hunt, FRS, will have no patience with the theory of Dr. Pace, for they believe that all of our metalliferous deposits are due to the action of organic life. And so, until they do come to some composition of their differences, so as to let us know for a certainty the nature of gold, and whether it is the product of interior volcanic alchemy or surface segregation and filtration, we will leave them to settle their quarrel between themselves, and give credit meanwhile to the old philosophers. P. 510. Professor Balfour Stewart, who no one would think of classing among the liberal minds, who, with far more fairness and more frequently than any of his colleagues admits the failings of modern science, shows himself, nevertheless, as biased as other scientists on this question. Perpetual light being only another name for perpetual motion, he tells us, and the latter being impossible because we have no means of equilibrating the waste of combustible material, a hermetic light is, therefore, an impossibility. Noting the fact that a perpetual light was supposed to result from magical powers, and remarking further that such a light is certainly not of this earth, where light and all other forms of superior energy are essentially evanescent, this gentleman argues as though the hermetic philosophers had always claimed that the flame under discussion was an ordinary earthly flame, resulting from the combustion of luminiferous material. In this the philosophers have been constantly misunderstood and misrepresented. How many great minds unbelievers from the start after having studied the secret doctrine, have changed their opinions and found out how mistaken they were? And how contradictory it seems to find one moment Balfour Stewart quoting some philosophical morals of Bacon whom he turns the father of experimental science and saying, Surely we ought to learn a lesson from these remarks, and be very cautious before we dismiss any branch of knowledge or train of thought as essentially unprofitable, and then dismissing the next moment, as utterly impossible, the claims of the alchemists. He shows Aristotle as entertaining the idea that light is not any body, or the emanation of any body, and that therefore light is an energy or act. And yet, although the ancients were the first to show, through Democritus, to John Dalton the doctrine of atoms, and through Pythagoras and even the oldest of the Chaldean oracles, that of ether as a universal agent, their ideas, says Stuart, were not prolific. He admits that they possess great genius and intellectual power, but adds that they were deficient in physical conceptions, and, in consequence, their ideas were not prolific. The whole of the present work is a protest against such a loose way of judging the ancients. To be thoroughly competent to criticize their ideas, and assure oneself whether their ideas were distinct and appropriate to the facts, one must have sifted these ideas to the very bottom. It is idle to repeat that which we have frequently said, and that which every scholar ought to know, namely, that the quintessence of their knowledge was in the hands of the priests, who never wrote them, and in those of the initiates who, like Plato, did not dare write them p. 511. Therefore, those few speculations on the material and spiritual universes, which they did put in writing, could not enable posterity to judge them rightly, even had not the early Christian vandals, the later crusaders, and the fanatics of the Middle Ages destroyed three parts of that which remained of the Alexandrian library and its later schools. Professor Draper shows that the Cardinal Ximenes alone delivered to the flames in the squares of Granada, 80,000 Arabic manuscripts, many of them translations of classical authors. In the Vatican libraries, whole passages in the most rare and precious treatises of the ancients were found erased and blotted out, for the sake of interlining them with absurd psalmodies. Who then, of those who turn away from the secret doctrine as being unphilosophical and, therefore, unworthy of a scientific thought, has a right to say that he studied the ancients, that he is aware of all that they knew, and knowing now far more, knows also that they knew little, if anything. The secret doctrine contains the alpha and the omega of universal science, 
Therein lies the corner and the keystone of all the ancient and modern knowledge, and alone in this unphilosophical doctrine remains buried the absolute and the philosophy of the dark problems of life and death. The great energies of nature are known to us only by their effects, said Paley. Paraphrasing the sentence, we will say that the great achievements of the days of old are known to posterity only by their effects. If one takes a book on alchemy, and sees in it the speculations on gold and light by the brothers of the rosy cross, he will find himself certainly startled, for the simple reason that he will not understand them at all. The hermetic gold, he may read, is the outflow of the sunbeam, or of light suffused invisibly and magically into the body of the world. Light is sublimated gold, rescued magically by invisible stellar attraction, out of material depths. Gold is thus the deposit of light, which of itself generates. Light in the celestial world is subtle, vaporous, magically exalted gold, or spirit of flame. Gold draws inferior natures in the metals, and intensifying and multiplying, converts into itself. Nevertheless, facts are facts, and, as Billet says of spiritualism, we will remark of occultism generally and of alchemy in particular it is not a matter of opinion but of facts, men of science call an inextinguishable lamp an impossibility, but nevertheless persons in our own age as well as in the days of ignorance and superstition have found them burning bright and old vaults shut up for centuries, and other persons there are who. p. 512. Possess the secret of keeping such fires for several ages. Men of science say that ancient and modern spiritualism, magic, and mesmerism, are charlatanry or delusion, but there are eight hundred millions on the face of the globe, of perfectly sane men and women, who believe in all these. Who are we to credit? Democritus, says Lucian, believed in no miracles, he applied himself to discover the method by which the theurgists could produce them, in a word. His philosophy brought him to the conclusion that magic was entirely confined to the application and the imitation of the laws and the works of nature. Now, the opinion of the laughing philosopher is of the greatest importance to us, since the Magi left by Xerxes, at Abdera, were his instructors, and he had studied magic, moreover, for a considerably long time with the Egyptian priests. For nearly ninety years of the one hundred and nine of his life, this great philosopher had made experiments, and noted them down in a book which, according to Petronius, treated of nature facts that he had verified himself. And we find him not only disbelieving in and utterly rejecting miracles, but asserting that every one of those that were authenticated by eyewitnesses, had, and could have taken place, for all, even the most incredible, was produced according to the hidden laws of nature. The day will never come, when any one of the propositions of Euclid will be denied, says Professor Draper, exalting the Aristotelians at the expense of the Pythagoreans and Platonists. Shall we, in such a case, disbelieve a number of well-informed authorities, Lomprier among others, who assert that the fifteen books of the elements are not to be wholly attributed to Euclid, and that many of the most valuable truths and demonstrations contained in them owe their existence to Pythagoras, Thales, and Eudixus? That Euclid, notwithstanding his genius, was the first to reduce them to order, and only interwove theories of his own to render the whole complete and connected system of geometry? And if these authorities are right, then it is again to that central son of metaphysical science Pythagoras and his school, that the moderns are indebted directly for such men as Eratosthenes, the world-famous geometer and cosmographer, Archimedes, and even Ptolemy, notwithstanding his obstinate errors. Were it not for the exact science of such men, and for fragments of their works that they left us to base Galilean speculations upon, the great priests of the nineteenth century, p. 513, might find themselves, perhaps, still in the bondage of the church, in philosophizing, in 1876, on the Augustine and Bidian cosmogony, the rotation of the canopy of heaven round the earth, and the majestic flatness of the latter. The nineteenth century seems positively doomed to humiliating confessions. Feltre, Italy, erects a public statue to Ponfilo Castaldi, the illustrious inventor of movable printing types, and adds in its inscription the generous confession that Italy renders to him this tribute of honor too long deferred. But no sooner is the statue placed, than the Feltrines are advised by Colonel Yule to burn it in an honest line. He proves that many a traveler besides Marco Polo had brought home from China movable wooden types and specimens of Chinese books, the entire text of which was printed with such wooden blocks. We have seen in several Tibetan lamaseries, where they have printing offices, such blocks preserved as curiosities. They are known to be of the greatest antiquity, inasmuch as types were perfected, 
and the old ones abandoned contemporaneously with the earliest records of Buddhistic Lamaism. Therefore, they must have existed in China before the Christian era. Let everyone ponder over the wise words of Professor Roscoe, in his lecture on spectrum analysis. The infant truths must be made useful. Neither you nor I, perhaps, can see the how or the when, but that the time may come at any moment, when the most obscure of nature's secrets shall at once be employed for the benefit of mankind. No one who knows anything of science, can for one instant doubt. Who could have foretold that the discovery that a dead frog's legs jump when they are touched by two different metals, should have led in a few short years to the discovery of the electric telegraph? Professor Roscoe, visiting Kirchhoff and Bunsen when they were making their great discoveries of the nature of the Fraunhofer lines, says that it flashed upon his mind at once that there is iron in the sun, therein presenting one more evidence to add to a million predecessors, that great discoveries usually come with a flash, and not by induction. There are many more flashes in store for us. It may be found, perhaps, that one of the last sparkles of modern science the beautiful green spectrum of silver is nothing new, but was, notwithstanding the paucity and great inferiority of their optical instruments, well known to the ancient chemists and physicists. Silver and green were associated together as far back as the days of Hermes. Luna, or Astarte, the hermetic silver, is one of the two chief symbols of the Rosicrucians. It is a hermetic. p. 514. Axiom, that the cause of the splendor and variety of colors lies deep in the affinities of nature and that there is a singular and mysterious alliance between color and sound. The Kabbalists place their middle nature in direct relation with the moon, and the green ray occupies the center point between the others, being placed in the middle of the spectrum. The Egyptian priests chanted the seven vowels as a hymn addressed to Serapis, and at the sound of the seventh vowel, as at the seventh ray of the rising sun, the statue of Memnon responded. Recent discoveries have proved the wonderful properties of the blue-violet light the seventh ray of the prismatic spectrum the most powerfully chemical of all, which corresponds with the highest note in the musical scale. The Rosicrucian theory, that the whole universe is a musical instrument, is the Pythagorean doctrine of the music of the spheres. Sounds and colors are all spiritual numerals, as the seven prismatic rays proceed from one spot in heaven, so the seven powers of nature, each of them a number, are the seven radiations of the unity, the central, spiritual sun. Happy is he who comprehends the spiritual numerals, and perceives their mighty influence, exclaims Plato. And happy, we may add, is he who, treading the maze of force correlations, does not neglect to trace them to this invisible sun. Future experimenters will reap the honor of demonstrating that musical tones have a wonderful effect upon the growth of vegetation. And with the enunciation of this unscientific fallacy, we will close the chapter, and proceed to remind the patient reader of certain things that the ancients knew, and the moderns think they know. Chapter 14. The transactions of this our city of Say, are recorded in our sacred writings during a period of 8,000 years. Plato, Timaeus. The Egyptians assert that from the reign of Heracles to that of Amasis, 17,000 years elapsed. Herodotus, Lib. 2, circa 43. Can the theologian derive no light from the pure, primeval faith that glimmers from Egyptian hieroglyphics, to illustrate the immortality of the soul? Will not the historian deign to notice the prior origin of every art and science in Egypt, a thousand years before the Pelasians studded the isles and capes of the archipelago with their forts and temples? Glidden. How came Egypt by her knowledge? When broke the dawn of that civilization whose wondrous perfection is suggested by the bits and fragments supplied to us by the archaeologists? Alas! The lips of Memnon are silent, and no longer utter oracles. The Sphinx has become a greater riddle in her speechlessness than was the enigma propounded to Oedipus. What Egypt taught to others she certainly did not acquire by the international exchange of ideas and discoveries with her Semitic neighbors, nor from them did she receive her stimulus. The more we learn of the Egyptians, observes the writer of a recent article, the more marvelous they seem. From whom could she have learned her wondrous arts, the secrets of which died with her? She sent no agents throughout the world to learn what others knew but to her the wise men of neighboring nations resorted for knowledge. Proudly secluding herself within her enchanted domain, the fair queen of the desert created wonders as if by the sway of a magic staff. Nothing, remarks the same writer, whom we have elsewhere quoted, proves that civilization and knowledge then rise in progress with her as in the case of other peoples, but everything seems to be referable, in the same perfection, to the early estates. That no nation knew as much as herself, 
is a fact demonstrated by history. May we not assign as a reason for this remark the fact that until very recently nothing was known of old India? That these two nations, India and Egypt, were kin? That they were the oldest in the group of nations, and that the eastern Ethiopians the mighty builders had come from India as a matured people, bringing their civilization with. p. 516. Them, in colonizing the perhaps unoccupied Egyptian territory, but we defer a more complete elaboration of this theme for our second volume. Mechanism, says a Seb Salvert, was carried by the ancients to a point of perfection that has never been attained in modern times. We would inquire if their inventions have been surpassed in our age? Certainly not, and at the present day, with all the means that the progress of science and modern discovery have placed in the hands of the mechanic, have we not been assailed by numerous difficulties in striving to place on a pedestal one of those monoliths that the Egyptians forty centuries ago erected in such numbers before their sacred edifices? As far back as we can glance into history, to the reign of Menes, the most ancient of the kings that we know anything about, we find proofs that the Egyptians were far better acquainted with hydrostatics and hydraulic engineering than ourselves. The gigantic work of turning the course of the Nile or rather of its three principal branches and bringing it to Memphis, was accomplished during the reign of that monarch, who appears to us as distant in the abyss of time as a far glimmering star in the heavenly vault. Says Wilkinson, Menes took accurately the measure of the power which he had to oppose, and he constructed a dike whose lofty mounds and enormous embankments turned the water eastward, and since that time the river is contained in its new bed. Herodotus has left us a poetical, but still accurate description of the Lake Morris, so called after the pharaoh who caused this artificial sheet of water to be formed. The historian has described this lake as measuring 450 miles in circumference, and 300 feet in depth. It was fed through artificial channels by the Nile, and made to store a portion of the annual overflow for the irrigation of the country, for many miles round. Its numerous floodgates, dams, locks, and convenient engines were constructed with the greatest skill. The Romans, at a far later period, got their notions on hydraulic constructions from the Egyptians, but our latest progress in the science of hydrostatics has demonstrated the fact of a great deficiency on their part in some branches of that knowledge. Thus, for instance, if they were acquainted with that which is called in hydrostatics the great law, they seem to have been less familiar with what our modern engineers know as watertight joints. Their ignorance is sufficiently proved by their conveying the water through large-level aqueducts, instead of doing it at a less expense by iron pipes beneath the surface. But the Egyptians evidently employed a far superior method in their channels and artificial waterworks. Notwithstanding this, the modern engineers employed by p. 517. Lesseps for the Suez Canal, who had learned from the ancient Romans all their art could teach them, deriving, in their turn, their knowledge from Egypt scoffed at the suggestion that they should seek a remedy for some imperfections in their work by studying the contents of the various Egyptian museums. Nevertheless, the engineers succeeded in giving to the banks of that long and ugly ditch, as Professor Carpenter calls the Suez Canal, sufficient strength to make it a navigable waterway, instead of a mud trap for vessels as it was at first. The alluvial deposits of the Nile, during the past thirty centuries, have completely altered the area of the delta, so that it is continually growing seaward, and adding to the territory of the Khediva. In ancient times, the principal mouth of the river was called Pelusion and the canal cut by one of the kings the canal of Necho led from Suez to this branch. After the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra, at Actium, it was proposed that a portion of the fleet should pass through the canal to the Red Sea, which shows the depth of water that those early engineers had secured. Settlers in Colorado and Arizona have recently reclaimed large tracts of barren land by a system of irrigation, receiving from the journals of the day no little praise for their ingenuity. But, for a distance of 500 miles above Cairo, there stretches a strip of land reclaimed from the desert, and made, according to Professor Carpenter, the most fertile on the face of the earth. He says, For thousands of years these branch canals have conveyed fresh water from the Nile, to fertilize the land of this long narrow strip, as well as of the delta. He describes the network of canals over the delta, which dates from an early period of the Egyptian monarchs. The French province of Artois has given its name to the Artesian well, as though that form of engineering had been first applied in that district, but, if we consult the Chinese records, we find such wells to have been in common use ages before the Christian era. If we now turn to architecture, we find displayed before our eyes, wonders which baffle all description. Referring to the temples of Philae, Abu Simbel, 
Dandera, Edfu, and Karnak, Professor Carpenter remarks that these stupendous and beautiful erections, these gigantic pyramids and temples have a vastness and beauty which are still impressive after the lapse of thousands of years. He is amazed at the admirable character of the workmanship, the stones in most cases being fitted together with astonishing nicety, so that a knife could hardly be thrust between the joints. He noticed in his amateur archaeological pilgrimage, another of those curious coincidences which His Holiness, the Pope, may feel some interest in learning. He is speaking of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, sculptured on the old monuments, in the p. 518. Ancient Belief in the Immortality of the Soul Now, it is most remarkable, says the professor, to see that not only this belief, but the language in which it was expressed in the ancient Egyptian times, anticipated that of the Christian revelation. For, in this Book of the Dead, there are used the very phrases we find in the New Testament, in connection with the Day of Judgment, and he admits that this hierogram was engraved, probably, two thousand years before the time of Christ. According to Bunsen, who is considered to have made the most exact calculations, the mass of masonry and the Great Pyramid of Cheops measures 82,111,000 feet, and would weigh 6,316,000 tons. The immense numbers of squared stones show us the unparalleled skill of the Egyptian quarrymen. Speaking of the Great Pyramid, Kenrick says, the joints are scarcely perceptible, not wider than the thickness of silver paper, and the cement is so tenacious, that fragments of the casing stones still remain in their original position, notwithstanding the lapse of many centuries, and the violence by which they were detached. Who, of our modern architects and chemists, will rediscover the indestructible cement of the oldest Egyptian buildings? The skill of the ancients in quarrying, says Bunsen, is displayed the most in the extracting of the huge blocks, out of which obelisks and colossal statues were hewn obelisks ninety feet high, and statues forty feet high, made out of one stone. There are many such. They did not blast out the blocks for these monuments, but adopted the following scientific method, instead of using huge iron wedges, which would have split the stone, they cut a small groove for the whole length of, perhaps, one hundred feet, and inserted in it, close to each other, a great number of dry wooden wedges, after which they poured water into the groove and the wedges swelling and bursting simultaneously, with a tremendous force, broke out the huge stone, as neatly as a diamond cuts a pane of glass. Modern geographers and geologists have demonstrated that these monoliths were brought from a prodigious distance, and have been at a loss to conjecture how the transport was effected. Old manuscripts say that it was done by the help of portable rails. These rested upon inflated bags of hide, rendered indestructible by the same process as that used for preserving the mummies. These ingenious air cushions prevented the rails from sinking in the deep sand. Manithel mentions them, and remarks that they were so well prepared that they would endure wear and tear for centuries. The date of the hundreds of pyramids in the valley of the Nile is impossible to fix by any of the rules of modern science, but Herodotus informs us that each successive king erected one to commemorate his. p. 519. Reign, and serve as his sepulchre. But, Herodotus did not tell all although he knew that the real purpose of the pyramid was very different from that which he assigns to it. Were it not for his religious scruples, he might have added that, externally, it symbolized the creative principle of nature, and illustrated also the principles of geometry, mathematics, astrology, and astronomy. Internally, it was a majestic fane, in whose somber recesses were performed the mysteries, in whose walls had often witnessed the initiation scenes of members of the royal family. The porphyry sarcophagus, which Professor Piazzi Smith, astronomer royal of Scotland, degrades into a corn bin, was the baptismal font, upon emerging from which, the Nephite was born again, and became an adept. Herodotus gives us, however, a just idea of the enormous labor expended in transporting one of these gigantic blocks of granite. It measured 32 feet in length, 21 feet in width, and 12 feet in height. Its weight he estimates to be rising 300 tons, and it occupied 2,000 men for three years to move it from Syene to the Delta, down the Nile. Glidden, and his ancient Egypt, quotes from Pliny a description of the arrangements for moving the obelisk erected at Alexandria by Ptolemaeus Philadelphus. A canal was dug from the Nile to the place where the obelisk lay. Two boats were floated under it, they were weighted with stones containing one cubic foot each, and the weight of the obelisk having been calculated by the engineers, the cargo of the boats was exactly proportioned to it so that they should be sufficiently submerged to pass under the monolith as it lay across the canal. Then, 
the stones were gradually removed, the boats rose, lifted the obelisk, and it was floated down the river. In the Egyptian section of the Dresden, or Berlin Museum, we forget which, is a drawing which represents a workman ascending an unfinished pyramid, with a basket of sand upon his back. This has suggested to certain Egyptologists the idea that the blocks of the pyramids were chemically manufactured in loco. Some modern engineers believe that Portland cement, a double silicate of lime and alumina, is the imperishable cement of the ancients. But, on the other hand, Professor Carpenter asserts that the pyramids, with the exception of their granite casing, is formed of what geologists call nummulitic limestone. This is newer than the old chalk, and is made of the shells of animals called nummulites like little pieces of money about the size of a shilling. However this mood question may be decided, no one, from Herodotus and Pliny down to the last wandering engineer who has gazed upon these imperial monuments of long crumbled dynasties, has been able to tell us how the gigantic masses were transported and set up in place. Bunsen concedes too. p. 520. Egypt and antiquity of 20,000 years. But even in this matter we would be left to conjecture if we depended upon modern authorities. They can neither tell us for what the pyramids were constructed, under what dynasty the first was raised, nor the material of which they are built. All is conjecture with them. Professor Smith has given us by far the most accurate mathematical description of the Great Pyramid to be found in literature. But after showing the astronomical bearings of the structure, he so little appreciates ancient Egyptian thought that he actually maintains that the porphyry sarcophagus of the king's chamber is the unit of measure for the two most enlightened nations of the earth England and America. One of the books of Hermes describes certain of the pyramids as standing upon the seashore, the waves of which dashed in powerless fury against its base. This implies that the geographical features of the country have been changed, and may indicate that we must accord to these ancient granaries, magico-astrological observatories, and royal sepulchres, an origin antedating the upheaval of the Sahara and other deserts. This would imply rather more of an antiquity than the poor few thousands of years, so generously accorded to them by Egyptologists. Dr. Rebold, a French archaeologist of some renown, gives his readers a glimpse of the culture which prevailed 5,000 years BC, by saying that there were at that time no less than 30 or 40 colleges of the priests who studied occult sciences and practical magic. A writer in the National Quarterly Review, Volume 32, no. 63, December, 1875, says that, the recent excavations made among the ruins of Carthage have brought to light traces of a civilization, a refinement of art and luxury, which must even have outshone that of ancient Rome, and when the fiat went forth, the lenda es Cartajo, the mistress of the world well knew that she was about to destroy a greater than herself, for, while one empire swayed the world by force of arms alone, the other was the last and most perfect representative of a race who had, for centuries before Rome was dreamed of, directed the civilization, the learning, and the intelligence of mankind. This Carthage is the one which, according to Appian, was standing as early as BC 1234, or fifty years before the taking of Troy, and not the one popularly supposed to have been built by Dido, Ulysses or Astarte, four centuries later. Here we have still another illustration of the truth of the doctrine of cycles. Draper's admissions as to the astronomical erudition of the ancient Egyptians are singularly supported by an interesting fact quoted by Mr. J. M. Peebles, from a lecture delivered in Philadelphia, by the late Professor Owen Mitchell, the astronomer. Upon the coffin of a mummy, now in the British Museum, was delineated the zodiac with the p. 521. Exact positions of the planets at the time of the autumnal equinox, in the year 1722 BC Professor Mitchell calculated the exact position of the heavenly bodies belonging to our solar system at the time indicated. The result, says Mr. Peebles, I give in his own words, to my astonishment, it was found that on the 7th of October, 1722 BC, the moon and planets had occupied the exact points in the heavens marked upon the coffin in the British Museum. Professor John Fisk, in his onslaught on Dr. Draper's history of the intellectual development of Europe, sets his pen against the doctrine of cyclical progression, remarking that we have never known the beginning or the end of an historic cycle, and have no inductive warrant for believing that we are now traversing one. He chides the author of that eloquent and thoughtful work for the odd disposition exhibited throughout his work, not only to refer the best part of Greek culture to an Egyptian source, but uniformly to exalt the non-European civilization at the expense of the European. We believe that this odd disposition might be directly sanctioned by the confessions of great Grecian historians themselves. 
Professor Fisk might, with profit, read Herodotus over again. The father of history confesses more than once that Greece owes everything to Egypt. As to his assertion that the world has never known the beginning or the end of an historical cycle, we have but to cast a retrospective glance on the many glorious nations which have passed away, i.e., reached the end of their great national cycle. Compare the Egypt of that day, with its perfection of art, science, and religion, its glorious cities and monuments, and its swarming population, with the Egypt of today, peopled with strangers, its ruins the abode of bats and snakes, and a few cops the sole surviving heirs to all this grandeur and see whether the cyclical theory does not reassert itself. Says Glidden, who is now contradicted by Mr. Fisk, philologists, astronomers, chemists, painters, architects, physicians, must return to Egypt to learn the origin of language and writing, of the calendar and solar motion, of the art of cutting granite with a copper chisel, and of giving elasticity to a copper sword, of making glass with the variegated hues of the rainbow, of moving single blocks of polished cyanide, 900 tons in weight, for any distance, by land and water, of building arches, rounded and pointed, with Masonic precision unsurpassed at the present day, an antecedent by 2,000 years to the Cloaca Magna of Rome, of sculpturing a Doric column 1,000 years before the Dorians are known in. p. 522. History, a fresco painting in imperishable colors, of practical knowledge in anatomy, and of time-defying pyramid building. Every craftsman can behold, in Egyptian monuments, the progress of his art 4,000 years ago, and whether it be a wheelwright building a chariot, a shoemaker drawing his twine, a leather cutter using the self-same form of knife of old as is considered the best form now, a weaver throwing the same hand shuttle, a whitesmith using that identical form of blowpipe but lately recognized to be the most efficient, the seal engraver cutting, and hieroglyphics, such names as skuos, above 4,300 years ago all these, and many more astounding evidences of Egyptian priority, now require but a glance at the plates of Rossellini. Truly, exclaims Mr. Peebles, these Rumshan temples and tombs were as much a marvel to the Grecian Herodotus as they are to us. But, even then, the merciless hand of time had left its traces upon their structures, and some of them, whose very memory would be lost were it not for the books of Hermes, had been swept away into the oblivion of the ages. King after king, and dynasty after dynasty had passed in a glittering pageant before the eyes of succeeding generations and their renown had filled the habitable globe. The same pall of forgetfulness had fallen upon them and their monuments alike, before the first of our historical authorities, Herodotus, preserved for posterity the remembrance of that wonder of the world, the great labyrinth. The long-accepted biblical chronology has so cramped the minds of not only the clergy, but even our scarce unfettered scientists, that in treating of prehistoric remains in different parts of the world, a constant fear is manifested on their part to trespass beyond the period of six thousand years hitherto allowed by theology as the age of the world. Herodotus found the labyrinth already in ruins, but nevertheless his admiration for the genius of its builders knew no bounds. He regarded it as far more marvelous than the pyramids themselves, and, as an eyewitness, minutely describes it. The French and Prussian savants, as well as other Egyptologists, agree as to the emplacement, and identified its noble ruins. Moreover, they confirm the account given of it by the old historian. Herodotus says that he found there in three thousand chambers, half subterranean and the other half above ground. The upper chambers, he says, I myself passed through and examined in detail. And the underground ones, which may exist till now, for all the archaeologists know, the keepers of the building would not let me in, for they contain the sepulchres of the kings who built the labyrinth, and also those of the sacred crocodiles. The upper chambers I saw and examined with. p. 523 my own eyes, and found them to excel all other human productions. In Rawlinson's translation, Herodotus is made to say, the passages through the houses and the varied windings of the paths across the courts, excited in me infinite admiration as I passed from the courts into the chambers, and from thence into colonnades, and from colonnades into other houses, and again into courts unseen before. The roof was throughout of stone like the walls, and both were exquisitely carved all over with figures. Every court was surrounded with a colonnade, which was built of white stones, sculptured most exquisitely. At the corner of the labyrinth stands a pyramid forty fathoms high, with large figures engraved on it, and it is entered by a vast subterranean passage. If such was the labyrinth, when viewed by Herodotus, what, in such a case, was ancient Thebes, the city destroyed far earlier than the period of Psammeticus, 
who himself reigned 530 years after the destruction of Troy? We find that in his time Memphis was the capital, while of the glorious Thebes there remained but ruins. Now, if we, who are enabled to form our estimate only by the ruins of what was already ruined so many ages before our era are stupefied in their contemplation, what must have been the general aspect of Thebes in the days of its glory? Karnak Temple, Palace, Ruins, or whatsoever the archaeologists may term it is now its only representative. But solitary and alone as it stands, fit emblem of majestic empire, as if forgotten by time in the onward march of the centuries, it testifies to the art and skill of the ancients. He must be indeed devoid of the spiritual perception of genius, who fails to feel as well as to see the intellectual grandeur of the race that planned and built it. Champollion, who passed almost his entire life in the exploration of archaeological remains, gives vent to his emotions in the following descriptions of Karnak. The ground covered by the mass of remaining buildings is square, and each side measures 1,800 feet. One is astounded and overcome by the grandeur of the sublime remnants, the prodigality and magnificence of workmanship to be seen everywhere. No people of ancient or modern times has conceived the art of architecture upon a scale so sublime, so grandiose as it existed among the ancient Egyptians, and the imagination, which in Europe soars far above our porticos, rests itself and falls powerless at the foot of the hundred and forty columns of the high post isle of Karnak. In one of its halls, the Cathedral of Notre Dame might stand and not touch the ceiling, but be considered as a small ornament in the center of the hall. A writer in a number of an English periodical, of 1870, evidently speaking with the authority of a traveler who describes what he has seen, expresses himself as follows, courts, halls, gateways, pillars. p. 524. Obelisks, monolithic figures, sculptures, long rows of sphinxes, are found in such profusion at Karnak, that the sight is too much for modem comprehension. Says Denon, the French traveler, it is hardly possible to believe, after seeing it, in the reality of the existence of so many buildings collected together on a single point, in their dimensions, in the resolute perseverance which their construction required, and in the incalculable expenses of so much magnificence. It is necessary that the reader should fancy what is before him to be a dream, as he who views the objects themselves occasionally yields to the doubt whether he be perfectly awake. There are lakes and mountains within the periphery of the sanctuary. These two edifices are selected as examples from a list next to inexhaustible. The whole valley and delta of the Nile, from the cataracts to the sea, was covered with temples, palaces, tombs, pyramids, obelisks, and pillars. The execution of the sculptures is beyond praise. The mechanical perfection with which artists wrought in granite, serpentine, breccia, and basalt, is wonderful, according to all the experts. Animals and plants look as good as natural, and artificial objects are beautifully sculptured, battles by sea and land, and scenes of domestic life are to be found in all their bar reliefs. The monuments, says an English author, which there strike the traveler, fill his mind with great ideas. At the sight of the colossuses and superb obelisks, which seem to surpass the limits of human nature, he cannot help exclaiming, this was the work of man, and this sentiment seems to ennoble his existence. In his turn, Dr. Richardson, speaking of the Temple of Dendera, says, the female figures are so extremely well executed, that they do all but speak, they have a mildness of feature and expression that never was surpassed. Every one of these stones is covered with hieroglyphics, and the more ancient they are, the more beautifully we find them chiseled. Does not this furnish a new proof that history got its first glimpse of the ancients when the arts were already fast degenerating among them? The obelisks have their inscriptions cut two inches, and sometimes more, in depth, and they are cut with the highest degree of perfection. Some idea may be formed of their depth, from the fact that the Arabs, for a small fee, will climb sometimes to the very top of an obelisk, by inserting their toes and fingers in the excavations of the hieroglyphics. That all of these works, in which solidity rivals the beauty of their execution, were done before the days of the Exodus, there remains no historical doubt whatever. All. p. 525. The archaeologists now agree in saying that, the further back we go in history, the better and finer become these arts, these views clash again with the individual opinion of Mr. Fisk, who would have us believe that the sculptures upon these monuments, of Egypt, Hindustan, and Assyria, moreover, betoken a very undeveloped condition of the artistic faculties. Nay, the learned gentleman goes farther. 
joining his voice in the opposition against the claims of learning which belongs by right to the sacerdotal caste of antiquity to that of Lewis. He contemptuously remarks that the extravagant theory of a profound science possessed by the Egyptian priesthood from a remote antiquity, and imparted to itinerant Greek philosophers, has been utterly destroyed by Sir G. C. Lewis, while, with regard to Egypt and Hindustan, as well as Assyria, it may be said that the colossal monuments which have adorned these countries since prehistoric times, bear witness to the former prevalence of a barbaric despotism, totally incompatible with social nobility, and, therefore, with well-sustained progress. A curious argument, indeed. If the size and grandeur of public monuments are to serve to our posterity as a standard by which to approximately estimate the progress of civilization attained by their builders, it may be prudent, perhaps, for America, so proud of her alleged progress and freedom, to dwarf her buildings at once to one story. Otherwise, according to Professor Fiss's theory, the archaeologists of AD 3877 will be applying to the ancient America of 1877, the rule of Lewis and say the ancient United States may be considered as a great latifundium, or plantation, cultivated by the entire population, as the kings, presidents, slaves. Is it because the white-skinned Aryan races were never born builders, like the eastern Ethiopians, or dark-skinned Caucasians, and, therefore, never able to compete with the latter in such colossal structures, that we must jump at the conclusion that these grandiose temples and pyramids could only have been erected under the whip of a merciless despot? Strange logic. It would really seem more prudent to hold to the rigorous canons of criticism laid down by Lewis and Grote, and honestly confess at once, that we really know little about these ancient nations, and that, except so far as purely hypothetical speculations go, unless we study in the same direction as the ancient priests did, we have as little chance in the future. We only know what they allowed the uninitiated to know, but the little we do learn of. p. 526. Them by deduction, ought to be sufficient to assure us that, even in the 19th century, with all our claims to supremacy in arts and sciences, we are totally unable, we will not say to build anything like the monuments of Egypt, Hindustan, or Assyria, but even to rediscover the least of the ancient lost arts. Besides, Sir Gardner Wilkinson gives forcible expression to this view of the exhumed treasures of old, by adding that, he can trace no primitive mode of life, no barbarous customs, but a sort of stationary civilization from the most remote periods. Thus far, archaeology disagrees with geology, which affirms that the further they trace the remains of men, the more barbarous they find them. It is doubtful if geology has even yet exhausted the field of research afforded her in the caves, and the views of geologists, which are based upon present experience, may be radically modified, when they come to discover the remains of the ancestors of the people whom they now style the cave dwellers. What better illustrates the theory of cycles than the following fact? Nearly 700 years BC, in the schools of Thales and Pythagoras was taught the doctrine of the true motion of the earth, its form, and the whole heliocentric system. And in 317 AD, we find Lactantius, the preceptor of Crispus Caesar, son of Constantine the Great, teaching his pupil that the earth was a plain surrounded by the sky, which is composed of fire and water, and warning him against the heretical doctrine of the earth's globular form. Whenever, in the pride of some new discovery, we throw a look into the past, we find, to our dismay, certain vestiges which indicate the possibility, if not certainty, that the alleged discovery was not totally unknown to the ancients. It is generally asserted that neither the early inhabitants of the Mosaic times, nor even the more civilized nations of the Ptolemaic period were acquainted with electricity. If we remain undisturbed in this opinion, it is not for lack of proofs to the contrary. We may disdain to search for a profounder meaning in some characteristic sentences of Sereus, and other writers, we cannot so obliterate them but that, at some future day, that meaning will appear to us in all its significant truths. The first inhabitants of the earth, says he, never carried fire to their altars, but by their prayers they brought down the heavenly fire. Prometheus discovered and revealed to man the art of bringing down lightning, and by the method which he taught to them, they brought down fire from the region above. If, after pondering these words, we are still willing to attribute them to. p. 527. The phraseology of mythological fables, we may turn to the days of Numa, the king philosopher, so renowned for his esoteric learning and find ourselves more embarrassed to deal with his case. We can neither accuse him of ignorance, superstition, nor credulity, for, if history can be believed at all, 
he was intently bent on destroying polytheism and idol worship. He had so well dissuaded the Romans from idolatry that for nearly two centuries neither statues nor images appeared in their temples. On the other hand, old historians tell us that the knowledge which Numa possessed in natural physics was remarkable. Tradition says that he was initiated by the priests of the Etruscan divinities, and instructed by them in the secret of forcing Jupiter, the thunderer, to descend upon earth. Ovid shows that Jupiter Elysius began to be worshipped by the Romans from that time. Salvert is of the opinion that before Franklin discovered his refined electricity, Numa had experimented with it most successfully, and that Tullus Hostilius was the first victim of the dangerous heavenly guess recorded in history. Titus Livy and Pliny narrate that this prince, having found in the books of Numa, instructions on the secret sacrifices offered to Jupiter Elysius, made a mistake, and, in consequence of it, he was struck by lightning and consumed in his own palace. Salvert remarks that Pliny, in the exposition of Numa's scientific secrets, makes use of expressions which seem to indicate two distinct processes, the one obtained thunder, impetrator, the other forced it to lightning, cogir. Guided by Numa's book, says Lucius, quoted by Pliny, Tullus undertook to invoke the aid of Jupiter. But having performed the rite imperfectly, he perished, struck by thunder. Tracing back the knowledge of thunder and lightning possessed by the Etruscan priests, we find that Tarkin, the founder of the theurgism of the former, desiring to preserve his house from lightning, surrounded it by a hedge of the white bryony, a climbing plant which has the property of averting thunderbolts. Tarkin the theurgist was much anterior to the siege of Troy. The pointed metallic lightning rod, for which we are seemingly indebted to Franklin, is probably a rediscovery after all. There are many metals which seem to strongly indicate that the principle was anciently known. The Temple of Juno had its roof covered with a quantity of pointed blades of swords. p. 528. If we possess but little proof of the ancients having had any clear notions as to all the effects of electricity, there is very strong evidence, at all events, of their having been perfectly acquainted with electricity itself. Ben David, says the author of the Occult Sciences, has asserted that Moses possessed some knowledge of the phenomena of electricity. Professor Hurt, of Berlin, is of this opinion. Michaelis, remarks firstly, that there is no indication that lightning ever struck the Temple of Jerusalem, during a thousand years. Secondly, that according to Josephus, a forest of points, of gold, and very sharp, covered the roof of the temple. Thirdly, that this roof communicated with the caverns in the hill upon which the temple was situated, by means of pipes in connection with the gilding which covered all the exterior of the building, in consequence of which the points would act as conductors. Aminus Marcellinus, a famous historian of the 4th century, a writer generally esteemed for the fairness and correctness of his statements, tells that the Magi, preserved perpetually in their furnaces fire that they miraculously got from heaven. There is a sentence in the Hindu Amkat, which runs thus, to know fire, the sun, the moon, and lightning, is three-fourths of the science of God. Finally, Salvert shows that in the days of Kijas, India was acquainted with the use of conductors of lightning. This historian plainly states that iron placed at the bottom of a fountain, and made in the form of a sword, with the point upward, possessed, as soon as it was thus fixed in the ground, the property of averting storms and lightnings. What can be plainer? Some modern writers deny the fact that a great mirror was placed in the lighthouse of the Alexandrian port, for the purpose of discovering vessels at a distance at sea. But the renowned Buffon believed in it, for he honestly confesses that if the mirror really existed, as I firmly believe it did, to the ancients belonged the honor of the invention of the telescope. Stevens, in his work on the East, asserts that he found railroads in Upper Egypt whose grooves were coated with iron. Canova, Powers, and other celebrated sculptors of our modern age deem it an honor to be compared with Phidias of old, and strict truth would, perhaps, hesitate at such a flattery. p. 529. Professor Joe discredits the story of the Atlantis, and the Timaeus, and the records of 8,000 and 9,000 years appear to him an ancient swindle. But Bunsen remarks, there is nothing improbable in itself in reminiscences and records of great events in Egypt 9,000 years BC, for, the origins of Egypt go back to the ninth millennium before Christ. Then how about the primitive Cyclopean fortresses of ancient Greece? Can the walls of Turins, about which, according to archaeological accounts, even among the ancients it was reported to have been the work of the Cyclops, be deemed posterior to the pyramids? Masses of rock, some equal to a cube of six feet, and the smallest of which, Pausanias says, 
could never be moved by a yoke of oxen, laid up in walls of solid masonry twenty-five feet thick and over forty feet high, still believed to be the work of men of the races known to our history. Wilkinson's researches have brought to light the fact that many inventions of what we term modern, and upon which we plume ourselves, were perfected by the ancient Egyptians. The newly discovered papyrus of Ebers, the German archaeologist, proves that neither are modern chignons, skin-beautifying pearl powders, nor o dentifrices were secrets to them. More than one modern physician even among those who advertise themselves as having made a speciality of nervous disorders may find his advantage in consulting the medical books of Hermes, which contain prescriptions of real therapeutic value. The Egyptians, as we have seen, excelled in all arts. They made paper so excellent in quality as to be time-proof. They took out the pith of the papyrus, says our anonymous writer, previously mentioned, dissected and opened the fiber, and flattening it by a process known to them, made it as thin as our foolscap paper, but far more durable. They sometimes cut it into strips and glued it together. Many of such written documents are yet in existence. The papyrus found in the tomb of the queen's mummy, and another one found in the sarcophagus of the Chambre de la Reine, I could say present the appearance of the finest glossy white muslin, while it possesses the durability of the best calf parchment. For a long time the savants believed the papyrus to have been introduced by Alexander the Great as they erroneously imagined a good many more things but Lepsius found rolls of papyri in tombs and monuments of the 12th dynasty, sculptured pictures of papyri were found later, on monuments of the 4th dynasty, and now it is proved that the art of writing was known and used as early as the days of Menes, the proto-monarch and thus it was finally discovered. p. 530. That the art and their system of writing were perfect and complete from the very first. It is to Champollion that we owe the first interpretation of their weird writing, and, but for his lifelong labor, we would till now remain uninformed as to the meaning of all these pictured letters, and the ancients would still be considered ignorant by the moderns whom they so greatly excelled in some arts and sciences. He was the first to find out what wondrous tale the Egyptians had to tell for one who could read their endless manuscripts and records. They left them on every spot an object capable of receiving characters. They engraved, and chiseled, and sculptured them on monuments, they traced them on furniture, rocks, stones, walls, coffins, and tombs, as on the papyrus. The pictures of their daily lives, in their smallest details, are being now unraveled before our dazzled eyes in the most wondrous way. Nothing, of what we know, seems to have been overlooked by the ancient Egyptians. The history of Sesestri shows us how well he and his people were versed in the art and practice of war. The pictures show how formidable they were when encountered in battle. They constructed war engines. Horner says that through each of the 100 gates of Thebes issued 200 men with horses and chariots. The latter were magnificently constructed, and very light in comparison with our modern heavy, clumsy, and uncomfortable artillery wagons. Kenner describes them in the following terms, in short, as all the essential principles which regulate the construction and draft of carriages are exemplified in the war chariots of the pharaohs, so there is nothing which modern tastes and luxury have devised for their decoration to which we do not find a prototype in the monuments of the 18th dynasty. Springs metallic springs have been found in them, and, notwithstanding Wilkinson's superficial investigation in that direction, and description of these in his studies, we find proofs that such were used to prevent the jolting and the chariots in their too rapid course. The bar-reliefs show a certain melees and battles in which we can find and trace their uses and customs to the smallest details. The heavily armed men fought in coats of mail, the infantry had quilted tunics and felt helmets, with metallic coverings to protect them the better. Oratori, the modern Italian inventor who, some ten years ago, introduced his impenetrable cuirassae, has but followed in his invention what he could make out of the ancient method which suggested to him the idea. The process of rendering such objects as cardboard, felt, and other tissues, impenetrable to the cuts and thrusts of any sharp weapon, is now numbered among the lost arts. More Tory succeeded but imperfectly in preparing such felt cuirasses, and, notwithstanding the boasted achievements of modern chemistry. p. 531. He could derive from it no preparation adequate to effect his object, and failed. To what perfection chemistry had reached in ancient times, may be inferred from a fact mentioned by Viry. In his dissertations, he shows that Asclepiodotus, a general of Mithridates, reproduced chemically the deleterious exhalations of the sacred grotto. These vapors, like those of Kearney, threw the pythonus into the mantic frenzy. Egyptians used bows, 
double-edged swords and daggers, javelins, spears, and pikes. The light troops were armed with darts and slings, charioteers wielded maces and battleaxes, and siege operations they were perfect. The assailants, says the anonymous writer, advanced, forming an arrow and long line, the point being protected by a triple-sided, impenetrable engine pushed before them on a kind of roller, by an invisible squad of men. They had covered underground passages with trapdoors, scaling ladders, and the art of escalade and military strategy was carried by them to perfection. The battering ram was familiar to them as other things, being such experts in quarrying they knew how to set a mine to a wall and bring it down. The same writer remarks, that it is a great deal safer for us to mention what the Egyptians did than what they did not know, for every day brings some new discovery of their wonderful knowledge, and if, he adds, we were to find out that they used Armstrong guns, this fact would not be much more astonishing than many of the facts brought out to light already. The proof that they were proficient in mathematical sciences, lies in the fact that those ancient mathematicians whom we honor as the fathers of geometry went to Egypt to be instructed. Says Professor Smith, as quoted by Mr. Peebles, the geometrical knowledge of the pyramid builders began where Euclid's ended. Before Greece came into existence, the arts, with the Egyptians, were ripe and old. Land measuring, an art resting on geometry, the Egyptians certainly knew well, as, according to the Bible, Joshua, after conquering the Holy Land, had skill enough to divide it. And how could a people so skilled in natural philosophy as the Egyptians were, not be proportionally skilled in psychology and spiritual philosophy? The temple was the nursery of the highest civilization, and it alone possessed that higher knowledge of magic which was in itself the quintessence of natural philosophy. The occult powers of nature were taught in the greatest secrecy and the most wonderful cures were performed during the performing of the mysteries. Herodotus acknowledges that the Greeks learned all they knew, including the sacred services of the temple, from the Egyptians, and because of that. p. 532. Their principal temples were consecrated to Egyptian divinities. Olympus the famous healer and soothsayer of Argos, had to use his medicines after the manner of the Egyptians, from whom he had gained his knowledge, whenever he desired his cure to be thoroughly effective. He healed Iphiclus of his impotency and debility by the rust of iron, according to the directions of Mantis, his magnetic sleeper, or oracle. Sprengel gives many wonderful instances of such magical cures in his history of medicine, cp. 119. Diodorus, in his work on the Egyptians, Lib. I, says that Isis has deserved immortality, for all nations of the earth bear witness to the power of this goddess to cure diseases by her influence. This is proved, he says, not by fable as among the Greeks, but by authentic facts. Galen records several remedial means which were preserved in the healing wards of the temples. He mentions also a universal medicine which in his time was called Isis. The doctrines of several Greek philosophers, who had been instructed in Egypt, demonstrates their profound learning. Orpheus, who, according to Artapanus, was a disciple of Moises, Moses, Pythagoras, Herodotus, and Plato owe their philosophy to the same temples in which the wise Solon was instructed by the priest. Anticlides relates, says Pliny, that the letters were invented in Egypt by a person whose name was Menon, fifteen years before Pharaonius the most ancient king of Greece. Yablonsky proves that the heliocentric system, as well as the Earth's sphericity, were known by the priests of Egypt from immemorial ages. This theory, he adds, Pythagoras took from the Egyptians, who had it from the Brachmans of India. Fenelon, the illustrious Archbishop of Cambrai, in his Lives of the Ancient Philosophers, credits Pythagoras with this knowledge, and says that besides teaching his disciples that as the Earth was round there were antipodes, since it was inhabited everywhere, the great mathematician was the first to discover that the morning and evening star was the same. If we now consider that Pythagoras lived in about the 16th Olympiad, over 700 years BC, and taught this fact at such an early period, we must believe that it was known by others before him. The works of Aristotle, Laertius, and several others in which Pythagoras is mentioned, demonstrate that he had learned from the Egyptians about the obliquity of the ecliptic, the starry composition of the Milky Way, and the borrowed light of the moon. p. 533. Wilkinson, corroborated later by others, says that the Egyptians divided time, knew the true length of the year, and the procession of the equinoxes. By recording the rising and setting of the stars, they understood the particular influences which proceed from the positions and conjunctions of all heavenly bodies, and therefore their priests, 
prophesying as accurately as our modern astronomers, meteorological changes, could, and plus, astrologize through astral motions. Though the sober and eloquent Cicero may be partially right in his indignation against the exaggerations of the Babylonian priests, who assert that they have preserved upon monuments observations extending back during an interval of 470,000 years, still, the period at which astronomy had arrived at its perfection with the ancients is beyond the reach of modern calculation. A writer in one of our scientific journals observes that every science in its growth passes through three stages. First, we have the stage of observation, when facts are collected and registered by many minds in many places. Next, we have the stage of generalization, when these carefully verified facts are arranged methodically, generalized systematically, and classified logically, so as to deduce and elucidate from them the laws that regulate their role and order. Lastly, we have the stage of prophecy, when these laws are so applied that events can be predicted to occur with unerring accuracy. If several thousand years BC, Chinese and Chaldean astronomers predicted eclipses the latter, whether by the cycle of sorrows, or other means, matters not the fact remains the same. They had reached the last and highest stage of astronomical science they prophesied. If they could, in the year 1722 BC, delineate the zodiac with the exact positions of the planets at the time of the autumnal equinox, and so unerringly as Professor Mitchell, the astronomer, proved, then they knew the laws that regulate carefully verified facts to perfection, and applied them with as much certainty as our modern astronomers. Moreover, astronomy is said to be in our century the only science which has thoroughly reached the last stage, other sciences are yet in various stages of growth, electricity, in some branches, has reached the third stage, but in many branches is still in its infantine period. This we know, on the exasperating confessions of men of science themselves, and we can entertain no doubt as to this sad reality in the nineteenth century, as we belong ourselves to it. Not so in relation to the men who lived in the days of the glory of Chaldea, Assyria, and Babylon. Of the stages they reached in other sciences we know nothing, except that in astronomy they stood equal with us, for they had also reached the third and last stage. In his lecture on the p. 534. Lost Arts, Wendell Phillips very artistically describes the situation. We seem to imagine, says he, that whether knowledge will die with us or not, it certainly began with us. We have a pitying estimate, a tender pity for the narrowness, ignorance, and darkness of the bygone ages. To illustrate our own idea with the closing sentence of the favorite lecturer, we may as well confess that we undertook this chapter, which in one sense interrupts our narrative, to inquire of our men of science, whether they are sure that they are boasting on the right line. Thus we read of a people, who, according to some learned writers, had just emerged from the Bronze Age into the succeeding Age of Iron. If Chaldea, Assyria, and Babylon presented stupendous and venerable antiquities reaching far back into the night of time, Persia was not without her wonders of a later date. The pillared halls of Persepolis were filled with miracles of art carvings, sculptures, enamels, alabaster libraries, obelisks, sphinxes, colossal bulls. Ekbatana, in Media, the cool summer retreat of the Persian kings, was defended by seven encircling walls of hewn and polished blocks, the interior ones in succession of increasing height, and of different colors, in astrological accordance with the seven planets. The palace was roofed with silver tiles, its beams were plated with gold. At midnight, in its halls, the sun was rivaled by many a row of Nafa crescents. A paradise, that luxury of the monarchs of the east, was planted in the midst of the city. The Persian Empire was truly the garden of the world. In Babylon there still remained its walls, once more than sixty miles in compass and, after the ravages of three centuries and three conquerors, still more than eighty feet in height, there were still the ruins of the Temple of the Cloud and Compass Bell, on its top was planted the observatory wherein the weird Chaldean astronomers had held nocturnal communion with the stars, still there were vestiges of the two palaces with their hanging gardens, in which were trees growing in midair, and the wreck of the hydraulic machinery that had supplied them from the river. Into the artificial lake, with its vast apparatus of aqueducts and sluices, the melted snows of the Armenian mountains found their way and were confined in their course through the city by the embankments of the Euphrates. Most wonderful of all, perhaps, was the tunnel under the riverbed. p. 535. In his first traces of man in Europe, Albrecht Muller proposes a name descriptive of the age in which we live, and suggests that the age of paper is perhaps as good as any that can be discussed. We do not agree with the learned professor. Our firm opinion is, 
that succeeding generations will term ours, at best, the age of brass, at worst, that of Albeda or of Oroid. The thought of the present-day commentator and critic as to the ancient learning, is limited to and runs round the exoterism of the temples, his insight is either unwilling or unable to penetrate into the solemn adage of old, where the Hierophant instructed the neophyte to regard the public worship in its true light. No ancient sage would have thought that man is the king of creation, and that the starry heaven and our mother earth were created for his sake. He, who doubts the assertion, may turn to the magical and philosophical precepts of Zoroaster, and find its corroboration in the following. Direct not thy mind to the vast measures of the earth. For the plan of truth is not upon ground, nor measure the measures of the sun, collecting rules. For he is carried by the eternal will of the Father, not for your sake. Dismiss the impetuous course of the moon, for she runs always by work of necessity. The progression of the stars was not generated for your sake. A rather strange teaching to come from those who are universally believed to have worshipped the sun, and moon, and the starry host, as gods. The sublime profundity of the Magian precepts being beyond the reach of modern materialistic thought, the Chaldean philosophers are accused, together with the ignorant masses, of Sabianism and sun worship. There was a vast difference between the true worship taught to those who showed themselves worthy, and the state religions. The Magians are accused of all kinds of superstition, but this is what a Chaldean oracle says. The wide aerial flight of birds is not true. Nor the dissections of the entrails of victims, they are all mere toys. The basis of mercenary fraud, flee from these. If you would open the sacred paradise of piety, where virtue, wisdom, and equity, are assembled. Surely, it is not those who warn people against mercenary fraud who can be accused of it, and if they accomplish acts which seem. p. 536. Miraculous, who can with fairness presume to deny that it was done merely because they possessed the knowledge of natural philosophy and psychological science to a degree unknown to our schools? What did they not know? It is a well-demonstrated fact that the true meridian was correctly ascertained before the first pyramid was built. They had clocks and dials to measure time, their cubit was the established unit of linear measure, being 1,707 feet of English measure, according to Herodotus the unit of weight was also known, as money, they had gold and silver rings valued by weight, they had the decimal and duodecimal modes of calculation from the earliest times, and were proficient in algebra. How could they otherwise, says an unknown author, bring into operation such immense mechanical powers, if they had not thoroughly understood the philosophy of what we term the mechanical powers? The art of making linen and fine fabrics is also proved to have been one of their branches of knowledge, for the Bible speaks of it. Joseph was presented by Pharaoh with a vesture of fine linen, a golden chain, and many more things. The linen of Egypt was famous throughout the world. The mummies are all wrapped in it and the linen is beautifully preserved. Pliny speaks of a certain garment sent 600 years BC, by King Amasis to Lindus, every single thread of which was composed of 360 minor threads twisted together. Herodotus gives us, Book I, in his account of Isis and the mysteries performed in her honor, an idea of the beauty and admirable softness of the linen worn by the priests. The latter wore shoes made of papyrus and garments of fine linen, because this goddess first taught the use of it, and thus, besides being called Isisai, or priests of Isis, they were also known as Linigera, or the linen-wearing. This linen was spun and dyed in those brilliant and gorgeous colors, the secret of which is likewise now among the lost arts. On the mummies we often find the most beautiful embroidery and beadwork ornamenting their shirts, several of such can be seen in the Museum of Bulak, Cairo, and are unsurpassable in beauty, the designs are exquisite, and the labor seems immense. The elaborate and so much vaunted Gablon tapestry, is but a gross production when compared with some of the embroidery of the ancient Egyptians. We have but to refer to Exodus to discover how skillful was the workmanship of the Israelitish pupils of the Egyptians upon their tabernacle and sacred ark and saw the sacerdotal vestments, with their decorations of pomegranates and golden bells, and the thummim, or jewel breastplate of the high priest, are described by Josephus as being of unparalleled beauty and of wonderful workmanship, and yet we find beyond doubt that the Jews adopted their rites and ceremonies, and even the special dress of their Levites. P. 537 from the Egyptians. Clemens Alexandrinus acknowledges it very reluctantly, and so does Origen and other fathers of the church, some of whom, as a matter of course, attribute the coincidence to a clever trick of Satan in anticipation of events. 
Proctor, the astronomer, says in one of his books, the remarkable breastplate worn by the Jewish high priest was derived directly from the Egyptians. The word thumma itself is evidently of Egyptian origin, borrowed by Moses, like the rest, for further on the same page, Mr. Proctor says that, in the often repeated picture of judgment the deceased Egyptian is seen conducted by the god Horus, while Anubis places on one of the balances a vase supposed to contain his good actions, and in the other is the emblem of truth, a representation of Thme, the goddess of truth, which was also worn on the judicial breastplate. Wilkinson, in his manners and customs of the ancient Egyptians, shows that the Hebrew thummim is a plural form of the word Thme. All the ornamental arts seem to have been known to the Egyptians. Their jewelry of gold, silver, and precious stones are beautifully wrought, so was the cutting, polishing, and setting of them executed by their lapidaries in the finest style. The finger ring of an Egyptian mummy if we remember right was pronounced the most artistic piece of jewelry in the London Exhibition of 1851. Their imitation of precious stones and glass is far above anything done at the present day, and the emerald may be said to have been imitated to perfection. In Pompeii, says Wendell Phillips, they discovered a room full of glass. There was ground glass, window glass, cut glass, and colored glass of every variety. Catholic priests who broke into China 200 years ago were shown a glass, transparent and colorless, which was filled with liquor made by the Chinese, and which appeared to be colorless like water. This liquor was poured into the glass, and then looking through, it seemed to be filled with fishes. They turned it out and repeated the experiment and again it was filled with fishes. In Rome they show a bit of glass, a transparent glass which they light up so as to show you that there is nothing concealed, but in the center of the glass is a drop of colored glass, perhaps as large as a pea, mottled like a duck, and which even a miniature pencil could not do more perfectly. It is manifest that this drop of liquid glass must have been poured, because there is no joint. This must have been done by a greater heat than the annealing process, because that process shows breaks. In relation to their wonderful art of imitating precious stones, the lecturer speaks of the celebrated vase of the Genoa Cathedral, which was p. 538, considered for long centuries a solid emerald. The Roman Catholic legend of it was that it was one of the treasures that the Queen of Sheba gave to Solomon, and that it was the identical cup out of which the Savior drank at the Last Supper. Subsequently it was found not to be an emerald, but an imitation, and when Napoleon brought it to Paris and gave it to the Institute, the scientists were obliged to confess that it was not a stone, and that they could not tell what it was. Further, speaking of the scale of the ancients and metal works, the same lecturer narrates that when the English plundered the summer palace of the Emperor of China, the European artists were surprised at seeing the curiously wrought metal vessels of every kind, far exceeding all the boasted scale of the workmen of Europe. African tribes in the interior of the country gave travelers better razors than they had. George Thompson told me, he adds, he saw a man in Calcutta throw a handful of floss silk into the air, and a Hindu sever it into pieces with his saber of native steel. He concludes by the apt remark that the steel is the greatest triumph of metallurgy, and metallurgy is the glory of chemistry. So with the ancient Egyptians and Semitic races. They dug gold and separated it with the utmost skill. Copper, lead, and iron were found in abundance near the Red Sea. In a lecture delivered in 1873, on the caveman of Devonshire, Mr. W. Pingeli, FRS, stated on the authority of some Egyptologists that the first iron used in Egypt was meteoric iron, as the earliest mention of this metal is found in an Egyptian document, in which it is called the stone from heaven. This would imply the idea that the only iron which was in use in days of old was meteorite. This may have been the case at the commencement of the period embraced in our present geological explorations, but till we can compute with at least approximate accuracy the age of our excavated relics, who can tell but that we are making a blunder of possibly several hundred thousand years? The injudiciousness of dogmatizing upon what the ancient Chaldeans and Egyptians did not know about mining and metallurgy is at least partially shown by the discoveries of Colonel Howard Weiss. Moreover, many of such precious stones as are only found at a great depth in mines are mentioned in Homer and the Hebrew scriptures. Have scientists ascertained the precise time when mining shafts were first sunk by mankind? According to Dr. A.C. Hamlin, in India, the arts of the goldsmith and lapidary have been practiced from an unknown antiquity. That the Egyptians either knew from the remotest ages how to temper steel, or possessed something still better and more perfect than the implement necessary in our days for chiseling, is an alternative from which the archaeologists cannot escape. How else could they have produced such artistic chiseling, or p. 
539. Rob such sculpture as they did? The critics may take their choice of either, according to them, steel tools of the most exquisite temper, or some other means of cutting sienite, granite, and basalt, which, in the latter case, must be added to the long catalogue of lost arts. Professor Albrecht Muller says, we may ascribe the introduction of bronze manufacture into Europe to a great race immigrant from Asia some 6,000 years ago, called Aries or Aryans. Civilization of the East preceded that of the West by many centuries. There are many proofs that a considerable degree of culture existed at its very beginning. Bronze was yet in use, but iron as well. Pottery was not only shaped on the lathe, but burned a good red. Manufactures in glass, gold, and silver, are found for the first time. In lonely mountain places are yet found dross, and the remains of iron furnaces. To be sure, this dross is sometimes ascribed to volcanic action, but it is met with where volcanoes never could have existed. But it is in the process of preparing mummies that the scale of this wonderful people is exemplified in the highest degree. None but those who have made special study of the subject, can estimate the amount of skill, patience, and knowledge exacted for the accomplishment of this indestructible work, which occupied several months. Both chemistry and surgery were called into requisition. The mummies, if left in the dry climate of Egypt, seemed to be practically imperishable, and even when removed after a repose of several thousand years, show no signs of change. The body, says the anonymous writer, was filled with myrrh, cassia, and other gums, and after that, saturated with natron. Then followed the marvelous swathing of the embalmed body, so artistically executed, that professional modern bandages are lost in admiration at its excellency. Says Dr. Granville, there is not a single form of bandage known to modern surgery, of which far better and cleverer examples are not seen in the swathings of the Egyptian mummies. The strips of linen are found without one single joint, extending to 1,000 yards in length. Rossellini, in Kenrick's Ancient Egypt, gives a similar testimony to the wonderful variety and skill with which the bandages have been applied and interlaced. There was not a fracture in the human body that could not be repaired successfully by the sacerdotal physician of those remote days. Who but well remembers the excitement produced some 25 years ago by the discovery of anesthesia? The nitrous oxide gas, sulfuric and chloric ether, chloroform, laughing gas, besides various other combinations of these, were welcomed as so many heavenly blessings to the suffering portion of humanity. Poor Dr. Horace Wells, of Hartford, in 1844, was the discoverer, and Drs. Morton and Jackson, p. 540, reaped the honors and benefits in 1846, as is usual in such cases. The anesthetics were proclaimed the greatest discovery ever made. And, though the famous lithion of Morton and Jackson, a compound of sulfuric ether, the chloroform of Sir James E. Simpson, and the nitrous oxide gas, introduced by Colton, in 1843, and by Dunham and Smith, were occasionally checked by fatal cases, it still did not prevent these gentlemen from being considered public benefactors. The patient successfully put to sleep sometimes awoke no more, what matters that, so long as others were relieved? Physicians assure us that accidents are now but rarely apprehended. Perhaps it is because the beneficent anesthetic agents are so parsimoniously applied as to fail in their effects one half of the time, leaving the sufferer paralyzed for a few seconds in his external movements, but feeling the pain as acutely as ever. On the whole, however, chloroform and laughing gas are beneficent discoveries. But, are they the first anesthetics ever discovered, strictly speaking? Dioscorides speaks of the stone of Memphis, Lapis Memphiticus, and describes it as a small pebble round, polished, and very sparkling. When ground into powder, and applied as an ointment to that part of the body on which the surgeon was about to operate, either with his scalpel or fire, it preserved that part, and only that part from any pain of the operation. In the meantime, it was perfectly harmless to the constitution of the patient, who retained his consciousness throughout, in no way dangerous from its effects, and acted so long as it was kept on the affected part. When taken in a mixture of wine or water, all feeling of suffering was perfectly deadened. Pliny gives also a full description of it. From time immemorial, the Brahmins have had in their possession secrets quite as valuable. The widow, bent on the self-sacrifice of concremation, called Sahamarania, has no dread of suffering the least pain, for the fiercest flames will consume her, without one pang of agony being experienced by her. The holy plants which crown her brow, as she is conducted in ceremony to the funeral pile, 
The sacred root called at the midnight hour on the spot where the Ganges and the Yama mingle their waters, and the process of anointing the body of the self-appointed victim with ghee and sacred oils, after she has bathed in all her clothes and finery, are so many magical anesthetics. Supported by those she is going to part with in body, she walks thrice around her fiery couch, and, after bidding them farewell, is cast on the dead body of her husband, and leaves this world without a single moment of suffering. The semi-fluid, says a missionary writer, an eyewitness of several such. p. 541. Ceremonies the ghee, is poured upon the pile, it is instantly inflamed, and the drugged widow dies quickly of suffocation before the fire reaches her body. No such thing, if the sacred ceremony is only conducted strictly after the prescribed rites. The widows are never drugged in the sense we are accustomed to understand the word. Only precautionary measures are taken against the useless physical martyrdom the atrocious agony of burning. Her mind is as free and clear as ever, and even more so. Firmly believing in the promises of a future life, her whole mind is absorbed in the contemplation of the approaching bliss the beatitude of freedom, which she is about to attain. She generally dies with the smile of heavenly rapture on her countenance, and if someone is to suffer at the hour of retribution, it is not the earnest devotee of her faith, but the crafty Brahmins who know well enough that no such ferocious rite was ever prescribed. As to the victim, after having been consumed, she becomes a sati transcendent purity and is canonized after death. Egypt is the birthplace and the cradle of chemistry. Kenner shows the root of the word to be chemi or chem, which was the name of the country, Psalm CV. 27. The chemistry of color seems to have been thoroughly well known in that country. Facts are facts. Where among our painters are we to search for the artists who can decorate our walls with imperishable colors? Ages after our pygmy buildings will have crumbled into dust, and the cities enclosing them will themselves have become shapeless heaps of brick and mortar, with forgotten names long after that will the halls of Karnak and Luxor, El Uxor, be still standing, and the gorgeous mural paintings of the latter will doubtless be as bright and vivid four thousand years hence, as they were four thousand years ago, and are today. Embalming and fresco painting, says our author, was not a chance discovery with the Egyptians, but brought out from definitions and maxims like any induction of Faraday. Our modern Italians boast of their Etruscan vases and paintings, the p. 542. Decorative borders found on Greek vases provoke the admiration of the lovers of antiquity, and are ascribed to the Greeks, while in fact they were but copies from the Egyptian vases. Their figures can be found any day on the walls of a tomb of the age of Ammonifi, a period at which Greece was not even in existence. Where, in our age, can we point to anything comparable to the rock temples of Ipsambul and Lower Nubia? There may be seen sitting figures seventy feet high, carved out of the living rock. The torso of the statue of Ramesses II, at Thebes, measures sixty feet around the shoulders, and elsewhere in proportion. Beside such titanic sculpture our own seems that of pygmies. Iron was known to the Egyptians at least long before the construction of the first pyramid, which is over twenty thousand years ago, according to Bunsen. The proof of this had remained hidden for many thousands of years in the pyramid of Cheops, until Colonel Howard Weiss found it in the shape of a piece of iron, in one of the joints, where it had evidently been placed at the time this pyramid was first built. Egyptologists adduce many indications that the ancients were perfectly well acquainted with metallurgy in prehistoric times. To this day we can find at Sinai large heaps of scoriae, produced by smelting. Metallurgy and chemistry, as practiced in those days, were known as alchemy, and were at the bottom of prehistoric magic. Moreover, Moses proved his knowledge of alchemical chemistry by pulverizing the golden calf, and strewing the powder upon the water. If now we turn to navigation, we will find ourselves able to prove, on good authorities, that Necho too fitted out a fleet on the Red Sea and dispatched it for exploration. The fleet was absent above two years and instead of returning through the Straits of Babel Mandeb, as was wont, sailed back through the Straits of Gibraltar. Herodotus was not at all swift to concede to the Egyptians a maritime achievement so vast as this. They had, he says, been spreading the report that returning homewards, they had the sunrise on their right hands, a thing which to me is incredible. And yet, remarks the author of the heretofore mentioned article, this incredible assertion is now proved incontestable, as may well be understood by any one who has doubled the Cape of Good Hope. Thus it is proved that the most ancient of these people performed a feat which was attributed to Columbus many ages later. They say they anchored twice on their way, sowed corn, reaped it and, sailing away, 
steered in triumph through the pillars of Hercules and eastward along the Mediterranean. There was a people, he adds. p. 543. Much more deserving of the term veteres than the Romans and Greeks. The Greeks, young in their knowledge, sounded a trumpet before these and called upon all the world to admire their ability. Old Egypt, grown gray in her wisdom, was so secure of her requirements that she did not invite admiration and cared no more for the opinion of the flippant Greek than we do today for that of a Fiji islander. O oh, Solon, Solon, said the oldest Egyptian priest to that sage. You Greeks are ever childish, having no ancient opinion, no discipline of any long standing. And very much surprised, indeed, was the great Solon, when he was told by the priests of Egypt that so many gods and goddesses of the Grecian pantheon were but the disguised gods of Egypt. Truly spoke Sonaris, all these things came to us from Chaldea to Egypt, and from thence were derived to the Greeks. Sir David Brewster gives a glowing description of several automata, and the 18th century takes pride in that masterpiece of mechanical art, the flute player of Vokensone. The little we can glean of positive information on that subject, from ancient writers, warrants the belief that the learned mechanicians in the days of Archimedes, and some of them much anterior to the great Syracusan, were in no wise more ignorant or less ingenious than our modern inventors. Archidus, a native of Tarentum, in Italy, the instructor of Plato, a philosopher distinguished for his mathematical achievements and wonderful discoveries in practical mechanics, constructed a wooden dove. It must have been an extraordinarily ingenious mechanism, as it flew, fluttered its wings, and sustained itself for a considerable time in the air. This skillful man, who lived 400 years B.C., invented besides the wooden dove, the screw, the crane, and various hydraulic machines. Egypt pressed her own grapes and made wine. Nothing remarkable in that, so far, but she brewed her own beer, and in great quantity our Egyptologist goes on to say. The Evers manuscript proves now, beyond doubt, that the Egyptians used beer 2000 years BC their beer must have been strong and excellent like everything they did. Glass was manufactured in all its varieties. In many of the Egyptian sculptures we find scenes of glass blowing in bottles. Occasionally, during archaeological researches, glasses and glassware are found, and very beautiful they seem to have been. Sir Gardner Wilkinson says that the Egyptians cut, ground, and engraved glass, and possessed the art of introducing gold between the two surfaces of the substance. They imitated with glass, pearls, emeralds, and all the precious stones to a great perfection. p. 544. Likewise, the most ancient Egyptians cultivated the musical arts, and understood well the effect of musical harmony and its influence on the human spirit. We can find on the oldest sculptures and carving scenes in which musicians play on various instruments. Music was used in the healing department of the temples for the cure of nervous disorders. We discover on many monuments men playing in bands in concert, the leader beating time by clapping his hands. Thus far we can prove that they understood the laws of harmony. They had their sacred music, domestic and military. The lyre, harp, and flute were used for the sacred concerts. For festive occasions they had the guitar, the single and double pipes, and castanets, for troops, and during military service. They had trumpets, tambourines, drums, and cymbals. Various kinds of harps were invented by them, such as the lyre, sambuk, asher, some of these had upward of twenty strings. The superiority of the Egyptian lyre over the Grecian is an admitted fact. The material out of which were made such instruments was often of very costly and rare wood, and they were beautifully carved. They imported it sometimes from very distant countries, some were painted, inlaid with mother of pearl and ornamented with colored leather. They used catgut for strings as we do. Pythagoras learned music in Egypt and made a regular science of it in Italy. But the Egyptians were generally considered in antiquity as the best music teachers in Greece. They understood thoroughly well how to extract harmonious sounds out of an instrument by adding strings to it, as well as the multiplication of notes by shortening the strings upon its neck, which knowledge shows a great progress in the musical art. Speaking of harps, in a tomb at Thebes, Bruce remarks that, they overturn all the accounts hitherto given of the earliest state of music and musical instruments in the East, and are altogether, in their form, ornaments and compass, an incontestable proof, stronger than a thousand Greek quotations, that geometry, drawing, mechanics, and music were at the greatest perfection when these instruments were made, and that the period from which we date the invention of these arts was only the beginning of the era of their restoration. On the walls of the palace of Amenuf II.
At Thebes, the king is represented as playing chess with the queen. This monarch reigned long before the Trojan War. In India the game is known to have been played at least 5,000 years ago. As to their knowledge in medicine, now that one of the lost books of Hermes has been found and translated by Ebers, the Egyptians can speak for themselves. That they understood about the circulation of the blood, appears certain from the healing manipulations of the priests, who knew how to draw blood downward, stop its circulation for a while, etc. A. P. 545. More careful study of their bar reliefs representing scenes taking place in the healing hall of various temples will easily demonstrate it. They had their dentists and oculists, and no doctor was allowed to practice more than one specialty, which certainly warrants the belief that they lost fewer patients in those days than our physicians do now. It is also asserted by some authorities that the Egyptians were the first people in the world who introduced trial by jury, although we doubt this ourselves. But the Egyptians were not the only people of remote epochs whose achievements placed them in so commanding a position before the view of posterity. Besides others whose history is at present shut in behind the mist of antiquity such as the prehistoric races of the two Americas, of Crete, of the Trogue, of the Lacustrians, of the submerged continent of the fabled Atlantis, now classed with myths the deeds of the Phoenicians stamp them with almost the character of demigods. The writer in the National Quarterly Review, previously quoted, says that the Phoenicians were the earliest navigators of the world, founded most of the colonies of the Mediterranean, and voyaged to whatever other regions were inhabited. They visited the Arctic regions, whence they brought accounts of eternal days without a night, which Homer has preserved for us in the Odyssey. From the British Isles they imported tin into Africa, and Spain was a favorite site for their colonies. The description of Charybdis so completely answers to the males from that, as this writer says, it is difficult to imagine it to have had any other prototype. Their explorations, it seems, extended in every direction, their sails whitening the Indian Ocean, as well as the Norwegian fjords. Different writers have accorded to them the settlement of remote localities, while the entire southern coast of the Mediterranean was occupied by their cities. A large portion of the African territory is asserted to have been peopled by the races expelled by Joshua and the children of Israel. At the time when Procopius wrote, Column stood in Mauritania Tingitana, which bore the inscription, in Phoenician characters, We are those who fled before the brigand Joshua, the son of Nun or Nave. Some suppose these hardy navigators of Arctic and Antarctic waters have been the progenitors of the races which built the temples and palaces of Palenque and Uxmal, of Copan and Rica. Brasser de Borbord gives us much information about the manners and customs, architecture and arts, and especially of the magic and magicians of the ancient Mexicans. He tells us that Vodin, their fabulous hero and the greatest, p. 546, of their magicians, returning from a long voyage, visited King Solomon at the time of the building of the temple. This Vodin appears to be identical with the dreaded Quetzalcoatl who appears in all the Mexican legends, and curiously enough these legends bear a striking resemblance, insomuch as they relate to the voyages and exploits of the Hittim, with the Hebrew Bible accounts of the Hivites, the descendants of Heth, son of Chanan. The record tells us that Vodin furnished to Solomon the most valuable particulars as to the men, animals, and plants, the gold and precious woods of the Occident, but refused point-blank to afford any clue to the route he sailed, or the manner of reaching the mysterious continent. Solomon himself gives an account of this interview in his History of the Wonders of the Universe, the chief Vodin figuring under the allegory of the navigating serpent. Stevens indulging in the anticipation that a key surer than that of the Rosetta Stone will be discovered, by which the American hieroglyphs may be read, says that the descendants of the caciques and the Aztec subjects are believed to survive still in the inaccessible fastnesses of the cordularous wildernesses, which have never yet been penetrated by white man, living as their fathers did, erecting the same buildings, with ornaments of sculpture and plastered, large courts, and lofty towers with high ranges of steps and still carving on tablets of stone the same mysterious hieroglyphics. He adds, I turn to that vast and unknown region, untraversed by a single road, wherein fancy pictures that mysterious city seen from the topmost range of the cordialists of unconquered, unvisited, and unsought aboriginal inhabitants. Apart from the fact that this mysterious city has been seen from a great distance by daring travelers, there is no intrinsic improbability of its existence for who can tell what became of the primitive people who fled before the rapacious brigands of Cortez and Pizarro? Dr. Chuddy, in his work on Peru, tells us of an Indian legend that a train of ten thousand lamas, laden with gold to complete the unfortunate Inca's ransom, 
was arrested in the Andes by the tidings of his death, and the enormous treasure was so effectually concealed that not a trace of it has ever been found. He, as well as Prescott and other writers, informs us that the Indians to this day preserve their ancient traditions in sacerdotal caste, and obey implicitly the orders of rulers chosen among themselves, while at the same time nominally Catholics and actually subject to the Peruvian authorities. Magical ceremonies practiced by their forefathers still prevail among them, and magical phenomena occur. So persistent are they in their loyalty to the past, that it seems impossible. p. 547. But that they should be in relations with some central source of authority which constantly supports and strengthens their faith, keeping it alive. May it not be that the sources of this undying faith lie in this mysterious city, with which they are in secret communication? Or must we think that all of the above is again but a curious coincidence? The story of this mysterious city was told to Stevens by a Spanish padre, in 1838-9. The priest swore to him that he had seen it with his own eyes, and gave Stevens the following details, which the traveler firmly believed to be true. The padre of the little village near the ruins of Santa Cruz del Quiche, had heard of the unknown city at the village of Chajal. He was then young, and climbed with much labor to the naked summit of the topmost ridge of the Sierra of the Cordillera. When arrived at a height of ten or twelve thousand feet, he looked over an immense plain extending the Yucatan and the Gulf of Mexico, and saw, at a great distance, a large city spread over a great space, and with turrets white and glittering in the sun. Tradition says that no white man has ever reached this city, that the inhabitants speak the Maya language, know that strangers have conquered their whole land, and murder any white man who attempts to enter their territory. They have no coin, no horses, cattle, mules, or other domestic animals except fowls and the cocks they keep underground to prevent their crowing being heard. Nearly the same was given us personally about twenty years ago, by an old native priest, whom we met in Peru, and with whom we happened to have business relations. He had passed all his life vainly trying to conceal his hatred toward the conqueror's brigands, he termed them, and, as he confessed, kept friends with them in the Catholic religion for the sake of his people, but he was as truly a sun-worshipper in his heart as ever he was. He had traveled in his capacity of a converted native missionary, and had been at Santa Cruz, and, as he solemnly affirmed, had been also to see some of his people by a subterranean passage leading into the mysterious city. We believe his account, for a man who is about to die, will rarely stop to invent idle stories, and this one we have found corroborated in Stephen's travels. Besides, we know of two other cities utterly unknown to European travelers, not that the inhabitants particularly desire to hide themselves, for people from Buddhistic countries come occasionally to visit them. But their towns are not set down on the European or Asiatic maps, and, on account of the two zealous and enterprising Christian missionaries, and perhaps for more mysterious reasons of their own, the few natives of other countries who are aware of the existence of these two cities never mention them. Nature has provided strange nooks and hiding places for her favorites, and p. 548. Unfortunately it is but far away from so-called civilized countries that man is free to worship the deity in the way that his fathers did. Even the erudite and sober Max Muller is somehow unable to get rid of coincidences. To him they come in the shape of the most unexpected discoveries. These Mexicans, for instance, whose obscure origin, according to the laws of probability, has no connection with the Aryans of India, nevertheless, like the Hindus, represent an eclipse of the moon as the moon being devoured by a dragon. And though Professor Muller admits that an historical intercourse between the two people was suspected by Alexander von Humboldt, and he himself considers it possible, still the occurrence of such a fact he adds, need not be the result of any historical intercourse. As we have stated above, the origin of the Aborigines of America is a very vexed question for those interested in tracing out the affiliation and migrations of peoples. Notwithstanding the labor of Brasser de Bourbourg, and his elaborate translation of the famous Pope Al Vu, alleged to be written by Ishli Shochidol, after weighing its contents, the antiquarian remains as much in the dark as ever. We have read the Pope Al Vu in its original translation, and the review of the same by Max Muller, and out of the former find shining a light of such brightness, that it is no wonder that the matter of fact, skeptical scientists should be blinded by it. But so far as an author can be judged by his writings, Professor Max Muller is no unfair skeptic, and, Moreover, very little of importance escapes his attention. How is it then that a man of such immense and rare erudition, accustomed as he is to embrace at one eagle glance the traditions, religious customs, 
and superstitions of a people, detecting the slightest similarity, and taking in the smallest details, failed to give any importance or perhaps even suspect what the humble author of the present volume, who has neither scientific training nor erudition, to any extent, apprehended at first view. Fallacious and unwarranted as to many may seem this remark, it appears to us that science loses more than she gains by neglecting the ancient and even medieval esoteric literature, or rather what remains of it. To one who devotes himself to such study many a coincidence is transformed into a natural result of demonstrable antecedent causes. We think we can see how it is that Professor Muller confesses that now and then, one imagines one sees certain periods and landmarks, but in the next page all is chaos again. May it not be barely possible that this chaos is intensified by the fact that most of the scientists, directing the whole of their attention to history, skip that which they treat as vague, contradictory. P. 549. Miraculous? Absurd. Notwithstanding the feeling that there was a groundwork of noble conceptions which has been covered and distorted by an aftergrowth of fantastic nonsense, Professor Muller cannot help comparing this nonsense to the tales of the Arabian Nights. Far be from us the ridiculous pretension of criticizing a scientist so worthy of admiration for his learning as Max Muller. But we cannot help saying that even among the fantastic nonsense of the Arabian Nights entertainments anything would be worthy of attention, if it should help toward the evolving of some historical truth. Homer's Odyssey surpasses in fantastic nonsense all the tales of the Arabian Nights combined, and notwithstanding that, many of his myths are now proved to be something else besides the creation of the old poet's fancy. The Lystrigonians, who devoured the companions of Ulysses, are traced to the huge cannibal race, set in primitive days to inhabit the caves of Norway. Geology verified through her discovery some of the assertions of Homer, supposed for so many ages to have been but poetical hallucinations. The perpetual daylight enjoyed by this race of Lystrigonians indicates that they were inhabitants of the North Cape, where, during the whole summer, there is perpetual daylight. The Norwegian fjords are perfectly described by Homer in his Odyssey, x. 110, and the gigantic stature of the Lystrigonians is demonstrated by human bones of unusual size found in caves situated near this region, in which the geologists supposed to have belonged to a race extinct long before the Aryan immigration. Charybdis, as we have seen, has been recognized in the maelstrom, and the wandering rocks in the enormous icebergs of the Arctic seas. If the consecutive attempts at the creation of man described in the Quiche Cosmogony suggests no comparison with some apocrypha, with the Jewish sacred books, and the Kabbalistic theories of creation, it is indeed strange. Even the Book of Jasher, condemned as a gross forgery of the 12th century, may furnish more than one clue to trace a relation between the population of Yor of the Costines, where Magism flourished before the days of Abraham, and those of Central and North America. The divine beings, brought down to the level of human nature, perform no feats or tricks more strange or incredible than the miraculous performances of Moses and of Pharaoh's magicians, while many of these are exactly similar in their nature. And when, moreover, in addition to this latter fact, we find so great a resemblance between certain Kabbalistic terms common to both hemispheres, there must be something else than mere accident to account for the circumstance. Many. P. 550. Of such feats have clearly a common parentage. The story of the two brothers of Central America, who, before starting on their journey to Shabalba, plan each a cane in the middle of their grandmother's house, that she may know by its flourishing or withering whether they are alive or dead, finds its analogy in the beliefs of many other countries. In the popular tales and traditions, by Sakharov, Russia, one can find a similar narrative, and trace this belief in various other legends. And yet these fairy tales were current in Russia many centuries before America was discovered. In recognizing in the gods of Stonehenge the divinities of Delphus and Babylon, one need feel little surprised. Bell and the dragon, Apollo, and Python, Osiris and Typhon, are all one under many names, and have traveled far and wide. The both Al of Ireland points directly to its first parent, the Battlos of the Greeks and the Bethel of Chanan. History, says H. The La Villemarque, which took no notes at those distant ages, complete ignorance, but the science of languages affirms. Philology, with a daily increasing probability, has again linked together the chain hardly broken between the Orient and the Occident. No more remarkable is the discovery of a like resemblance between the Oriental myths and ancient Russian tales and traditions, for it is entirely natural to look for a similarity between the beliefs of the Semitic and Aryan families. But when we discover an almost perfect identity between the character of Tsarevna Militrisa, 
with the moon in her forehead, who is in constant danger of being devoured by Zmei Gornich, the serpent or dragon, who plays such a prominent part in all popular Russian tales, and similar characters in the Mexican legends extending to the minutest details we may well pause and ask ourselves whether there be not here more than a simple coincidence. This tradition of the dragon and the sun occasionally replaced by the moon has awakened echoes in the remotest parts of the world. It may be accounted for with perfect readiness by the once universal heliolatrous religion. There was a time when Asia, Europe, Africa, and America were covered with the temples sacred to the sun and the dragons. The priests assumed the names of their deities, and thus the tradition of these spread like a network all over the globe, Bell and the dragon being uniformly coupled together, and the priests of the Ephite religion as uniformly assuming the name of his god. But still. p. 551. If the original conception is natural and intelligible, and its occurrence need not be the result of any historical intercourse, as Professor Muller tells us, the details are so strikingly similar that we cannot feel satisfied that the riddle is entirely solved. The origin of this universal symbolical worship being concealed in the night of time, we would have far more chance to arrive at the truth by tracing these traditions to their very source. And where is this source? Kircher places the origin of the Ephite and Heliolatrus worship, the shape of conical monuments in the obelisk, with the Egyptian Hermes Trismegistus. Where, then, except in Hermetic books, are we to seek for the desired information? Is it likely that modern authors can know more, or as much, of ancient myths and cults as the men who taught them to their contemporaries? Clearly two things are necessary, first, to find the missing books of Hermes, and second, the key by which to understand them, for reading is not sufficient. Failing in this, our savants are abandoned to unfruitful speculations, as for a like reason geographers waste their energies in a vain quest of the sources of the Nile. Truly the land of Egypt is another abode of mystery. Without stopping to discuss whether Hermes was the prince of post-Diluvian magic, as De Musos calls him, or the antediluvian, which is much more likely, one thing is certain, the authenticity, reliability, and usefulness of the books of Hermes or rather of what remains of the 36 works attributed to the Egyptian magician are fully recognized by Champollion, Jr., and corroborated by Champollion Fijac, who mentions it. Now, if by carefully looking over the Kabbalistical works, which are all derived from that universal storehouse of esoteric knowledge, we find the facsimiles of many so-called miracles wrought by magical art, equally reproduced by the quiches, and if even in the fragments left of the original Popol Vuh, there is sufficient evidence that the religious customs of the Mexicans, Peruvians, and other American races are nearly identical with those of the ancient Phoenicians, Babylonians, and Egyptians, and if, moreover, we discover that many of their religious terms have etymologically the same origin, how are we to avoid believing that they are the descendants of those whose forefathers fled before the brigand, Joshua, the son of Nun? Nunez de la Vega says that Nin, or Emos, of the Tsindales, was the Ninus of the Babylonians. It is possible that, so far, it may be a coincidence, as the identification of one with the other rests but upon a poor argument. But it is known, adds de Borborg, that this prince, and according to p. 552, others, his father, Bel, or Baal, receive, like the Nin of the Tsindales the homages of his subjects under the shape of a serpent. The latter assertion, besides being fantastic, is nowhere corroborated in the Babylonian records. It is very true that the Phoenicians represented the sun under the image of a dragon, but so did all the other people who symbolized their sun gods. Belus, the first king of the Assyrian dynasty was, according to Castor, and Eusebius who quotes him, deified, i.e., he was ranked among the gods after his death only. Thus, neither himself nor his son, Ninus, or Nin, could have received their subjects under the shape of a serpent, whatever the Tsindales did. Bel, according to Christians, is Baal, and Baal is the devil, since the Bible prophets began so designating every deity of their neighbors, therefore Belus, Ninus, and the Mexican men are serpents and devils, and, as the devil, or father of evil, is one under many forms, therefore, under whatever name the serpent appears, it is the devil. Strange logic. Why not say that Ninus the Assyrian, represented as husband and victim of the ambitious Semiramis, was high priest as well as king of his country? That as such he wore on his tiara the sacred emblems of the dragon and the sun? Moreover, as the priest generally assumed the name of his god, Ninus was said to receive his subject as the representative of the serpent god. 
The idea is preeminently Roman Catholic and amounts to very little, as all their inventions do. If Nunez de la Vega was so anxious to establish an affiliation between the Mexicans and the biblical sun and serpent worshippers, why did he not show another and a better similarity between them without tracing in the Ninevites and the Tsundales the hoof and horn of the Christian devil? And to begin with, he might have pointed to the Chronicles of Fuentes, of the Kingdom of Guatemala, and to the manuscript of Don Juan Torres, the grandson of the last king of the Quiches. This document, which is said to have been in the possession of the lieutenant general appointed by Pedro de Alvarado, states that the Toltecas themselves descended from the House of Israel, who were released by Moses, and who, after crossing the Red Sea, fell into idolatry. After that, having separated themselves from their companions, and under the guidance of a chief named Tanub, they set out wandering, and from one continent to another they came to a place named the Seven Caverns, in the Kingdom of Mexico, where they founded the famous town of Tula, etc. If this statement has never obtained more credit than it has, it is simply due to the fact that it passed through the hands of Father Francis Vasquez, historian of the Order of San Francis, and this circumstance. p. 553. To use the expression employed by De Musos in connection with the work of the poor, on fracked Abbe Huck, is not calculated to strengthen our confidence. But there is another point as important, if not more so, as it seems to have escaped falsification by the zealous Catholic padres, and rests chiefly on Indian tradition. A famous Toltecan king, whose name is mixed up in the weird legends of Yudatlan, the ruined capital of the great Indian kingdom, bore the biblical appellation of Balaam Akan, the first name being preeminently Chaldean, and reminding one immediately of Balaam and his human voice as. Besides the statement of Lord Kingsborough, who found such a striking similarity between the language of the Aztecs, the mother tongue, and the Hebrew, many of the figures on the bar leaves of Palenque and idols in Terracotta, exhumed in Santa Cruz del Quiche, have on their heads bandlets with a square protuberance on them, in front of the forehead very similar to the phylacteries worn by the Hebrew Pharisees of old, while at prayers, and even by devotees of the present day, particularly the Jews of Poland and Russia. But as this may be but a fancy of ours, after all, we will not insist on the details. Upon the testimony of the ancients, corroborated by modern discoveries, we know that there were numerous catacombs in Egypt and Chaldea, some of them of a very vast extent. The most renowned of them were the subterranean crypts of Thebes and Memphis. The former, beginning on the western side of the Nile, extended toward the Libyan desert, and were known as the Serpent's Catacombs, or Passages. It was there that were performed the sacred mysteries of the Kuklo's Annex, the unavoidable cycle, more generally known as the Circle of Necessity, the inexorable doom imposed upon every soul after the bodily death, and when it had been judged in the Amentian region. In the Borborg's book, Boten, the Mexican demigod, in narrating his expedition, describes a subterranean passage, which ran underground, and terminated at the root of the heavens, adding that this passage was a snake's hole, an agujero de culebra, and that he was admitted to it because he was himself a son of the snakes, or a serpent. This is, indeed, very suggestive, for his description of the snake's hole is that of the ancient Egyptian crypt, as above mentioned. The higher fans, moreover, of Egypt, as of Babylon, generally styled themselves the sons of the serpent god or sons of the dragon, not because as they Musas would have his readers believe they were the progeny of Satan Incubus, the old serpent of Eden, but because, in the mysteries, the serpent was the symbol of wisdom and immortality. p. 554. The Assyrian priest bore always the name of his god, says Movers. The Druids of the Celto-Britannic regions also called themselves snakes. I am a serpent, I am a Druid, they exclaimed. The Egyptian Karnak is twin brother to the Karnak of Britannia, the latter Karnak meaning the serpent's mount. The Draconcha once covered the surface of the globe, and these temples were sacred to the dragon, only because it was the symbol of the sun, which, in its turn, was the symbol of the highest god the Phoenician Elon or Elian, whom Abraham recognized as El Elian. Besides the surname of serpents, they were called the builders, the architects, for the immense grandeur of their temples and monuments was such that even now the pulverized remains of them frighten the mathematical calculations of our modern engineers, says Taliesin. De Borborg hands that the chiefs of the name of Vodun, the Quetzalcoatl, or serpent deity of the Mexicans, are the descendants of Ham and Canaan. I am Hivim, they say. Being a Hivim, I am of the great race of the dragon, snake. I am a snake myself, for I am a Hivim. 
and de musos, rejoicing because he believes himself fairly on the serpents, or rather, devil's trail, hurries to explain, according to the most learned commentators of our sacred books, the Chivim or Hivim, or Hevites, descend from Heth, son of Canaan, son of Ham, the accursed. But modern research has demonstrated, on unimpeachable evidence, that the whole genealogical table of the tenth chapter of Genesis refers to imaginary heroes, and that the closing verses of the ninth are little better than a bit of Chaldean allegory of Sisutherus and the mythical flood, compiled and arranged to fit the Nokian frame. But, suppose the descendants of these Canaanites, the accursed, were to resent for once the unmerited outrage? It would be an easy matter for them to reverse the tables, in answer to this flame, based on a fable, by fact proved by archaeologists and symbologists namely, that Seth, Adam's third son, and the forefather of all Israel, the ancestor of Noah, and the progenitor of the chosen people, is but Hermes, the god of wisdom, called also Thoth, Tat, Seth, Set, and Satan, and that he was. Furthermore, when viewed under his bad aspect, Typhon, the Egyptian Satan, who was also Set. For the Jewish people, whose well-educated men, no more than Philo, or Josephus, the historian, regard their mosaic books, p. 555. As otherwise in an allegory, such a discovery amounts to but little. But for Christians, who, like de Musso's, very unwisely accept the Bible narratives as literal history, the case stands very different. As far as affiliation goes, we agree with this pious writer, and we feel every day as certain that some of the peoples of Central America will be traced back to the Phoenicians and the Mosaic Israelites, as we do that the latter will be proved to have as persistently stuck to the same idolatry if idolatry there is of the sun and serpent worship, as the Mexicans. There is evidence biblical evidence that two of Jacob's sons, Levi and Dan, as well as Judah, married Canaanite women, and followed the worship of their wives. Of course, every Christian will protest, but the proof may be found even in the translated Bible, pruned as it now stands. The dying Jacob thus describes his sons, Dan, says he, shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path, that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, zero Lord. Of Simeon and Levi, the patriarch, or Israel, remarks that they, or brethren, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come out thou unto their secret, unto their assembly. Now, in the original, the words their secret, read their sod. And sod was the name for the great mysteries of Baal, Adonis, and Bacchus who were all sun gods and had serpents for symbols. The Kabbalists explained the allegory of the fiery serpents by saying, that this was the name given to the tribe of Levi, to all the Levites in short, and that Moses was the chief of the Sidalis. And here is the moment to prove our statements. Moses is mentioned by several old historians as an Egyptian priest, Manithou says he was a hierophant of Hierapolis, and a priest of the sun god Osiris, and that his name was Osarsif. Those moderns, who accept it as a fact that he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, must also submit to the right interpretation of the word wisdom, which was throughout the world known as a synonym of initiation. p. 556. Into the secret mysteries of the Magi. Did the idea never strike the reader of the Bible, that an alien born and brought up in a foreign country could not and would not possibly have been admitted we will not say to the final initiation, the grandest mystery of all, but even to share the knowledge of the minor priesthood, those who belong to the lesser mysteries? In Genesis 43, 32, we read, that no Egyptian could seed himself to eat bread with the brothers of Joseph, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. But that the Egyptians ate with him, Joseph, by themselves. The above proves two things, one, that Joseph, whatever he was in his heart, had, in appearance at least, changed his religion married the daughter of a priest of the idolatrous nation, and become himself an Egyptian, otherwise, the natives would not have eaten bread with him. And two, that subsequently Moses, if not an Egyptian by birth, became one through being admitted into the priesthood, and thus was a sadeo. As an induction, the narrative of the brazen serpent, the caduceus of Mercury or Asclepius, the son of the sun god Apollo Python, becomes logical and natural. We must bear in mind that Pharaoh's daughter, who saved Moses and adopted him, is called by Josephus Thermothes, and the latter, according to Wilkinson, is the name of the ass sacred to Isis. Moreover, Moses is said to descend from the tribe of Levi. We will explain the Kabbalistic ideas as to the books of Moses and the great prophet himself more fully in volume 2. 
If Brasseur de Bourbourg and the Chevalier de Musos had so much at heart to trace the identity of the Mexicans with the Canaanites, they might have found far better and weightier proofs than by showing both the accursed descendants of Ham. For instance, they might have pointed to the Nargal, the Chaldean and Assyrian chief of the Magi, Rab Mag, and the Nagal, the chief sorcerer of the Mexican Indians. Both derive their names from Nergal Sarizer, the Assyrian god, and both have the same faculties, or powers to have an attendant demon with whom they identify themselves completely. The Chaldean and Assyrian Nargal kept his demon, in the shape of some animal considered sacred, inside the temple, the Indian Nagal keeps his wherever he can in the neighboring lake, or wood, or in the house, under the shape of a household animal. We find the Catholic world, newspaper, in a recent number, bitterly complaining that the old pagan element of the aboriginal inhabitants of America does not seem to be utterly dead in the United States. Even p. 557. Where tribes have been for long years under the care of Christian teachers, heathen rites are practiced in secret, and crypto-paganism, or Nogalism, flourishes now, as in the days of Montezuma. It says, Nogalism and voodoo worship as it calls these two strange sects are direct devil worship. A report addressed to the Cortes in 1812, by Don Pedro Bachi Sapino, says, All the Pueblos have their artufas so the natives call subterranean rooms with only a single door, where they assemble to perform their feasts and hold meetings. These are impenetrable temples, and the doors are always closed on the Spaniards. All these pueblos, in spite of the sway which religion has had over them, cannot forget a part of the beliefs which have been transmitted to them, and which they are careful to transmit to their descendants. Hence come the adoration they render the sun and moon, and other heavenly bodies, the respect they entertain for fire, etc. The pueblo chiefs seem to be at the same time priests, they perform very simple rites, by which the power of the sun and of Montezuma is recognized, as well as the power, according to some accounts, of the great snake, to whom, by order of Montezuma, they are to look for life. They also officiate in certain ceremonies with which they pray for rain. There are painted representations of the great snake, together with that of a misshapen, red-haired man, declared to stand for Montezuma. Of this last there was also, in the year 1845, in the Pueblo of Laguna, a rude effigy or idol, intended, apparently, to represent only the head of the deity. The perfect identity of the rites, ceremonies, traditions, and even the names of the deities, among the Mexicans and ancient Babylonians and Egyptians, are sufficient proof of South America being peopled by a colony which mysteriously found its way across the Atlantic. When? At what period? History is silent on that point, but those who consider that there is no tradition, sanctified by ages, without a certain sediment of truth at the bottom of it, believe in the Atlantis legend. There are, scattered throughout the world, a handful of thoughtful and solitary students, who pass their lives in obscurity, far from the rumors of the world, studying the great problems of the physical and spiritual universes. They have their secret records in which are preserved the fruits of the scholastic labors of the long line of recluses whose successors they are. The knowledge of their early ancestors, the sages of India, Babylonia, Nineveh, and the imperial Thebes, the legends and traditions commented upon by the masters of Solon, Pythagoras, and Plato, and the p. 558. Marble halls of Heliopolis and say, traditions which, in their days, already seemed to hardly glimmer from behind the foggy curtain of the past, all this, and much more, is recorded on indestructible parchment, and pass with jealous care from one adept to another. These men believe the story of the Atlantis to be no fable, but maintain that at different epochs of the past huge islands, and even continents, existed where now there is but a wild waste of waters. In those submerged temples and libraries the archaeologists would find, could he but explore them, the materials for filling all the gaps that now exist in what we imagine is history. They say that at a remote epoch a traveler could traverse what is now the Atlantic Ocean, almost the entire distance by land, crossing in boats from one island to another, where narrow straits then existed. Our suspicion as to the relationship of the cis-Atlantic and transatlantic races is strengthened upon reading about the wonders wrought by Quetzalcoatl, the Mexican magician. His wand must be closely related to the traditional sapphire stick of Moses, the stick which bloomed in the garden of Ragal Jethro, his father-in-law, and upon which was engraved the ineffable name. The four men described as the real four ancestors of the human race, who were neither begotten by the gods, nor born of woman, but whose creation was a wonder wrought by the Creator 
and who were made after three attempts at manufacturing men had failed, equally present some striking points of similarity with the esoteric explanations of the Hermetists. They also undeniably recall the four sons of God of the Egyptian Theogony. Moreover, as any one may infer, the resemblance of this myth to the narrative related in Genesis will be apparent to even a superficial observer. These four ancestors could reason and speak, their sight was unlimited, and they knew all things at once. When they had rendered thanks to their Creator for their existence, the gods were frightened, and they breathed a cloud over the eyes of men that they might see a certain distance only, and not be like the gods themselves. This bears directly upon the sentence in Genesis, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, etc. Then, again, while they were asleep God gave them wives, etc. p. 559. We disclaim the least intention to disrespectfully suggest ideas to those who are so wise as to need no hint. But we must bear in mind that authentic treatises upon ancient magic of the Chaldean and Egyptian lore are not scattered about in public libraries, and at auction sales. That such exists is nevertheless a fact for many students of the arcane philosophy. Is it not of the greatest importance for every antiquarian to be acquainted at least superficially with their contents? The four ancestors of the race, adds Max Muller, seem to have had a long life, and when at last they came to die, they disappeared in a mysterious manner, and left to their sons what is called the hidden majesty, which was never to be opened by human hands. What it was we do not know. If there is no relationship between this hidden majesty and the hidden glory of the Chaldean Kabbalah, which we are told was left behind him by Enoch when he was translated in such a mysterious way, then we must discredit all circumstantial evidence. But is it not barely possible that these four ancestors of the Quiche race typify in their esoteric sense the four successive progenitors of men, mentioned in Genesis I, II, and Vi? In the first chapter, the first man is bisexual male and female created he them and answers to the hermaphrodite deities of the subsequent mythologies, the second, Adam, made out of the dust of the ground and unisexual and answering to the sons of God of chapter 6, the third, the giants, or Nephilim, who are only hinted at in the Bible but fully explained elsewhere, the fourth, the parents of men whose daughters were fair. Taking the admitted facts that the Mexicans had their magicians from the remote periods, that the same remark applies to all the ancient religions of the world, that a strong resemblance prevails not only in the forms of their ceremonial worship, but also in the very names used to designate certain magical implements, and finally that all other clues, in accordance with scientific deductions, have failed, some because swallowed up in the bottomless pit of coincidences. Why should we not turn to the great authorities upon magic, and see whether, under this aftergrowth of fantastic nonsense, there may not be a deep substratum of truth? Here we are not willing to be misunderstood. We do not send the scientists to the Kabbalah and the Hermetic books to study magic, but to the authorities on magic to discover materials for history and science. We have no idea of incurring the wrathful denunciations of the academicians, by an indiscretion like that of poor de Musso's, when he tried to force them to read his demonological memoir and investigate the devil. The history of Bernal Diaz de Castilla, a follower of Cortes, gives us some idea of the extraordinary refinement and intelligence of the p. 560 people whom they conquered, but the descriptions are too long to be inserted here. Suffice it to say, that the Aztecs appeared in more than one way to have resembled the ancient Egyptians in civilization and refinement. Among both peoples magic or the arcane natural philosophy was cultivated to the highest degree. Add to this that Greece, the later cradle of the arts and sciences, and India, cradle of religions, were and are still devoted to its study and practice and who shall venture to discredit its dignity as a study, and its profundity as a science? There never was, nor can there be more than one universal religion, for there can be but one truth concerning God. Like an immense chain whose upper end, the Alpha, remains invisibly emanating from a deity in statue of Scandita with every primitive theology it encircles our globe in every direction, it leaves not even the darkest corner unvisited, before the other end, the Omega, turns back on its way to be again received where it first emanated. On this divine chain was strung the exoteric symbology of every people. Their variety of form is powerless to affect their substance, and under their diverse ideal types of the universe of matter, symbolizing its vivifying principles, the uncorrupted immaterial image of the spirit of being guiding them is the same. So far as human intellect can go in the ideal interpretation of the spiritual universe, its laws and powers, the last word was pronounced ages since, and, 
If the ideas of Plato can be simplified for the sake of easier comprehension, the spirit of their substance can neither be altered, nor removed without material damage to the truth. Let human brains submit themselves to torture for thousands of years to come. Let theology perplex faith and mime it with the enforcing of incomprehensible dogmas in metaphysics, and science strengthen skepticism, by pulling down the tottering remains of spiritual intuition in mankind. With her demonstrations of its fallibility, eternal truth can never be destroyed. We find its last possible expression in our human language in the Persian logos, the Honover, or the living manifested word of God. The Zoroastrian Enoch very he is identical with the Jewish I am, and the great spirit of the poor, untutored Indian, is the manifested Brahma of the Hindu philosopher. One of the latter, Shraka, a Hindu physician, who is said to have lived 5,000 years BC, in his treatise on the origin of things, called USA, thus beautifully expresses himself, our earth is, like all the luminous bodies that surround us, one of the atoms of the immense whole of which we show a slight conception by terming it the infinite. There is but one light, and there is but one darkness, says a Siamese proverb. Demon S. Deus in Versus, the devil is the shadow of God, states the universal Kabbalistic axiom. Could light exist but for? p. 561. Primeval darkness? And do not the brilliant, sunny universe first stretch its infant arms from the swaddling bands of dark and dreary chaos? If the Christian fullness of him that filleth all in all is a revelation, then we must admit that, if there is a devil, he must be included in this fullness and be a part of that which filleth all in all. From time immemorial the justification of the deity, and a separation from the existing evil was attempted, and the object was reached by the old oriental philosophy and the foundation of the theodike, but their metaphysical views on the fallen spirit, have never been disfigured by the creation of an anthropomorphic personality of the devil as was done subsequently by the leading lights of Christian theology. A personal fiend, who opposes the deity, and impedes progress on its way to perfection, is to be sought only on earth amid humanity, not in heaven. Thus is it that all the religious monuments of old, in whatever land or under whatever climate, are the expression of the same identical thoughts, the key to which is in the esoteric doctrine. It would be vain, without studying the latter, to seek to unriddle the mysteries enshrouded for centuries in the temples and ruins of Egypt and Assyria, or those of Central America, British Columbia, and the Nakhon Wat of Cambodia. If each of these was built by a different nation, and neither nation had had intercourse with the others for ages, it is also certain that all were planned and built under the direct supervision of the priest. And the clergy of every nation, though practicing rites and ceremonies which may have differed externally, had evidently been initiated into the same traditional mysteries which were taught all over the world. In order to institute a better comparison between the specimens of prehistoric architecture to be found at the most opposite points of the globe, we have but to point to the grandiose Hindu ruins of Alora and the Deccan the Mexican Chichen Itza, in Yucatan, and the still grander ruins of Copan, in Guatemala. They present such features of resemblance that it seems impossible to escape the conviction that they were built by peoples moved by the same religious ideas, and that had reached an equal level of high civilization in arts and sciences. There is not, perhaps, on the face of the whole globe, a more imposing mass of ruins than knock on what, the wonder and puzzle of European archaeologists who venture into Siam. And when we say ruins, the expression is hardly correct, for nowhere are there buildings of such tremendous antiquity to be found in a better state of preservation than Nakhonwet, and the ruins of Ankorlam, the great temple. Hidden far away in the province of Siam Rap Eastern Siam in the midst of a most luxuriant tropical vegetation, surrounded by almost impenetrable forests of palms, cocoa trees, and betel nut, the general appearance. p. 562 of the wonderful temple is beautiful and romantic, as well as impressive and grand, says Mr. Vincent, a recent traveler. We whose good fortune it is to live in the 19th century, are accustomed to boast of the perfection and preeminence of our modern civilization, of the grandeur of our attainments in science, art, literature, and what not, as compared with those whom we call ancients, but still we are compelled to admit that they have far excelled our recent endeavors in many things, and notably in the fine arts of painting, architecture, in sculpture. We were but just looking upon a most wonderful example of the two latter, for in style and beauty of architecture, solidity of construction, and magnificent and elaborate carving and sculpture, the great Nag what has no superior, certainly no rival standing at the present day. The first view of the ruins is overwhelming. Thus the opinion of another traveler is added to that of many preceding ones, 
including archaeologists and other competent critics, who have believed that the ruins of the past Egyptian splendor deserve no higher eulogium than knock on wood. According to our plan, we will allow more impartial critics than ourselves to describe the place, since, in a work professedly devoted to a vindication of the ancients, the testimony of so enthusiastic an advocate as the present writer may be questioned. We have, nevertheless, seen knock on wood under exceptionally favorable circumstances, and can, therefore, certify to the general correctness of Mr. Vincent's description. He says, We entered upon an immense causeway, the stairs of which were flanked with six huge griffins, each carved from a single block of stone. The causeway is, 725 feet in length, and is paved with stones each of which measures four feet in length by two in breadth. On either side of it are artificial lakes fed by springs, and each covering about five acres of ground. The outer wall of Nakhonwat, the city of monasteries, is half a mile square, with gateways, which are handsomely carved with figures of gods and dragons. The foundations are ten feet in height. The entire edifice, including the roof, is of stone, but without cement, and so closely fitting are the joints as even now to be scarcely discernible. The shape of the building is oblong, being 796 feet in length, and 588 in width, while the highest central pagoda rises some 250 odd feet above the ground, and four others, at the angles of the court, are each about 150 feet in height. The above underscore lines are suggestive to travelers who have remarked and admired the same wonderful mason work in the Egyptian. p. 563. Remains. If the same workman did not lay the courses in both countries we must at least think that the secret of this matchless wall building was equally known to the architects of every land. Passing, we ascend a platform, and enter the temple itself through a columned portico, the façade of which is beautifully carved in basso-relievo with ancient mythological subjects. From this doorway, on either side, runs a corridor with a double row of columns, cut base and capital from single blocks, with a double, oval-shaped roof, covered with carving and consecutive sculptures upon the outer wall. This gallery of sculptures, which forms the exterior of the temple, consists of over half a mile of continuous pictures, cut in basso-relievo upon sandstone slabs six feet in width, and represent subjects taken from Hindu mythology, from the Ramayana the Sanskrit epic poem of India, with its 25,000 verses describing the exploits of the god Rama, and the son of the king of Aud. The contests of the king of Ceylon, and Hanuma, the monkey god, are graphically represented. There is no keystone used in the arch of this corridor. On the walls are sculptured the immense number of 100,000 separate figures. One picture from the Ramayana occupies 240 feet of the wall. In the Nakhon as many as 1,532 solid columns have been counted, and among the entire ruins of Angkor, the immense number of 6,000, almost all of them hewn from single blocks and artistically carved. But who built Nakhon what? And when was it built? Learned men have attempted to form opinions from studies of its construction, and especially ornamentation, and have failed. Native Cambodian Historians P. 564 Adds Vincent, reckon 2,400 from the building of the temple. I asked one of them how long Malcolm what had been built. None can tell when. I do not know. It must have either sprung up from the ground or been built by giants, or perhaps by the angels, was the answer. When Stevens asked the native Indians who built Copan, what nation traced the hieroglyphic designs, sculptured these elegant figures and carvings, these emblematical designs? The dull answer he received was Kian Sabe? Who knows? All is mystery, dark, impenetrable mystery, writes Stevens. In Egypt, the colossal skeletons of gigantic temples stand in all the nakedness of desolation. Here, an immense forest shrouded the ruins, hiding them from sight. But there are perhaps many circumstances, trifling for archaeologists unacquainted with the idle and fanciful legends of old, hence overlooked, otherwise the discovery might have sent them on a new train of thought. One is the invariable presence in the Egyptian, Mexican, and Siamese ruined temples, of the monkey. The Egyptian Sinocephalus assumes the same postures as the Hindu and Siamese Hanuma, and among the sculptured fragments of Copan, Stevens found the remains of colossal apes or baboons, strongly resembling in outline and appearance the four monstrous animals which once stood in front, attached to the base of the obelisk of Luxor, now in Paris, and which, under the name of the Sinocephali, were worshipped at Thebes.
In almost every Buddhist temple there are idols of huge monkeys kept, and some people have in their houses white monkeys on purpose to keep bad spirits away. With civilization, writes Louis de Carney, and the complex meaning we give that word, in keeping among the ancient Cambodians with what such prodigies of architecture seem to indicate? The age of Phidias was that of Sophocles, Socrates, and Plato, Michelangelo and Raphael succeeded Dante. There are luminous epochs during which the human mind, developing itself in every direction, triumphs in all, and creates masterpieces which sprang from the same inspiration. Now con what, concludes Vincent, must be ascribed to other than ancient Cambodians. But to whom? There exists no credible traditions, all is absurd fable or legend. The latter sentence has become of late a sort of cant phrase in the mouths of travelers and archaeologists. When they have found that. p. 565. No clue is attainable unless it can be found in popular legends, they turn away discouraged, and a final verdict is withheld. At the same time Vincent quotes a writer who remarks that these ruins are as imposing as the ruins of Thebes, or Memphis, but more mysterious. Who thinks they were erected by some ancient Michelangelo, and as that knock on what is grander than anything left to us by Greece or Rome. Furthermore, Mu ascribes the building again to some of the lost tribes of Israel, and is corroborated in that opinion by Mishi, the French bishop of Cambodia, who confesses that he is struck by the Hebrew character of the faces of many of the savage steens. Henri Mu believes that, without exaggeration, the oldest parts of Angkor may be fixed at more than 2,000 years ago. This, then, in comparison with the pyramids, would make them quite modern, the date is the more incredible, because the pictures on the walls may be proved to belong to those archaic ages when Poseidon and the Kaberi were worshipped throughout the continent. Had not Kamwa been built, as Dr. Adolf Bashin will have it, for the reception of the learned patriarch, Buddhaghosa, who brought the holy books of the Tre Pidak from Ceylon, or, as Bishop Palagoix, who refers the erection of this edifice to the reign of Prapatum Shariving when the sacred books of the Buddhists were brought from Ceylon, and Buddhism became the religion of the Cambodians, how is it possible to account for the following? We see in this same temple carved images of Buddha, four, and even thirty-two armed, and two and sixteen-headed gods, the Indian Vishnu, gods with wings, Burmese heads, Hindu figures, and Ceylon mythology. You see warriors riding upon elephants and in chariots, foot soldiers with shield and spear, boats, tigers, griffins, serpents, fishes, crocodiles, bullocks, soldiers of immense physical development, with helmets, and some people with beards probably moors. The figures, adds Mr. Vincent, stand somewhat like those on the great Egyptian monuments, the side partly turned toward the front, and I notice, besides, five horsemen, armed with spear and sword, riding abreast, like those seen upon the Assyrian tablets in the British Museum. For our part, we may add, that there are on the wall several repetitions of Dagon, the manfish of the Babylonians, and of the Kabarian gods of Samothrace. This may have escaped the notice of the few archaeologists who examine the place, but upon stricter inspection they will be found there, as well as the reputed father of the Kabari Vulcan, with his bolts and implements, having near him a king with a scepter in. p. 566. His hand, which is the counterpart of that of Cherania, or the scepter of Agamemnon, so-called, said to have been presented to him by the lame god of Lemnos. In another place we find Vulcan, recognizable by his hammer and pincers, but under the shape of a monkey, as usually represented by the Egyptians. Now, if not on what is essentially a Buddhist temple, how comes it to have on its walls basso relievos of completely an Assyrian character, and Kaberian gods which, though universally worshipped as the most ancient of the Asiatic mystery gods, had already been abandoned two hundred years BC, and the Samothracian mysteries themselves completely altered? Whence the popular tradition concerning the Prince of Roma among the Cambodians, a personage mentioned by all the native historians, who attribute to him the foundation of the temple? Is it not barely possible that even the Ramayana, itself, the famous epic poem, is but the original of Homer's Iliad, as it was suggested some years ago? The beautiful Paris, carrying off Helen, looks very much like Ravana, king of the giants, eloping with Sita, Rama's wife? The Trojan War is a counterpart of the Ramayana War, moreover, Herodotus assures us that the Trojan heroes and gods date in Greece only from the days of the Iliad. In such a case even Hanuma, the monkey god, would be but Vulcan in disguise, the more so that the Cambodian tradition makes the founder of Angkor come from Roma, which they place at the western end of the world, 
and that the Hindaroma also apportions the West to the descendants of Hanuma. Hypothetical as the suggestion may now seem, it is worthy of consideration, if even for the sake of being refuted. The Abbe Jagnit, a Catholic missionary in Cochin, China, ever ready to connect the least glimmer of historical light with that of Christian revelation, writes, whether we consider the commercial relations of the Jews, when, in the height of their power, the combined fleets of Hiram and Solomon went to seek the treasures of Ophir, or whether we come lower down, to the dispersion of the ten tribes who, instead of returning from captivity, set out from the banks of the Euphrates, and reached the shores of the ocean, the shining of the light of revelation in the far east is not the less incontestable. It looks certainly incontestable enough if we reverse the position and admit that all the light that ever shone on the Israelites came to them from this far east, passing first through the Chaldeans and Egyptians. The first thing to settle, is to find out who are the Israelites themselves, and that is the most vital question. Many historians seem to claim, with good reason, that the Jews were similar or identical with the ancient Phoenicians, but the Phoenicians were beyond any doubt in. p. 567. Ethiopian race, moreover, the present race of Punjab were hybridized with the Asiatic Ethiopians. Herodotus traces the Hebrews to the Persian Gulf, and south of that place were the Hamurites, the Arabians, beyond, the early Chaldeans and Susanians, the great builders. This seems to establish pretty well their Ethiopian affinity. Megasthenes says that the Jews were an Indian sect called Kalani, and their theology resembled that of the Indians. Other authors also suspect that the colonized Jews or the Judeans were the Yadis from Afghanistan and the Old India. Eusebius tells us that the Ethiopians came from the river Indus and settled near Egypt. More research may show that the Tamil Hindus, who are accused by the missionaries of worshipping the devil Cuddy Satin on the honor, after all, Seth or Satan, worshipped by the biblical Hittites. But if the Jews were in the twilight of history the Phoenicians, the latter may be traced themselves to the nations who used the old Sanskrit language. Carthage was a Phoenician city, hence its name, for Tyre was equally Cartha. In the Bible the words Kir, Kerjath are frequently found. Their tutelar god was styled Mel Kartha, Mel, Baal, or tutelar lord of the city. In Sanskrit a city or communal was a kul and its lord was Harry. Herculius is therefore the translation of Melkarth in Sanskrit in origin. Moreover all the Cyclopean races were Phoenicians. In the Odyssey the Cyclops, Cyclops, are the Libyan shepherds, and Herodotus describes them as miners and great builders. They are the ancient titans or giants, who in Hesiod forged bolts for Zeus. They are the biblical Zamzamim from the land of the giants, the Anakim. Now it is easy to see that the excavators of Alora, the builders of the old pagodas, the architects of Copan and of the ruins of Central America, those of Nakhonwet, and those of the Egyptian remains were, if not of the same race, at least of the same religion the one taught in the oldest mysteries. Besides, the figures on the walls of Angkor are purely archaic, and have nothing to do with the images and idols of Buddha, who may be of a far later origin. What gives a peculiar interest to this section, says Dr. Bastian, is the fact that the artist has represented the different nationalities in all their distinctive characteristic features, from the flat-nosed savage in the tassel garb of the Pnam and the short-haired Lao, to the straight-nosed Rajput, with sword and shield, and the bearded. p. 568. More, giving a catalogue of nationalities, like another column of Trajan, in the predominant physical conformation of each race. On the whole, there is such a prevalence of Hellenic cast and features and profiles, as well as in the elegant attitude of the horseman, that one might suppose Anacrates of old, after finishing his labors in Bombay, had made an excursion to the east. Therefore, if we allow the tribes of Israel to have had a hand in the building of Nakhon Wat, it cannot be as the tribes numbered and sent from the wilderness of Paran in search of the land of Canaan, but as their earlier ancestors, which amounts to the rejection of such tribes, as the casting of a reflection of the Mosaic Revelation. And where is the outside historical evidence that such tribes were ever heard of at all, before the compilation of the Old Testament by Ezra? There are archaeologists who strongly regard the twelve tribes as utterly mythical, for there never was a tribe of Simeon, and that of Levi was a caste. There still remains the same problem to solve whether the Judeans had ever been in Palestine before Cyrus. From the sons of Jacob, who had all married Canaanites, except Joseph, whose wife was the daughter of an Egyptian priest of the sun, down to the legendary book of Judges there was an acknowledged general intermarrying between the said tribes and the idolatrous races, and the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, 
and Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites, and they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods, says the third chapter of Judges, and the children of Israel forgot their god and served Balaam, and the groves. This Baal was Moloch, M-L-C-H Carta, or Hercules. He was worshipped wherever the Phoenicians went. How could the Israelites possibly keep together as tribes, while, on the authority of the Bible itself, whole populations were from year to year uprooted violently by Assyrian and other conquerors? So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, and from Kutha, and from Ava, and from Hamath, and from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel, 2 Kings, 17. 23. 24. If the language of Palestine became in time Semitic, it is because of Assyrian influence, for Phoenicia had become a dependency as early as the days of Hiram, and the Phoenicians evidently changed their language from Hamitic to Semitic. Assyria was the land of Nimrod, from Nimra, spotted, and Nimrod was Bacchus, with his spotted leopard skin. This leopard skin is a sacred appendage of the mysteries, it was used. p. 569. In the Eleusinian as well as in the Egyptian mysteries, it is found sculptured on the basso relievos of Central American ruins, covering the backs of the sacrificers, it is mentioned in the earliest speculations of the Brahmins on the meaning of their sacrificial prayers, the Atarea Brahmanam. It is used in the Agnish Doma, the initiation rites of the Soma mystery. When the neophyte is to be born again, he is covered with a leopard skin, out of which he emerges as from his mother's womb. The Kaberi were also Assyrian gods. They had different names, in the common language they were known as Jupiter and Bacchus, and sometimes as Achiosurcis, Ascaros, Achiosurcia, and Cadmelis, and even the true number of these deities was uncertain with the people. They had other names in the sacred language, known but to the hierophants and priests, and it was not lawful to mention them. How is it then that we find them reproduced in their Samothracian postures on the walls of Nakhonwut? How is it again that we find them pronounced albeit slightly disfigured as known in that same sacred language, by the populations of Siam, Tibet, and India? The name Kaberi may be a derivation from Abir, great, Abir, an astrologer, or, Shabir, an associate, and they were worshipped at Hebron, the city of the Anakis the giants. The name Abraham, according to Dr. Wilder, has a very Kaberian look. The word Haber, or Gaber may be the etymological root of the Hebrews, as applied to Nimrod in the Bible giants of the sixth chapter of Genesis, but we must seek for their origin far earlier than the days of Moses. The name Phoenician affords its own proof. They are called Phi Omicron Iota Nu Iota Kappa Epsilon Sigma by Manithau, or Ph Anakis, which shows that the Anakis are Anakim of Canaan, with whom the people of Israel, if not identical in race, had, by intermarriage, become entirely absorbed, were the Phoenicians or the problematical Hyksis, as Manithal has it, and whom Josephus once declared were the direct ancestors of the Israelites. Therefore, it is in this jumble of contradictory opinions, authorities, and historical allopodrida that we must look for a solution of the mystery. So long as the origin of the Hyksis is not positively settled we can know nothing certain of the Israelitish people who, either wittingly or otherwise, have mixed up their chronology and origin in such an inextricable tangle. But if the Hyksis can be proved to have been the poly shepherds of the Indus, who partially removed to the east, and came over from the nomadic Aryan tribes of India, then, perhaps, it would account for the biblical myths being so mixed up with the Aryan and Asiatic mystery gods. As Dunlap says, the Hebrews came out of Egypt among. p. 570. The Canaanites, they need not be traced beyond the Exodus. That is their historical beginning. It was very easy to cover up this remote event by the recital of mythical traditions, and to prefix to it an account of their origin in which the gods, patriarchs, should figure as their ancestors. But it is not their historical beginning which is the most vital question for the world of science and theology. It is their religious beginning. And if we can trace it through the Hyksos Phoenicians, the Ethiopian builders and the Chaldeans whether it is to the Hindus that the latter owe their learning, or the Brahmins who owe it to the Chaldeans, we have the means in hand to trace every so-called revealed dogmatical assertion in the Bible to its origin, which we have to search for in the twilight of history, and before the separation of the Aryan and Semitic families. And how can we do it better or more surely than through means afforded us by archaeology? Picture writing can be destroyed, 
but if it survives it cannot lie, and, if we find the same myths, ideas, and secret symbols on monuments all over the world, and if, moreover, these monuments can be shown to antedate the twelve chosen tribes, then we can unerringly show that instead of being a direct divine revelation, it was but an incomplete recollection or tradition among a tribe which had been identified and mixed up for centuries before the apparition of Abraham, with all the three great world families, namely, the Aryan, Semitic, and Turanian nations, if so they must be called. The Teraphim of Abram's father, Terah, the maker of images, were the Kaberi gods, and we see them worshipped by Micah, by the Danites, and others. Teraphim were identical with the Seraphim, and these were serpent images, the origin of which is in the Sanskrit Sarpa, the serpent, a symbol sacred to all the deities as a symbol of immortality. Kion, or the god Kivan, worshipped by the Hebrews in the wilderness, is Shiva, the Hindu, as well as Saturn. The Greek story shows that Dardanus, the Arcadian, having received them as a dowry, carried them to Samothrace, and from thence to Troy, and they were worshipped far before the days of glory of Tyre or Sidon, though the former have been built 2760 BC from where did Dardanus derive them. It is an easy matter to assign an age to ruins on merely the external evidence of probabilities, it is more difficult to prove it. Meanwhile the rock works of Rud, Peridus, Marathos, resemble those of Petra, Baalbek. p. 571. And other Ethiopian works, even externally. On the other hand the assertions of certain archaeologists who find no resemblance between the temples of Central America and those of Egypt and Siam, leave the symbologist, acquainted with the secret language of picture writing, perfectly unconcerned. He sees the landmarks of one and the same doctrine on all of these monuments, and reads their history and affiliation and signs imperceptible to the uninitiated scientist. There are traditions also, and one of these speaks of the last of the king initiates who were but rarely admitted to the higher orders of the Eastern Brotherhoods, who reigned in 1670. This king of Siam was the one so ridiculed by the French ambassador, de la Lubert, as a lunatic who had been searching all his life for the philosopher's stone. One of such mysterious landmarks is found in the peculiar structure of certain arches in the temples. The author of The Land of the White Elephant remarks as curious, the absence of the keystone in the arches of the building, and the undecipherable inscriptions. In the ruins of Santa Cruz del Quichon arch corridor was found by Stevens, equally without a keystone. Describing the desolate ruins of Palenque, and remarking that the arches of the corridors were all built on this model, and the ceilings in this form, he supposes that the builders were evidently ignorant of the principles of the arch, and the support was made by stones lapping over as they rose, as at Ocosingo and among Cyclopean remains in Greece and Italy. In other buildings, though they belong to the same group, the traveler found the missing keystone, which is a sufficient proof that its omission elsewhere was premeditated. May we not look for the solution of the mystery in the Masonic Manual? The keystone has an esoteric meaning which ought to be, if it is not, well appreciated by High Masons. The most important subterranean building mentioned in the description of the origin of Freemasonry, is the one built by Enoch. The patriarch is led by the deity, whom he sees in a vision, into the nine vaults. After that, with the assistance of his son, Methuselah, he constructs in the land of Canaan, in the bowels of the mountain, nine apartments on the models that were shown to him in the vision. Each was roofed with an arch, and the apex of each formed a keystone, having inscribed on it the mythic characters. Each of the latter, furthermore, represented one of the nine names tracing characters emblematical of the attributes by which the deity was, according to ancient Freemasonry, known to the antediluvian brethren. Then Enoch constructed two deltas of the purest gold, and tracing two of the mysterious characters on each, he placed one of them in the deepest arch, and p. 572. The other entrusted to Methuselah, communicating to him, at the same time, other important secrets now lost to Freemasonry. And so, among these arcane secrets, now lost to their modern successors, may be found also the fact that the keystones were used in the arches only in certain portions of the temples devoted to special purposes. Another similarity presented by the architectural remains of the religious monuments of every country can be found in the identity of parts, courses, and measurements. All these buildings belong to the age of Hermes Trismegistus, and however comparatively modern or ancient the temple may seem, their mathematical proportions are found to correspond with the Egyptian religious edifices. There is a similar disposition of courtyards, adida, passages, and steps, hence, 
Despite any dissimilarity in architectural style, it is a warrantable inference that like religious rites were celebrated in all. Says Dr. Stukeley, concerning Stonehenge, this structure was not erected upon any Roman measure, and this is demonstrated by the great number of fractions which the measurement of each part, according to European scales, gives. On the contrary the figures become even, as soon as we apply to it the measurement of the ancient cubit, which was common to the Hebrew children of Shem, as well as to the Phoenicians and Egyptians, children of Ham, and imitators of the monuments of unhewn and oracular stones. The presence of the artificial lakes, and their peculiar disposition on the consecrated grounds, is also a fact of great importance. The lakes inside the precincts of Karnak, and those enclosed in the grounds of Nakonwat, and around the temples in the Mexican Copan and Santa Cruz del Quiche, will be found to present the same peculiarities. Besides possessing other significances the whole area was laid out with reference to cyclic calculations. In the druidical structures the same sacred and mysterious numbers will be found. The circle of stones generally consists of either 12, or 21, or 36. In these circles the center place belongs to Asar, Azan, or the god in the circle, by whatever other name he might have been known. The thirteen Mexican serpent gods bear a distant relationship to the thirteen stones of the druidical ruins. The, Tau, and the astronomical cross of Egypt are conspicuous in several apertures of the remains of Palenque. In one of the basso relievos of the palace of Palenque, on the west side, sculptured on a hieroglyphic, right under the seated figure, is a Tau. The standing figure, which leans over the first one, is in the act of covering its head with the left hand with the veil of initiation, while it extends its right with the index and middle finger pointing to heaven. The position is precisely that of a Christian bishop giving his blessing, or the one in which Jesus is often represented while at the Last Supper. Even the Hindu elephant-headed god of wisdom, or magic learning, Ganesha, may be found among the stucco figures of the Mexican ruins. What explanation can the archaeologists, philologists in short, the chosen host of academicians give us? None whatever. At best they have but hypotheses, every one of which is likely to be pulled down by its successor a pseudo-truth, perhaps, like the first. The keys to the biblical miracles of old, and to the phenomena of modern days, the problems of psychology, physiology, and the many missing links which have so perplexed scientists of late, are all in the hands of secret fraternities. This mystery must be unveiled some day. But till then dark skepticism will constantly interpose its threatening, ugly shadow between God's truths and the spiritual vision of mankind, and many are those who, infected by the mortal epidemic of our century hopeless materialism will remain in doubt and mortal agony as to whether, when man dies, he will live again, although the question has been solved by long bygone generations of sages. The answers are there. They may be found on the time-worn granite pages of cave temples, on sphinxes, propylons, and obelisks. They have stood there for untold ages, and neither the rude assault of time, nor the still ruder assault of Christian hands, have succeeded in obliterating their records. All covered with the problems which were solved who can tell? Perhaps by the archaic forefathers of their builders the solution follows each question, and this the Christian could not appropriate, for, except the initiates, no one has understood the mystic writing. The key was in the keeping of those who knew how to commune with the invisible presence, and who had received from the lips of Mother Nature herself, her grand truths. And so stand these monuments like mute forgotten sentinels on the threshold of that unseen world, whose gates are thrown open but to a few elect. Defying the hand of time, the vain inquiry of profane science, the insults of the revealed religions, they will disclose the riddles to none but the legatees of those by whom they were entrusted with the mystery. The cold, stony lips of the once vocal Memnon, and of these hardy sphinxes, keep their secrets well. Who will unseal them? Who of our modern, materialistic dwarfs and unbelieving Sadducees will dare to lift the veil of Isis? Chapter 15. S.T. Have we devils here? Do you put tricks upon us with savages, and men of Ond? The Tempest, Act 2, S.C. 2. We have now, so far forth as it is requisite for our design, considered the nature and functions of the Sole, and have plainly demonstrated that she is a substance distinct from the body. Dr. Henry Moore, Immortality of the Sole. 1659. Knowledge is power, ignorance is imbecility. Author of Art Magic, Ghostland. The secret doctrine has for many centuries been like the symbolical man of sorrows of the prophet Isaiah. Who hath believed their report? 
Its martyrs have repeated from one generation to another. The doctrine has grown up before its persecutors as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. It hath no form, nor comeliness. It is despised and rejected of men, and they hid their faces from it. They esteemed him not. There need be no controversy as to whether this doctrine agrees or not with the iconoclastic tendency of the skeptics of our times. It agrees with truth and that is enough. It would be idle to expect that it would be believed by its detractors and slanderers. But the tenacious vitality it exhibits all over the globe, wherever there are a group of men to quarrel over it, is the best proof that the seed planted by our fathers on the other side of the flood was that of a mighty oak, not the spore of a mushroom theology. No lightning of human ridicule can fell to the ground, and no thunderbolts ever forged by the Vulcans of science are powerful enough to blast the trunk, or even scar the branches of this world tree of knowledge. We have but to leave unnoticed their letter that killeth, and catch the subtle spirit of their hidden wisdom, to find concealed in the books of Hermes be they the model or the copy of all others the evidences of a truth and philosophy which we feel must be based on the eternal laws. We instinctively comprehend that, however finite the powers of man, while he is yet embodied, they must be in close kinship with the attributes of an infinite deity, and we become capable of better appreciating the hidden sense of the gift lavished by the Elul Monhadim. Behold, I have given you everything which is upon the face of all the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over all. Had the allegories contained in the first chapters of Genesis been p. 575 better understood, even in their geographical and historical sense, which involved nothing at all esoteric, the claims of its true interpreters, the Kabbalists, could hardly have been rejected for so long a time. Every student of the Bible must be aware that the first and second chapters of Genesis could not have proceeded from the same pen. They are evidently allegories and parables, for the two narratives of the creation and peopling of our earth diametrically contradict each other in nearly every particular of order, time, place, and methods employed in the so-called creation. In accepting the narratives literally, and as a whole, we lower the dignity of the unknown deity. We drag him down to the level of humanity, and endow him with the peculiar personality of man, who needs the cool of the day to refresh him, who rests from his labors, and is capable of anger, revenge, and even of using precautions against man, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life. A tacit admission, by the way, on the part of the deity, that man could do it, if not prevented by sheer force, but, in recognizing the allegorical coloring of the description of what may be termed historical facts, we find our feet instantly on firm ground. To begin with the Garden of Eden as a locality is no myth at all, it belongs to those landmarks of history which occasionally disclose to the student that the Bible is not all mere allegory. Eden, or the Hebrew, Gan Eden, meaning the park or the Garden of Eden, is an archaic name of the country watered by the Euphrates and its many branches, from Asia and Armenia to the Erythraean Sea. In the Chaldean Book of Numbers, its location is designated in numerals, and in the Cipher Rosicrucian Manuscript, left by Count St. Germain, it is fully described. In the Assyrian tablets, it is rendered Gondunias. Behold, say the Elohim of Genesis, the man is become as one of us. The Elohim may be accepted in one sense for gods or powers, and taken in another one for the Elohim, or priests, the hierophants initiated into the good and the evil of this world, for there was a college of priests called the Elohim, while the head of their caste, or the chief of the hierophants, was known as Java Elohim. Instead of becoming a neophyte, and gradually obtaining his esoteric knowledge through a regular initiation, an Adam, or man, uses his intuitional faculties, and, prompted by the serpent woman and matter taste of the tree of knowledge the esoteric or secret doctrine unlawfully. The priests of Hercules, or Melkarth, the lord of the Eden, all wore coats of skin. The text says, in Java Alim, made for Adam and his wife, Chidonuth Hour. The first? P. 576. Hebrew word, chichin, is the Greek chitin. It became a Slavonic word by adoption from the Bible, and means a coat, an upper garment. Though containing the same substratum of esoteric truth as every early cosmogony, the Hebrew scripture wears on its face the marks of its double origin. Its genesis is purely a reminiscence of the Babylonian captivity. The names of places, men, and even objects, can be traced from the original text to the Chaldeans and the Akkadians, the progenitors and Aryan instructors of the former. It is strongly contested that the Akkad tribes of Chaldea, Babylonia, and Assyria were in any way cognate with the Brahmins, of Hindustan, 
but there are more proofs in favor of this opinion than otherwise. The Shemite, or Assyrian, ought, perchance, to have been called the Turanian, and the Mongolians have been denominated sides. But if the Akkadians ever existed otherwise than in the imagination of some philologists and ethnologists, they certainly would never have been a Turanian tribe, as some Assyriologists have striven to make us believe. They were simply emigrants on their way to Asia Minor from India, the cradle of humanity, and their sacerdotal adepts tarried to civilize and initiate a barbarian people. Olivi proved the fallacy of the Turanian mania in regard to the Akkadian people, whose very name has been changed a dozen times already, and other scientists have proved that the Babylonian civilization was neither born nor developed in that country. It was imported from India, and the importers were Brahmanical Hindus. It is the opinion of Professor A. Wilder, that if the Assyrians had been called Turanians in the Mongolian size, then, in such a case the wars of Iran and Turan, Dohak and Jimzid, or Yuma, would have been fairly comprehended as the struggle of the old Persians against the endeavors of the Assyrian satraps to conquer them, which ended in the overthrow of Nineveh, the spider weaving her web in the palace of Afrasiab. The Turanian of Professor Muller and his school, as our correspondent, was evidently the savage and nomadic Caucasian, out of whom the Hamite or Ethiopian builders come, then the Shemites perhaps a hybrid of Hamite and Aryan, and lastly the Aryan Median, Persian, Hindu, and later, the Gothic and Slavic peoples of Europe. He supposes the Celt to have been a hybrid, analogous to the Assyrians between the Aryan invaders of Europe and the Iberic, probably Ethiopic, population of Europe. In such a case he must admit the possibility of our assertion that the Akkadians were a tribe of the earliest Hindus. Now. P. 577. Whether they were Brahmins, from the Brahmanic planisphere proper, 40 degrees north latitude, or from India, Hindustan, or, again, from the India of Central Asia, we will leave to philologists of future ages to decide. An opinion which with us amounts to certitude, demonstrated by an inductive method of our own, which we are afraid will be but little appreciated by the orthodox methods of modern science, is based on what will appear to the latter merely circumstantial evidence. For years we have repeatedly noticed that the same esoteric truths were expressed in identical symbols and allegories in countries between which there had never been traced any historical affiliation. We have found the Jewish Kabbalah and the Bible repeating the Babylonian myths, and the Oriental and Chaldean allegories, given in form and substance in the oldest manuscripts of the Siamese Talapoim, monks, and in the popular but oldest traditions of Ceylon. In the latter place we have an old and valued acquaintance whom we have also met in other parts of the globe, a Pali scholar, and a native Singhalese, who has in his possession a curious palm leaf, to which, by chemical processes, a time-proof durability has been given, and an enormous conch, or rather one half of a conch for it has been split in two. On the leaf we saw the representation of a giant of Celonian antiquity and fame, blind, and pulling down with his outstretched arms, which are embracing the four central pillars of a pagoda the whole temple on a crowd of armed enemies. His hair is long and reaches nearly to the ground. We were informed by the possessor of this curious relic, that the blind giant was Samona, the little, so called in contradistinction with Samona Kadam, the Siamese savior. Moreover, the Pali legend, in as important particulars, corresponds with that of the biblical Samson. The shell bore upon its pearly surface a pictorial engraving divided in two compartments, and the workmanship was far more artistic, as to conception and execution, than the crucifixes and other religious trinkets carved out of the same material in our days, at Jaffa and Jerusalem. In the first panel is represented Shiva, with all his Hindu attributes, sacrificing his son whether the only begotten, or one of many, we never stop to inquire. The victim is laid on a funeral pile, and the father is hovering in the air over him, with an uplifted weapon ready to strike but the god's face is turned toward a jungle in which a rhinoceros has deeply buried its horn in a huge tree and is unable to extricate it. The adjoining panel, or division, represents the same rhinoceros on the pile. p. 578. With the weapon plunged in its side, and the intended victim Shiva's son free, and helping the god to kindle the fire upon the sacrificial altar. Now, we have but to remember that Shiva and the Palantinian Baal, or Moloch, and Saturn are identical that Abraham is held until the present day by the Mahometan Arabs as Saturn and the Kaaba, that Abraham and Israel were names of Saturn, and that Sanko Nitone tells us that Saturn offered his only begotten son as a sacrifice to his father Ornos, and even circumcised himself and forced all his household and allies to do the same, 
to trace unerringly the biblical myth to its source. But this source is neither Phoenician, nor Chaldean, it is purely Indian, and the original of it may be found in the Mahabharata. But, whether Brahmanical or Buddhistical, it must certainly be much older than the Jewish Pentateuch, as compiled by Ezra after the Babylonian captivity, and revised by the rabbis of the Great Synagogue. Therefore, we are bold enough to maintain our assertion against the opinion of many men of learning, whom, nevertheless, we consider far more learned than ourselves. Scientific induction is one thing, and knowledge of facts, however unscientific they may seem at first, is another. But science has discovered enough to inform us that Sanskrit originals, of Nepal, were translated by Buddhistic missionaries into nearly every Asiatic language. Likewise Pali manuscripts were translated into Siamese, and carried to Burma and Siam, it is easy, therefore, to account for the same religious legends and myths circulating in all these countries. But Manithau tells us also of Pali shepherds who emigrated westward, and when we find some of the oldest Salonic traditions in the Chaldean Kabbalah and Jewish Bible, we must think that either Chaldeans or Babylonians had been in Ceylon or India, or the ancient Pali had the same traditions as the Akkadians, whose origin is so uncertain. Suppose even Rawlinson to be right, and that the Akkadians did come from Armenia, he did not trace them farther back. As the field is now open for any kind of hypothesis, we submit that this tribe might as well have come to Armenia from beyond the Indus, following their way in the direction of the Caspian Sea a part which was also India, once upon a time and from thence to the Euxin. Or they might have come originally from Ceylon by the same way. It has been found impossible to follow, with any degree of certitude, the wanderings of these nomadic Aryan tribes, hence we are left to judge from inference, and by comparing their esoteric myths. Abraham himself, for all our scientists can know, might have been one of these poly shepherds who emigrated west. He is shown to have gone. p. 579. With his father, Tara, from Yor of the Chaldees, and Sir H. Rawlinson found the Phoenician city of Martu or Marathos mentioned in an inscription at Yor, and chose it to signify the west. If their language seems in one sense to oppose their identity with the Brahmins of Hindustan, yet there are other reasons which make good our claims that the biblical allegories of Genesis are entirely due to these nomadic tribes. Their name Akat, is of the same class as Adam, Hava, or Ed and perhaps, says Dr. Wilder, meaning son of Ad, like the sons of Ad in ancient Arabia. In Assyrian, A.K.'s creator and Adad is Adi, the father. In Aramean Ad also means one, and Adad the only one, and in the Kabbalah Ad and is the only begotten the first emanation of the unseen creator. Adam was the lord god of Syria and the consort of Adar Gat, or Astarte, the Syrian goddess, who was Venus, Isis, Astar, or Mylida, etc., and each of these was mother of all living the Magnumator. Thus, while the first, second, and third chapters of Genesis are but disfigured imitations of other cosmogonies, the fourth chapter, beginning at the sixteenth verse, and the fifth chapter to the end give purely historical facts, though the latter were never correctly interpreted. They are taken, word for word, from the Seeger Book of Numbers, of the Great Oriental Kabbalah. From the birth of Enoch, the appropriated first parent of modern Freemasonry, begins the genealogy of the so-called Turanian, Aryan, and Semitic families, if such they be correctly. Every woman is in humorized land or city, every man in patriarch a race, a branch, or a subdivision of a race. The wives of Lamech give the key to the riddle which some good scholar might easily master, even without studying the esoteric sciences. And Adab bear Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle, nomadic Aryan race, and his brother was Jubal, he was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ, and Zillah bear Tabalkain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, etc. Every word has a significance, but it is no revelation. It is simply a compilation of the most historical facts, although history is too perplexed upon this point to know how to claim them. It is from the youths into Kashmir, and beyond that we must search for the cradle of mankind and the sons of Ada, and leave the particular Garden of Eden on the Euphrates too. p. 580. The College of the Weird Astrologers and Magi, the Alim. No wonder that the northern seer, Svedenborg, advises people to search for the lost word among the higher fans of Tartary. China, and Tibet, for it is there, and only there now, although we find it inscribed on the monuments of the oldest Egyptian dynasties. The grandiose poetry of the Four Vedas, the Books of Hermes, the Chaldean Book of Numbers, the Nazarene Codex, 
the Kabbal of the Tanaim, the Sefer Jezero, the Book of Wisdom, of Shlomo, Solomon, the secret treatise on Muda and Bada attributed by the Buddhist Kabbalist to Kapila, the founder of the Sankhya system, the Brahmanas, the Stamgir, of the Tibetans, all these volumes have the same groundwork. Varying but in allegories they teach the same secret doctrine which, when once thoroughly eliminated, will prove to be the ultima fool of true philosophy, and disclose what is this lost word. It is useless to expect scientists to find in these works anything of interest except that which is in direct relation to either philology or comparative mythology. Even Max Muller, as soon as he refers to the mysticism and metaphysical philosophy scattered through the old Sanskrit literature, sees in it not but theological absurdities and fantastic nonsense. Speaking of the Brahmanas, all full of mysterious, therefore, as a matter of course, absurd, meanings, we find him saying, the greater portion of them is simply twaddle, and what is worse, theological twaddle. No person who is not acquainted beforehand with the place which the Brahmanas fill in the history of the Indian mind, could read more than ten pages without being disgusted. We do not wonder at the severe criticism of this erudite scientist. p. 581. Without a clue to the real meaning of this twaddle of religious conceptions, how can they judge of the esoteric by the exoteric? We find an answer in another of the highly interesting lectures of the German savant, no Jew, no Roman, no Abraham ever thought of converting people to his own national form of worship. Religion was looked upon as private or national property. It was to be guarded against strangers. The most sacred names of the gods, the prayers by which their favor could be gained, were kept secret. No religion was more exclusive than that of the Brahmins. Therefore, when we find scholars who imagine, because they have learned the meaning of a few exoteric rites from Mr. Tria, Abraham priest initiated in the sacrificial mysteries, that they are capable of interpreting all the symbols, and have sifted the Hindu religions, we cannot help admiring the completeness of their scientific delusions. The more so, since we find Max Muller himself asserting that since Abraham was born nay, twice born, and could not be made, not even the lowest caste, that of the Sudras, would open its ranks to a stranger. How much less likely that he would allow that stranger to unveil to the world his most sacred religious mysteries, the secret of which has been guarded so jealously from profanation throughout untold ages. No, our scientists do not nay, cannot understand correctly the old Hindu literature, any more than an atheist or materialist is able to appreciate at their just value the feelings of a seer, a mystic, whose whole life is given to contemplation. They have a perfect right to soothe themselves with the sweet lullaby of their self-admiration, and the just consciousness of their great learning, but none at all to lead the world into their own error, by making it believe that they have solved the last problem of ancient thought and literature, whether Sanskrit or any other, that there lies not behind the external twaddle far more than was ever dreamed of by our modern exact philosophy, or that above and beyond the correct rendering of Sanskrit words and sentences there is no deeper thought, intelligible to some of the descendants of those who veiled it in the morning hours of Earth's day, if they are not to the profane reader. We do not feel in the least astonished that a materialist, and even an orthodox Christian, is unable to read either the old Brahmanical works or their progeny, the Kabbalah, the Codex of Burdanes, or the Jewish scripture without disgust at their modesty and apparent lack of what the uninitiated reader is pleased to call common sense. But if we can hardly blame them for such a feeling, especially in the case of the Hebrew, and p. 582. Even the Greek and Latin literature, and are quite ready to agree with Professor Fist that it is a mark of wisdom to be dissatisfied with imperfect evidence. On the other hand we have a right to expect that they should recognize that it is no less a mark of honesty to confess one's ignorance in cases where there are two sides to the question, and in the solution of which the scientist may as easily blunder as any ignoramus. When we find Professor Draper, in his definition of periods in the intellectual development of Europe, classifying the time from the days of Socrates, the precursor and teacher of Plato, to Carnades, as the age of faith, and that from Philo to the destruction of the Neoplatonic schools by Justinian the age of decrepitude, we may be allowed to infer that the learned professor knows as little about the real tendency of Greek philosophy in the Attic schools as he understood the true character of Giordano Bruno. So when we see one of the best of Sanskrit scholars stating on his own unsupported authority that the greater portion of the Brahmanas is simply theological twaddle, we deeply regret to think that Professor Muller must be far better acquainted with the old Sanskrit verbs and nouns than with Sanskrit thought, and that a scholar so uniformly disposed to do justice to the religions and the men of old should so effectually play into the hands of Christian theologians. What is the use of Sanskrit? 
exclaims Jacquan, who alone has made more false statements about the East than all the Orientalists put together. At such a rate there would be none indeed. If we are to exchange one corpse for another, then we may as well dissect the dead letter of the Jewish Bible as that of the Vedas. He who is not intuitionally vivified by the religious spirit of old, will never see beyond the exoteric twaddle. When first we read that in the cavity of the cranium of Macroprosopo the long face lies hidden the aerial wisdom which nowhere is open, and it is not discovered, and not opened, or again, that the nose of the Ancient of Days is life in every part, we are inclined to regard it as the incoherent ravings of a lunatic. And when, moreover, we are apprised by the Codex Nazareus that she, the spiritus, invites her son Karapanos, who is frantic and without judgment, to an unnatural crime with his own mother, we are pretty well disposed to throw the book aside in disgust. But is this only meaningless trash, expressed in rude and even obscene language? No more can it be judged by external appearance than the sexual symbols of the Egyptian and Hindu religions, or the coarse frankness of expression of the Holy Bible itself. No more than the allegory of even the tempting serpent of Eden. The ever-insinuating, restless spirit, when once it falls into matter, tempts Eve, or Hava, which bodily represent chaotic matter frantic and without judgment. For matter, Karabhanas, is the son of spirit, or p. 583. The spirit is of the Nazarenes, the Sophia A. Kamath, and the latter is the daughter of the pure, intellectual spirit, the divine breath. When science shall have effectually demonstrated to us the origin of matter, and proved the fallacy of the occultists and old philosophers who held, as their descendants now hold, that matter is but one of the correlations of spirit, then will the world of skeptics have a right to reject the old wisdom, or throw the charge of obscenity in the teeth of the old religions. From time immemorial, says Mrs. Lydia Maria Child, an emblem has been worshipped in Hindustan as the type of creation, or the origin of life. It is the most common symbol of Shiva, Bala, or Mahadeva, and is universally connected with his worship. Shiva was not merely the reproducer of human forms, he represented the fructifying principle, the generative power that pervades the universe. Small images of this emblem carved in ivory, gold, or crystal, are worn as ornaments about the neck. The maternal emblem is likewise a religious type, and worshippers of Vishnu represented on their forehead by a horizontal mark. Is it strange that they regarded with reverence the great mystery of human birth? Were they impure thus to regard it? Or are we impure that we do not so regard it? We have traveled far, and unclean have been the paths, since those old anchorites first spoke of God and the soul in the solemn depths of their first sanctuaries. Let us not smile at their mode of tracing the infinite and incomprehensible cause throughout all the mysteries of nature, lest by so doing we cast the shadow of our own grossness on their patriarchal simplicity. Many are the scholars who have tried, to the best of their ability, to do justice to old India. Colebrook, Sir William Jones, Bartholomew St. Hilaire, Lawson, Weber, Strange, Bernouf, Hardy, and finally Jacques Leo, have all brought forward their testimony to her achievements in legislation, ethics, philosophy, and religion. No people in the world have ever attained to such a grandeur of thought and ideal conceptions of the deity and its offspring, man, as the Sanskrit metaphysicians and theologians. I complain against many translators and orientalists, says Jacques Leo, while admiring their profound knowledge is, that not having lived in India, they fail in exactness of expression and in comprehension of the symbolical sense of poetic chants, prayers, and ceremonies, and thus too often fall into material errors, whether of translation or appreciation. Further, this author who, from a long residence in India, and the study of its literature, is better qualified to testify than those who have never been there, tells us that the life of several generations would scarce suffice. p. 584. Merely to read the works that ancient India has left us on history, ethics, morale, poetry, philosophy, religion, different sciences, and medicine. And yet Louis Jacques Leo is able to judge but by the few fragments, access to which had ever depended on the complacence and friendship of a few Brahmins with whom he succeeded in becoming intimate. Did they show him all their treasures? Did they explain to him all he desired to learn? We doubt it, otherwise he would not himself have judged their religious ceremonies so hastily as he has upon several occasions merely upon circumstantial evidence. Still, no traveler has shown himself fairer in the main or more impartial to India than Jacques Leo. If he is severe as to her present degradation, 
He is still severe to those who were the cause of it the sacerdotal caste of the last few centuries and his rebuke is proportionate to the intensity of his appreciation of her past grandeur. He shows the sources whence proceeded the revelations of all the ancient creeds, including the inspired books of Moses, and points at India directly as the cradle of humanity, the parent of all other nations, and the hotbed of all the lost arts and sciences of antiquity, for which old India, herself, was lost already in the Sumerian darkness of the archaic ages. To study India, he says, is to trace humanity to its sources. In the same way as modern society jostles antiquity at each step, he adds, as our poets have copied Homer and Virgil, Sophocles and Euripides, Plautus and Terence, as our philosophers have drawn inspiration from Socrates, Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle, as our historians take Titus Livius, Sallust, or Tacitus, as models, our orators, Demosthenes or Cicero, our physicians study Hippocrates, and our codes transcribed Ostenian so had antiquity self also an antiquity to study, to imitate, and to copy. What more simple and more logical? Do not peoples proceed and succeed each other? Does the knowledge, painfully acquired by one nation, confine itself to its own territory, and die with the generation that produced it? Can there be any absurdity in the suggestion that the India of six thousand years ago, brilliant, civilized, overflowing with population, impressed upon Egypt, Persia, Judea, Greece, and Rome, a stamp as ineffaceable, impressions as profound, as these last have impressed upon us? It is time to disabuse ourselves of those prejudices which represent the ancients as having almost spontaneously elaborated ideas, philosophic, religious, and moral, the most lofty those prejudices that in their naive admiration explain all in the domain of science, arts, and letters, by the intuition of some few great men and in the realm of religion by revelation. p. 585. We believe that the day is not far off when the opponents of this fine and erudite writer will be silenced by the force of irrefutable evidence. And when facts shall once have corroborated his theories and assertions, what will the world find? That it is to India, the country less explored, and less known than any other, that all the other great nations of the world are indebted for their languages, arts, legislature, and civilization. Its progress, impeded for a few centuries before our era for, as this writer shows, at the epoch of the great Macedonian conqueror, India had already passed the period of her splendor was completely stifled in the subsequent ages. But the evidence of her past glories lies in her literature. What people in all the world can boast of such a literature, which, for the Sanskrit less difficult, would be more studied than now? Hitherto the general public has had to rely for information on a few scholars who, notwithstanding their great learning and trustworthiness, are unequal to the task of translating and commenting upon more than a few books out of the almost countless number that, notwithstanding the vandalism of the missionaries, are still left to swell the mighty volume of Sanskrit literature, and to do even so much is the labor of a European's lifetime. Hence, people judge hastily, and often make the most ridiculous blunders. Quite recently a certain Reverend Dunlop Moore, of New Brighton, Pennsylvania, determined to show his cleverness and piety at a single stroke, attacked the statement made by a theosophist in a discourse delivered at the cremation of Baron de Palm, that the code of man who existed a thousand years before Moses. All Orientalists of any note, he says, are now agreed that the Institutes of Manu were written at different times. The oldest part of the collection probably dates from the 6th century before the Christian era. Whatever other Orientalists, encountered by this Pennsylvania pundit, may think, Sir William Jones is of a different opinion. It is clear, he says, that the laws of Manu, such as we possess them, and which comprise but 680 shlokas, cannot be the work attributed to Samadhi, which is probably that described under the name of Vritamanava, or ancient code of Manu, which has not yet been entirely reconstructed, although many passages of the book have been preserved by tradition, and are often cited by commentators. We read in the preface to a treatise on legislation by Narda, says Jacolio, written by one of his adepts, a client of Brahmanical power, Manu having written the laws of Brahma, and one hundred thousand shlokas, or distichs, which form twenty-four books in a thousand chapters, gave the work to Narda, the sage of sages, who abridged it for the use. p. 586. Of mankind to twelve thousand verses, which he gave to his son of Brigau, named Samadhi, who, for the greater convenience of man, reduced them to four thousand. Here we have the opinion of Sir William Jones, who, in 1794, 
affirm that the fragments in possession of the Europeans could not be the ancient code of Manu, and that of Louis Jacques Leo, who, in 1868, after consulting all the authorities, and adding to them the result of his own long and patient research, writes the following, the Hindu laws were codified by Manu more than 3,000 years before the Christian era, copied by the whole of antiquity, and notably by Rome, which alone has left us a written law the Code of Justinian, which has been adopted as the basis of all modern legislations. In another volume, entitled Christnet of Christ, and a scientific arraignment of a pious, albeit very learned Catholic antagonist, M. Texter de Ravizi, who seeks to prove that the orthography of the name Krishna is not warranted by its Sanskrit spelling and has the worst of it Jocalio remarks, we know that the legislator Manu is lost in the night of the anti-historical period of India, and that no Indianess has dared to refuse him the title of the most ancient lawgiver in the world. P. 350. But Jacqueleo had not heard of the Reverend Dunlop Moore. This is why, perhaps, he and several other Indiologists are preparing to prove that many of the Vedic texts, as well as those of Manu, sent to Europe by the Asiatic Society of Calcutta, are not genuine texts at all, but mostly due to the cunning tentative efforts of certain Jesuit missionaries to mislead science, by the help of apocryphal works calculated at once to throw upon the history of ancient India a cloud of uncertainty and darkness and on the modern Brahmins and pundits a suspicion of systematical interpolation. These facts, he adds, which are so well established in India that they are not even brought in question, must be revealed to Europe. Krishna of Christ, p. 347. Moreover, the Code of Manu, known to European Orientalists as that one which is commented upon by Brighau, does not even form a part of the ancient Manu called the Vrita Manava. Although but small fragments of it have been discovered by our scientists, it does exist as a whole in certain temples, and Jacqueleo proves that the texts sent to Europe disagree entirely with the same texts as found in the pagodas of southern India. We can also cite for our purpose Sir William Jones, who, complaining of Calica, remarks that the latter seems in his commentaries to have never considered that the laws of Manu are restricted to the first three ages, translation of Manu and commentaries. P. 587. According to computation we are now in the age of Kali Yug, the third, reckoning from that of Satya or Kriteyug, first age in which Hindu tradition establishes the laws of Manu, and the authenticity of which Sir William Jones implicitly accepted. Admitting all that may be said as to the enormous exaggerations of Hindu chronology which, by the by, dovetails far better with modern geology and anthropology than the 6,000 years caricature chronology of the Jewish scripture still as about 4,500 years have elapsed since the fourth age of the world, or Kali Yub, began, we have here a proof that one of the greatest orientalists that ever lived in a Christian in the bargain, not a theosophist believed that man who is many thousand years older than Moses. Clearly one of two things should happen, either Indian history should be remodeled for the Presbyterian banner, or the writers for that she should study Hindu literature before trying their hand again at criticism of theosophists. But apart from the private opinions of these reverend gentlemen whose views very little concern us, we find even in the New American Cyclopedia a decided tendency to dispute the antiquity and importance of the Hindu literature. The laws of Manu, says one of the writers, do not date earlier than the 3rd century BC this term is a very elastic one. If by the laws of Manu the writer means the abridgment of these laws, compiled and arranged by later Brahmins to serve as an authority for their ambitious projects, and with an idea of creating for themselves a rule of domination, then, in such a sense, they may be right, though we are prepared to dispute even that. At all events it is as little proper to pass off this abridgment for the genuine old laws codified by Manu, as to assert that the Hebrew Bible does not date earlier than the 10th century of our era, because we have no Hebrew manuscript older than that or that the poems of Homer's Iliad were neither known nor written before its first authenticated manuscript was found. There is no Sanskrit manuscript in the possession of European scholars much older than four or five centuries, a fact which should not in the least restrain them from assigning to the Vedas an antiquity of between four or five thousand years. There are the strongest possible arguments in favor of the great antiquity of the books of Manu, and without going to the trouble of quoting the opinions of various scholars, no two of whom agree, we will bring forward our own at least as regards this most unwarranted assertion of the Cyclopedia. If, as Jacqueleo proves, text in hand, the Code of Justinian was copied from the laws of Manu, we have first of all to ascertain the age of the p. 588. Former, not as a written and perfect code, but its origin. To answer, is not difficult we believe. According to Varro, 
Rome was built in 3961 of the Julian period, 754 BC. The Roman law as embodied by Order of Justinian, and known as the Corpus Juris Civilis, was not a code, we are told, but a digest of the customs of legislation of many centuries. Though nothing is actually known of the original authorities, the chief source from which the Jew scriptum, or written law, was derived, was the Jew non scriptum, or the law of custom. Now it is just on this law of custom that we are prepared to base our arguments. The law of the Twelve Tables, moreover, was compiled about AUC 300, and even this as respects private law was compiled from still earlier sources. Therefore, if these earlier sources are found to agree so well with the laws of Manu, which the Brahmins claim to have been codified in the Kirtayog, an age anterior to the actual Kali Yug, then we must suppose that the source of the Twelve Tables, as laws of custom and tradition, are at least, by several hundred years, older than their copyists. This, alone, carries us right back to more than 1,000 years BC. The Manava Dharma Sastra, embodying the Hindu system of cosmogony, is recognized as next to the Vedas in antiquity, and even Kohlberg assigns the latter to the 15th century BC and, now, what is the etymology of the name of Manava Dharma Sastra? It is a word compounded of Manu, Dharma, Institute, and Sastra, Commander Law. How then can Manu's laws date only since the 3rd century before our Christian era? The Hindu code had never laid any claims to be divinely revealed. The distinction made by the Brahmins themselves between the Vedas and every other sacred book of however respectable in antiquity, is a proof of it. While every sect holds the Vedas as the direct word of God's Sruti, Revelation, the code of Manu is designated by them simply as the Smriti, a collection of oral traditions. Still these traditions, or recollections, are among the oldest as well as the most revered in the land. But, perhaps, the strongest argument in favor of its antiquity, and the general esteem in which it is held, lies in the following fact. The Brahmins have undeniably remodeled these traditions at some distant period, and made many of the actual laws, as they now stand in the Code of Manu, to answer their ambitious views. Therefore, they must have done it at a time when the burning of widows, sati, was neither practiced nor intended to be which it has been for nearly 2,500 years. No more than in the Vedas is there any such atrocious law mentioned in the Code of Manu, who, unless he is completely unacquainted with the history of India, but knows that this country was once on the verge of a p. 589. Religious rebellion occasioned by the prohibition of sati by the English government? The Brahmins appealed to a verse from the Rigveda which commanded it. But this verse has been recently proved to have been falsified. Had the Brahmins been the sole authors of the Code of Manu, or had they codified it entirely instead of simply filling it with interpolations to answer their object not earlier than the time of Alexander, how is it possible that they would have neglected this most important point, and so imperiled its authority? This fact alone proves that the Code must be counted one of their most ancient books. It is on the strength of such circumstantial evidence that of reason and logic that we affirm that, if Egypt furnished Greece with her civilization, and the latter bequeathed hers to Rome, Egypt herself had, in those unknown ages when Menes reigned, received her laws, her social institutions, her arts and her sciences, from pre-Vedic India, and that therefore, it is in that old initiation of the priest adepts of all the other countries we must seek for the key to the great mysteries of humanity. And when we say, indiscriminately, India, we do not mean the India of our modern days, but that of the archaic period. In those ancient times countries which are now known to us by other names were all called India. There was an upper, a lower, and a western India, the latter of which is now Persia Iran. The countries now named Tibet, Mongolia, and Great Tartary, were also considered by the ancient writers as India. We will now give a legend in relation to those places which science now fully conceives to have been the cradle of humanity. Tradition says, and the records of the great book explain, that long before the days of Adam, and his inquisitive wife, Heva, where now are found but salt lakes and desolate barren deserts, there was a vast inland sea, which extended over Middle Asia, north of the proud Himalayan range, and its western prolongation. An island, which for its unparalleled beauty had no rival in the world, was inhabited by the last remnant of the race which preceded ours. This race could live with equal ease in water, air, or fire, for it had an unlimited control over the elements. These were the sons of God not those who saw the daughters of men, but the real Elohim, though in the Oriental Kabbalah they have another name. It was they who imparted nature's most weird secrets to men, 
and revealed to them the ineffable, and now lost word. P. 590. This word, which is no word, has traveled once around the globe, and still lingers as a far off dying echo in the hearts of some privileged men. The hierophants of all the sacerdotal colleges were aware of the existence of this island, but the word was known only to the Java Alim, or chief lord of every college, and was passed to his successor only at the moment of death. There were many such colleges, and the old classic authors speak of them. We have already seen that it is one of the universal traditions accepted by all the ancient peoples that there were many races of men anterior to our present races. Each of these was distinct from the one which preceded it, and each disappeared as the following appeared. In Manu, six such races are plainly mentioned as having succeeded each other. From this Manu Swayam Huva, the minor, and answering to Adam Codman, issued from Swayam Huva, or the being existing through himself, descended six other manas, men typifying progenitors, each of whom gave birth to a race of men. These manas, all powerful, of whom Swayam Huva is the first, have each, in his period Antara produced and directed this world composed of movable and unmovable beings, Manu, Book I. In the Shiva Purana, it runs thus. O Shiva, thou god of fire, mayest thou destroy my sins, as the bleaching grass of the jungle is destroyed by fire. It is through thy mighty breath that Adhima, the first man, and Hiva, completion of life, in Sanskrit, the ancestors of this race of men have received life and covered the world with their descendants. There was no communication with the fair island by sea, but subterranean passages known only to the chiefs, communicated with it in all directions. Tradition points to many of the majestic ruins of India, Alora, Elephanta, and the caverns of Ajanta, Chandel Range, which belonged once to those colleges, and with which were connected such subterranean ways. Who can tell but the lost Atlantis which is also? p. 591. Mentioned in the secret book, but, again, under another name, pronounced in the sacred language did not exist yet in those days? The great lost continent might have, perhaps, been situated south of Asia, extending from India to Tasmania? If the hypothesis now so much doubted, and positively denied by some learned authors who regard it as a joke of Plato's, is ever verified, then, perhaps, will the scientists believe that the description of the God-inhabited continent was not altogether fable. And they may then perceive that Plato's guarded hints in the fact of his attributing the narrative to Solon and the Egyptian priests, were but a prudent way of imparting the fact to the world and by cleverly combining truth and fiction to disconnect himself from a story which the obligations imposed at initiation forbade him to divulge. And how could the name of Atlanta itself originate with Plato at all? Alblante is not a Greek name, and its construction has nothing of the Grecian element in it. Brasser de Borbord tried to demonstrate it years ago, and Baldwin, in his prehistoric nations in ancient America, cites the former, who declares that the words Atlas and Atlantic have no satisfactory etymology in any language known in Europe. They are not Greek, and cannot be referred to any known language of the Old World. But in the Nahuatl, or Toltec, language we find immediately the radical A, ATL, which signifies water, war, and the top of the head. From this comes a series of words, such as Atlan, or the border of or amid the water, from which we have the adjective Atlantic. We have also Atlica, to combat. A city named Atlan existed when the continent was discovered by Columbus, at the entrance of the Gulf of Urea in Darien, with a good harbor. It is now reduced to an unimportant pueblo, village, named Aclo. Is it not, to say the least, very extraordinary to find in America a city called by a name which contains a purely local element, born moreover to every other country, in the alleged fiction of a philosopher of four hundred years B.C.? The same may be said of the name of America, which may one day be found more closely related to Meru, the sacred mount in the center of the seven continents, according to the Hindu tradition, than to Americus Vespucius, whose name by the by, was never Americus at all, but Albericus, a trifling difference not deemed worth mentioning till very lately by exact history. We adduce the following reasons in favor of our argument. p. 592. First, American, Amerique, or Amerique is a name in Nicaragua for the high land or mountain range that lies between Huigalpa and Libertad, in the province of Chantales, and which reaches on the one side into the country of the Carcass Indians, and on the other side into the country of the Ramus Indians. Ik or Ik, as a terminal, means great, as Cacique, etc. Columbus mentions, in his fourth voyage, 
the village Koreai, probably Sai Sai. The people abounded with sorcerers, or medicine men, and this was the region of the American range, 3,000 feet high. Yet he omits to mention this word. The name America Provincia first appeared on a map published at Ball, in 1522. Till that time, the region was believed to be part of India. That year Nicaragua was conquered by Gil Gonzalez de Avita. 2d. The Northmen who visited the continent in the 10th century, a low-level coast thickly covered with wood, called it Markland, from Mark, a wood. There had a rolling sound as in Merrick. A similar word is found in the country of the Himalayas, and the name of the world mountain, Meru, is pronounced in some dialects as Merwa, the letter H being strongly aspirated. The main idea is, however, to show how two peoples could possibly accept a word of similar sound, each having used it in their own sense, and finding it applied to the same territory. It is most plausible, says Professor Wilder, that the state of Central America, where we find the name American signifying, like the Hindu Mara we may add, Great Mountain, gave the continent its name. Vespucius would have used his surname if he had designed to give a title to a continent. If the Abbe de Bourbourg's theory of Atlan as the source of Atlas and Atlantic is verified, the two hypotheses could agree most charmingly. As Plato was not the only writer that treated of a world beyond the pillars of Hercules, and as the ocean is still shallow and grows seaweed all through the tropical part of the Atlantic, it is not wild to imagine that this continent projected, or that there was an island world on that coast. The Pacific also shows signs of having been a populous island empire of Malays or Javanese if not a continent amid the north and south. We know that Lemuria and the Indian Ocean is a dream of scientists, and that the Sahara and the middle belt of Asia were perhaps one seabeds. To continue the tradition, we have to add that the class of Hierophants, p. 593, was divided into two distinct categories, those who were instructed by the sons of God, of the island and who were initiated in the divine doctrine of pure revelation, and others who inhabited the lost Atlantis if such must be its name and who, being of another race, were born with a sight which embraced all hidden things, and was independent of both distance and material obstacle. In short, they were the fourth race of men mentioned in the Popol Vuh, whose sight was unlimited and who knew all things at once. They were, perhaps, what we would now term natural-born mediums, who neither struggled nor suffered to obtain their knowledge, nor did they acquire it at the price of any sacrifice. Therefore, while the former walked in the path of their divine instructors, and in acquiring their knowledge by degrees, learned at the same time to discern the evil from the good, the born adepts of the Atlantis blindly followed the insinuations of the great and invisible dragon, the king the Vedat, the serpent of Genesis. The Vedat had neither learned nor acquired knowledge, but, to borrow an expression of Dr. Wilder in relation to the tempting serpent, he was a sort of Socrates who knew without being initiated. Thus, under the evil insinuations of their demon, the Vedat, the Atlantis race became a nation of wicked magicians. In consequence of this, war was declared, the story of which would be too long to narrate, its substance may be found in the disfigured allegories of the race of Cain, the giants, and that of Noah and his righteous family. The conflict came to an end by the submersion of the Atlantis, which finds its imitation in the stories of the Babylonian and Mosaic flood, the giants and magicians, and all flesh died, and every man. All except Suthrus and Noah, who are substantially identical with the great father of the Thlankithians in the Popol Vuh, or the sacred book of the Guatemalians, which also tells of his escaping in a large boat, like the Hindu Noah Vaiswasvata. If we believe the tradition at all, we have to credit the further story that from the intermarrying of the progeny of the Hierophants of the island and the descendants of the Atlantean Noah, sprang up a mixed race of righteous and wicked. On the one side the world had its Enochs, Moseses, Gautama Buddhas, its numerous saviors, and great Hierophants, on the other hand, its natural magicians who, through lack of the restraining power of proper spiritual enlightenment, and because of weakness of physical and mental organizations, unintentionally perverted their gifts to evil purposes. Moses had no word of rebuke for those adepts in prophecy and other powers who had been instructed in the colleges of esoteric wisdom mentioned in the Bible. His denunciations, p. 594, were reserved for such as either wittingly or otherwise debased the powers inherited from their Atlantean ancestors to the service of evil spirits, to the injury of humanity. His wrath was kindled against the spirit of Obi, not that of Od. p. 595. The ruins which cover both Americas, and are found on many West Indian islands, 
are all attributed to the submerged Atlanteans, as well as the Hierophants of the Old World, which in the days of Atlantis was almost connected with the new one by land, the magicians of the now submerged country had a network of subterranean passages running in all directions. In connection with those mysterious catacombs we will now give a curious story told to us by a Peruvian, long since dead, as we were traveling together in the interior of his country. There must be truth in it, as it was afterward confirmed to us by an Italian gentleman who had seen the place and who, but for lack of means and time, would have verified the tale himself, at least partially. The informant of the Italian was an old priest, who had the secret divulged to him, at confession, by a Peruvian Indian. We may add, moreover, that the priest was compelled. p. 596. To make the revelation, being at the time completely under the mesmeric influence of the traveler. The story concerns the famous treasures of the last of the Incas. The Peruvian asserted that since the well-known and miserable murder of the latter by Pizarro, the secret had been known to all the Indians, except the mestizos who could not be trusted. It runs thus, the Inca was made prisoner, and his wife offered for his liberation a room full of gold, from the floor up to the ceiling, as high up as his conqueror could reach before the sun would set on the third day. She kept her promise, but Pizarro broke his word, according to Spanish practice. Marveling at the exhibition of such treasures, the conqueror declared that he would not release the prisoner, but would murder him, unless the queen revealed the place whence the treasure came. He had heard that the Incas had somewhere an inexhaustible mine, a subterranean road or tunnel running many miles underground, where were kept the accumulated riches of the country. The unfortunate queen begged for delay, and went to consult the oracles. During the sacrifice, the chief priest showed her in the consecrated black mare the unavoidable murder of her husband, whether she delivered the treasures of the crown to Pizarro or not. Then the queen gave the order to close the entrance, which was a door cut in the rocky wall of a chasm. Under the direction of the priests and magicians, the chasm was accordingly filled to the top with huge masses of rock, and the surface covered over so as to conceal the work. The Inca was murdered by the Spaniards and his unhappy queen committed suicide. Spanish greed overreached itself and the secret of the buried treasures was locked in the breasts of a few faithful Peruvians. Our Peruvian informant added that in consequence of certain indiscretions at various times, persons had been sent by different governments to search for the treasure under the pretext of scientific exploration. They had rummaged the country through, but without realizing their object. So far this tradition is corroborated by the reports of Dr. Chuddy and other historians of Peru. But there are certain additional details which we are not aware have been made public before now. p. 597. Several years after hearing the story, in its corroboration by the Italian gentleman, we again visited Peru. Going southward from Lima, by water, we reached a point near Arica at sunset, and were struck by the appearance of an enormous rock, nearly perpendicular, which stood in mournful solitude on the shore, apart from the range of the Andes. It was the tomb of the Incas. As the last rays of the setting sun strike the face of the rock, one can make out, with an ordinary opera glass, some curious hieroglyphics inscribed on the volcanic surface. When Cusco was the capital of Peru, it contained a temple of the sun, famed far and near for its magnificence. It was roofed with thick plates of gold, and the walls were covered with the same precious metal, the eave troughs were also of solid gold. In the west wall the architects had contrived an aperture in such a way that when the sunbeams reached it, it focused them inside the building. Stretching like a golden chain from one sparkling point to another, they encircled the walls, illuminating the grim idols, and disclosing certain mystic signs at other times invisible. It was only by understanding these hieroglyphics identical with those which may be seen to this day on the tomb of the Incas that one could learn the secret of the tunnel and its approaches. Among the latter was one in the neighborhood of Cusco, now massed beyond discovery. This leads directly into an immense tunnel which runs from Cusco to Lima, and then, turning southward, extends into Bolivia. At a certain point it is intersected by a royal tomb. Inside the sepulchral chamber are cunningly arranged two doors, or, rather, two enormous slabs which turn upon pivots, and close so tightly as to be only distinguishable from the other portions of the sculptured walls by the secret signs, whose key is in the possession of the faithful custodians. One of these turning slabs covers the southern mouth of the Lehman Tunnel the other, the northern one of the Bolivian Quarter. The latter, running southward, passes through Trapaca and Cobijo, for Arica is not far away from the little river called Pequino, which is the boundary between Peru and Bolivia. 
Not far from the spot stand three separate peaks which form a curious triangle. They are included in the chain of the Andes. According to tradition, the only practicable entrance to the corridor leading northward is in one of these peaks, but without the secret of its landmarks, a regiment of titans might rend the rocks in vain in the attempt to find it. But even were someone to gain an entrance and find his way as far as the turning slab in the wall of the sepulchre, an attempt to blast it out. P. 598. The superincumbent rocks are so disposed as to bury the tomb, its treasures, and as the mysterious Peruvian expressed it to us a thousand warriors in one common ruin. There is no other access to the Eureka chamber but through the door in the mountain near Pequina. Along the entire length of the corridor, from Bolivia to Lima and Cusco, are smaller hiding places filled with treasures of gold and precious stone, the accumulations of many generations of Incas, the aggregate value of which is incalculable. We have in our possession an accurate plan of the tunnel, the sepulchre, and the doors given to us at the time by the old Peruvian. If we had ever thought of profiting by the secret, it would have required the cooperation of the Peruvian and Bolivian governments on an extensive scale. To say nothing of physical obstacles, no one individual or small party could undertake such an exploration without encountering the army of smugglers and brigands with which the coast is infested, and which, in fact, includes nearly the whole population. The mere task of purifying the mephitic air of the tunnel, which had not been entered for centuries, would also be a serious one. There, however, the treasure lies, and there the tradition says it will lie till the last vestige of Spanish rule disappears from the whole of North and South America. The treasures exhumed by Dr. Schliemann at Mycenae have awakened popular cupidity, and the eyes of adventurous speculators are being turned toward the localities where the wealth of ancient peoples is supposed to be buried, in crypt or cave, or beneath sand or alluvial deposit. Round no other locality, not even Peru, hang so many traditions as around the Gobi Desert. An independent Tartary this howling waste of shifting sand was once, if report speaks correctly, the seat of one of the richest empires the world ever saw. Beneath the surface are said to lie such wealth in gold, jewels, statuary, arms, utensils, and all that indicates civilization, luxury, and fine arts, as no existing capital of Christendom can show today. The Gobi sand moves regularly from east to west before terrific gales that blow continually. Occasionally some of the hidden treasures are uncovered, but not a native dare touch them, for the whole district is under the ban of a mighty spell. Death would be the penalty. Body hideous, but faithful gnomes guard the hidden treasures of this prehistoric people, awaiting the day when the revolution of cyclic periods shall again cause their story to be known for the instruction of mankind. According to local tradition, the tomb of Genghis Khan still exists near Lake Tabasanor. Within lies the Mongolian Alexander, as though asleep. After three more centuries he will awake and lead his people to new victories and another harvest of glory. Though this prophetic. P. 599. Tradition be received with ever so many grains of salt, we can affirm as a fact that the tomb itself is no fiction, nor has its amazing richness been exaggerated. The district of the Gobi Wilderness and, in fact, the whole area of independent Tartary and Tibet is jealously guarded against foreign intrusion. Those who are permitted to traverse it are under the particular care and pilotage of certain agents of the chief authority, and are in duty bound to convey no intelligence respecting places and persons to the outside world. But for this restriction, even we might contribute to these pages accounts of exploration, adventure, and discovery that would be read with interest. The time will come sooner or later, when the dreadful sand of the desert will yield up its long-buried secrets, and then there will indeed be unlooked for mortifications for our modern vanity. The people of Passai, says Marco Polo, the daring traveler of the 13th century, are great adepts in sorceries and the diabolic arts. And his learned editor adds, this Passai, or Diana, was the native country of Padma Sumbhava, one of the chief apostles of Lamaism, i.e., of Tibetan Buddhism, and a great master of enchantments. The doctrines of Sakya, as they prevailed in Udayana in old times, were probably strongly tinged with Shivadic magic, and the Tibetans still regard the locality as the classic ground of sorcery and witchcraft. The old times are just like the modern times, nothing has changed as the magical practices except that they have become still more esoteric and arcane, and that the caution of the adepts increases in proportion to the traveler's curiosity. Yuan Song says of the inhabitants, the men, are fond of study, but pursue it with no ardor. The science of magical formulae has become a regular professional business with them. 
We will not contradict the venerable Chinese pilgrim on this point, and are willing to admit that in the 7th century some people made a professional business of magic, so, also, do some people now, but certainly not the true adepts. It is not he Wen Song, the pious, courageous man, who risked his life a hundred times to have the bliss of perceiving Buddha's shadow in the cave of Peshawar, who would have accused the holy Lamas and monkish thaumaturgists of making a professional business of showing it to travelers. The injunction of Gautama, contained in his answer to King Prezinadid, his protector, who called on him to perform miracles, must have been ever. p. 600. Present to the mind of Yuan Song. Great King, said Gautama, I do not teach the law to my pupils, telling them go, ye saints, and before the eyes of the Brahmins and householders perform, by means of your supernatural powers, miracles greater than any man can perform. I tell them, when I teach them the law, live, ye saints, hiding your good works, and showing your sins. Struck with the accounts of magical exhibitions witnessed and recorded by travelers of every age who had visited Tartary and Tibet, Colonel Yu comes to the conclusion that the natives must have had at their command the whole encyclopedia of modern spiritualists. Dwalde mentions among their sorceries the art of producing by their invocations the figures of Laotzin and their divinities in the air, and of making a pencil write answers to questions without anybody touching it. The former invocations pertain to religious mysteries of their sanctuaries, if done otherwise, or for the sake of gain, they are considered sorcery, necromancy, and strictly forbidden. The latter art, that of making a pencil write without contact, was known and practiced in China and other countries centuries before the Christian era. It is the ABC of magic in those countries. When Yuan Song desired to adore the shadow of Buddha, it was not to professional magicians that he resorted but to the power of his own soul invocation, the power of prayer, faith, and contemplation. All was dark and dreary near the cavern in which the miracle was alleged to take place sometimes. Yuan Song entered and began his devotions. He made one hundred salutations, but neither saw nor heard anything. Then, thinking himself too sinful, he cried bitterly, and despaired. But as he was going to give up all hope, he perceived on the eastern wall a feeble light, but it disappeared. He renewed his prayers, full of hope this time, and again he saw the light, which flashed and disappeared again. After this he made a solemn vow, he would not leave the cave till he had the rapture to see at last the shadow of the venerable of the age. He had to wait longer after this, for only after two hundred prayers was the dark cave suddenly bathed in light, and the shadow of Buddha, of a brilliant white color, rose majestically on the wall, as when the clouds suddenly open, and, all at once, display the marvelous image of the mountain of light. A dazzling splendor lighted up the features of the divine countenance. Yuan Song was lost in contemplation and wonder, and would not turn his eyes away from the sublime and incong. p. 601. Parable Object. Yuan Song adds in his own diary, see Yuki, that it is only when man prays with sincere faith, and if he has received from above a hidden impression, that he sees the shadow clearly but he cannot enjoy the sight for any length of time. Those who are so ready to accuse the Chinese of irreligion will do well to read Schott's essays on Buddhism in China and Upper Asia. In the years Yuan Yu of the Song, AD 1086-1093, a pious matron with her two servants lived entirely to the land of enlightenment. One of the maids said one day to her companion, Tonight I shall pass over to the realm of Amida, Buddha. The same night a balsamic odor filled the house and the maid died without any preceding illness. On the following day the surviving maid said to her lady, Yesterday my deceased companion appeared to me in a dream, and said, Thanks to the persevering supplications of our dear mistress, I am become an inhabitant of paradise, and my blessedness is past all expression in words. The matron replied, If she will appear to me also, then will I believe all you say. The next night the deceased really appeared to her. The lady asked, May I, for once, visit the land of enlightenment? Yea, answered the blessed soul, thou hast but to follow thine handmaiden. The lady followed her, and her dream, and soon perceived the lake of immeasurable expanse, overspread with innumerable red and white lotus flowers, of various sizes, some blooming, some fading. She asked what those flowers might signify? The maiden replied, these are all human beings on the earth whose thoughts are turned to the land of enlightenment. The very first longing after the paradise of Amida produces a flower in the celestial lake, and this becomes daily larger and more glorious as the self-improvement of the person whom it represents advances. In the contrary case, it loses in glory and fades away. 
The matron desired to know the name of an enlightened one who reposed on one of the flowers, clad in a waving and wondrously glistening raiment. Her wild maiden answered, That is Yang Kai. Then asked she the name of another, and was answered, That is Maho. P. 602. The lady then said, At what place shall I hereafter come into existence? Then the blessed soul led her a space further, and showed her a hill that gleamed with gold and azure. Here, said she, is your future abode. You will belong to the first order of the blessed. When the matron awoke, she sent to inquire for Yang Kai and Mahu. The first was already departed, the other still alive and well. And thus the lady learned that the soul of one who advances in holiness and never turns back, may be already a dweller in the land of enlightenment, even though the body still sojourned in this transitory world. In the same essay, another Chinese story is translated, and to the same effect, I knew a man, says the author, who during his life had killed many living beings, and was at last struck with an apoplexy. The sorrows in store for his sin-laden soul pained me to the heart. I visited him, and exhorted him to call on the Amida, but he obstinately refused. His illness clouded his understanding, in consequence of his misdeeds he had become hardened. What was before such a man when once his eyes were closed? In this life the night followeth the day, and the winter followeth the summer, that, all men are aware of. But that life is followed by death, no man will consider. Oh, what blindness and obduracy is this! p. 93. These two instances of Chinese literature hardly strengthen the usual charge of irreligion and total materialism brought against the nation. The first little mystical story is full of spiritual charm, and would grace any Christian religious book. The second is as worthy of praise, and we have but to replace Amida with Jesus to have a highly orthodox tale, as regards religious sentiments and code of philosophical morality. The following instance is still more striking, and we quote it for the benefit of Christian revivalists. Huang Tatai, a Tankin, who lived under the sun, followed the craft of a blacksmith. Whenever he was at his work he used to call, without intermission, on the name of Amida Buddha. One day he handed to his neighbors the following verses of his own composition to be spread about. Ding dong! The hammer strokes fall long and fast. Until the iron turns to seal at last. Now shall the long, long day of rest begin. The land of bliss eternal calls me in. Thereupon he died. But his verses spread all over Honan, and many learned to call upon Buddha. To deny to the Chinese or any people of Asia, whether central. P. 603. Upper, or lower, the possession of any knowledge, or even perception of spiritual things, is perfectly ridiculous. From one end to the other the country is full of mystics, religious philosophers, Buddhist saints, and magicians. Belief in a spiritual world, full of invisible beings who, on certain occasions, appear to mortals objectively, is universal. According to the belief of the nations of Central Asia, remarks I. J. Schmidt, the earth and its interior, as well as the encompassing atmosphere, are filled with spiritual beings, which exercise an influence, partly beneficent, partly malignant, on the whole of organic and inorganic nature. Especially are deserts and other wild or uninhabited tracts, or regions in which the influences of nature are displayed on a gigantic and terrible scale, regarded as the chief abode or rendezvous of evil spirits. And hence the steppes of Turan and in particular the great sandy desert of Gobi have been looked on as the dwelling place of malignant beings, from days of hoary antiquity. Marco Polo as a matter of course mentions more than once in his curious book of travels, these tricky nature spirits of the deserts. For centuries, and especially in the last one, had his strange stories been completely rejected. No one would believe him when he said he had witnessed, time and again, with his own eyes, the most wonderful feats of magic performed by the subjects of Kublai Khan and adepts of other countries. On his deathbed Marco was strongly urged to retract his alleged falsehoods, but he solemnly swore to the truth of what he said, adding that he had not told one half of what he had really seen. There is now no doubt that he spoke the truth, since Marsden's edition, and that of Colonel Yule have appeared. The public is especially beholden to the latter for bringing forward so many authorities corroborative of Marco's testimony and explaining some of the phenomena in the usual way, for he makes it plain beyond question that the great traveler was not only a voracious but an exceedingly observant writer. Warmly defending his author, the conscientious editor, after enumerating more than one hitherto controverted and even rejected point in the Venetian's travels, concludes by saying, Nay, 
The last two years have thrown a promise of light even on what seemed the wildest of Marco's stories, and the bones of a veritable ruck from New Zealand lie on the table of Professor Owen's cabinet. The monstrous bird of the Arabian Nights, or Arabian mythology, as Webster calls the ruck, or rock, having been identified, the next thing in order is to discover and recognize that Aladdin's magical lamp has also certain claims to reality. p. 604. Describing this passage through the great desert of Lop, Marco Polo speaks of a marvelous thing, which is that, when travelers are on the move by night, they will hear spirits talking. Sometimes the spirits will call him by name, even in the daytime one hears these spirits talking. And sometimes you shall hear the sound of a variety of musical instruments, and still more commonly the sound of drums. In his notes, the translator quotes the Chinese historian, Matt Wanlin, who corroborates the same. During the passage of this wilderness you hear sounds, says Matt Wanlin, sometimes of singing, sometimes of wailing, and it has often happened that travelers going aside to see what those sounds might be, have strayed from their course and been entirely lost, for they were voices of spirits and goblins. These goblins are not peculiar to the Gobi, as the editor, though that appears to have been their most favored haunt. The awe of the vast and solitary desert raises them in all similar localities. Colonel Yu would have done well to consider the possibility of serious consequences arising from the acceptance of his theory. If we admit that the weird cries of the Gobi are due to the awe inspired by the vast and solitary desert, why should the goblins of the Gadarenes, Luke 8, 29, be entitled to any better consideration? And why may not Jesus have been self-deceived as to his objective tempter during the forty days' trial in the wilderness? We are quite ready to receive or reject the theory enunciated by Colonel Yu, but shall insist upon its impartial application to all cases. Pliny speaks of the phantoms that appear and vanish in the deserts of Africa, Ithaca, the early Christian cosmographer, mentions, though incredulous, the stories that were told of the voices of singers and revelers in the desert, and Masudi tells of the ghouls, which in the deserts appeared to travelers by night and in lonely hours, and also of Apollonius of Tiana and his companions, who, in a desert near the Indus by moonlight, saw an ampusa or ghoul taking many forms. They were violet, and it goes off uttering shrill cries. And Ibn Battuta relates a like legend of the Western Sahara, if the messenger be solitary, the demons sport with him and fascinate him, so that he strays from his course and perishes. Now if all these matters are capable of a rational explanation, and we do not doubt it as regards most of these cases, then, the Bible devils of the wilderness deserve no more consideration, but should have the same rule applied to them. They, too, are creatures of terror, imagination, and superstition. P. 605. Hence, the narratives of the Bible must be false, and if one single verse is false, then a cloud is thrown upon the title of all the rest to be considered divine revelation. Once admit this, and this collection of canonical documents is at least as amenable to criticism as any other book of stories. There are many spots in the world where the strangest phenomena have resulted from what was later ascertained to be natural physical causes. In Southern California there are certain places on the seashore where the sand when disturbed produces a loud musical ring. It is known as the musical sand, and the phenomenon is supposed to be of an electrical nature. The sound of musical instruments, chiefly of drums, is a phenomenon of another class, and is really produced in certain situations among sand hills when the sand is disturbed, says the editor of Marco Polo. A very striking account of a phenomenon of this kind, regarded as supernatural, is given by Friar Doric, whose experience I have traced to the red ruin or flowing sand north of Kabul. Besides this celebrated example, I have noted that equally well-known one of the Jebel Nakiks, or Hill of the Bell in the Sinai Desert, Drabul Thabul, or Hill of the Drums. A Chinese narrative of the 10th century mentions the phenomenon as known near Kwakau, on the eastern border of the Lop Desert, under the name of the Singing Sands. That all these are natural phenomena, no one can doubt. But what of the questions and answers, plainly and audibly given and received? What of conversations held between certain travelers and the invisible spirits, or unknown beings, that sometimes appear to hold caravans in tangible form? If so many millions believe in the possibility that spirits may clothe themselves with material bodies, behind the curtain of a medium, and appear to the circle, why should they reject the same possibility for the elemental spirits of the deserts? This is the to be. p. 606. Or not to be of Hamlet. If spirits can do all that spiritualists claim for them, 
Why can they not appear equally to the traveler in the wildernesses and solitudes? A recent scientific article in a Russian journal attributes such spirit voices, in the Great Gobi Desert, to the echo. A very reasonable explanation, if it can only be demonstrated that these voices simply repeat what has been previously uttered by a living person. But when the superstitious traveler gets intelligent answers to his questions, this Gobi echo at once shows a very near relationship with the famous echo of the theater port St. Martin at Paris. How do you do, sir? shouts one of the actors in the play. Very poorly, my son, thank you. I am getting old, very, very old. Politely answers the echo. What incredulous merriment must the superstitious and absurd narratives of Marco Polo, concerning the supernatural gifts of certain shark and wild beast charmers of India, whom he terms a Brahmin, have excited for long centuries. Describing the pearl fishery of Ceylon, as it was in his time, he says that the merchants are obliged also to pay those men who charm the great fishes to prevent them from injuring the divers whilst engaged in seeking pearls underwater one twentieth part of all that they take. These fish charmers are termed a Brahman, Braham, and their charm holds good for that day only, for at night they dissolve the charm, so that the fishes can work mischief at their will. These Abrahman know also how to charm beasts and birds, and every living thing. And this is what we find in the explanatory notes of Colonel Yule. In relation to this degrading Asiatic superstition, Marco's account of the pearl fishery is still substantially correct. At the diamond mines of the northern Sirkars, Brahmins are employed in the analogous office of propitiating the tutelary genii. The shark charmers are called in Tamil, Kadalkati, sea binders, and in Hindustani, Haibanda, or shark binders. At Arapo they belong to one family, supposed to have the monopoly of the charm. The chief operator is, or was, not many years ago, paid by the government, and he also received ten oysters from each boat daily during the fishery. Tenant, on his visit, found the incumbent of the office to be a Roman Catholic Christian, but that did not seem to affect the exercise of the validity of his functions. It is remarkable that not more than one authenticated accident from sharks had taken place during the whole period of the British occupation. Two items of fact in the above paragraph are worthy of being. p. 607. Place in juxtaposition. 1. The British authorities pay professional shark charmers a stipend to exercise their art, and, 2. Only one life has been lost since the execution of the contract. We have yet to learn whether the loss of this one life did not occur under the Roman Catholic sorcerer, is it pretended that the salary is paid as a concession to a degrading native superstition? Very well, but how about the sharks? Are they receiving salaries? Also, from the British authorities out of the Secret Service Fund? Every person who has visited Ceylon must know that the waters of the Pearl Coast swarm with sharks of the most voracious kind, and that it is even dangerous to bathe, let alone to dive for oysters. We might go further, if we chose, and give the names of British officials of the highest rank in the Indian service, who, after resorting to native magicians and sorcerers, to assist them in recovering things lost, or in unraveling vexatious mysteries of one kind or another, and being successful, and at the time secretly expressing their gratitude, have gone away, and shown their innate cowardice before the world's Areopagus, by publicly denying the truth of magic, and leading the jest against Hindu superstition. Not many years ago, one of the worst of superstitions scientists held to be that of believing that the murderer's portrait remained impressed on the eye of the murdered person, and that the former could be easily recognized by examining carefully the retina. The superstition asserted that the likeness could be made still more striking by subjecting the murdered man to certain old women's fumigations, and the like gossip. And now an American newspaper, of March 26, 1877, says, A number of years ago attention was attracted to a theory which insisted that the last effort of vision materialized itself and remained as an object imprinted on the retina of the eye after death. This has been proved the fact by an experiment tried in the presence of Dr. Gamgee, F. R. S. of Birmingham, England, and Professor Blunson, the subject being a living rabbit. The means taken to prove the merits of the question were most simple, the eyes being placed near an opening in a shutter, and retaining the shape of the same after the animal had been deprived of life. If, from the regions of idolatry, ignorance, and superstition, as India is termed by some missionaries, we turn to the so-called center of civilization Paris. We find the same principles of magic exemplified there under the name of occult spiritualism. The Honorable John L. O'Sullivan, ex-minister plenipotentiary of the United States to Portugal, 
has kindly furnished us with the strange particulars of a semi-magical seance which he recently attended with several other eminent men, at Paris. Having his permission to that effect, we print his letter in full. P. 608. New York, February 7, 1877. I cheerfully obey your request for a written statement of what I related to you orally, as having been witnessed by me in Paris, last summer, at the house of a highly respectable physician, whose name I have no authority to use, but whom, after the usual French fashion of anonymizing, I will call Dr. X. I was introduced there by an English friend, well known in the spiritualist circles in London Mr. Gladstains. Some eight or ten other visitors were present, of both sexes. We were seated in fauteuils, occupying half of a long drawing room, flush with a spacious garden. In the other half of the room was a grand piano, a considerable open space between it and us, and a couple of fauteuils in that space, evidently placed there to be occupied by other sitters. A door near them opened into the private apartments. Dr. X came in, and discoursed to us for about twenty minutes with rapid and vehement French eloquence, which I could not undertake to report. He had, for over twenty-five years, investigated occult mysteries, of which he was about to exhibit some phenomena. His object was to attract his brethren of the scientific world, but few or none of them came to see for themselves. He intended before long to publish a book. He presently led in two ladies, the younger one his wife, the other, whom I will call Madame Y, a medium or sensitive, with whom he had worked through all that period in the prosecution of these studies, and who had devoted and sacrificed her whole life to this work with him. Both these ladies had their eyes closed, apparently in trance. He stood them at the opposite ends of the long grand piano, which was shut, and directed them to put their hands upon it. Sound soon began to issue from its chords, marching, galloping, drums, trumpets, rolling musketry, cannon, cries, and groans in one word, a battle. This lasted, I should say, some five to ten minutes. I should have mentioned that before the two mediums were brought and I had written in pencil, on a small bit of paper, by direction of Mr. Gledstains, who had been there before, the names of three objects, to be known to myself alone, viz., some musical composer, deceased, a flower, and a cake. I chose Beethoven, a marguerite, daisy, and a kind of French cake called plombiers, and rolled the paper into a pellet, which I kept in my hand, without letting even my friend know its contents. When the battle was over, he placed Madame. Why? In one of the two fauteuils, Madame X being seated apart at one side of the room, and I was asked to hand my folded, or rolled, paper to Madame. Why? She held it, unopened, between her fingers, on her lap. She was dressed in white merino, flowing from her neck and gathered in at the waist, under a blaze of light from chandeliers on the right and left. After a while she dropped a little roll of paper to the floor, and I picked it up. Dr. X then raised her to her feet and told her to make the evocation of the dead. He withdrew the fauteuils and placed in her hand a steel rod of about four and a half or five feet in length, the top of which was surmounted with a short cross piece the Egyptian towel. With this she traced a circle round herself, as she stood, of about six feet in diameter. She did not hold the cross piece as a handle, but, on the contrary, she held the rod at the opposite end. She presently handed it back to Dr. X there she stood for some time her hands hanging down and folded together in front of her, motionless, and with her eyes directed slightly upward toward one of the opposite corners of the long salon. Her lips presently began to move, with muttered sounds, which after a while became distinct in articulation, and short broken sentences or phrases, very much like the recitation of a litany. Certain. P. 609. Words, seeming to be names, would recur from time to time. It sounded to me somewhat as I have heard oriental languages sound. Her face was very earnest and mobile with expression, with sometimes a slight frown on the brow. I suppose it lasted about fifteen or twenty minutes, amidst the motionless silence of all the company, as we gazed on the weird scene. Her utterance finally seemed to increase in vehemence and rapidity. At last she stretched forth one arm toward the space on which her eyes had been fixed, and, with a loud cry, almost a scream, she exclaimed, Fade of an exclamation mark and fell backward, prostrate on the floor. Dr. X hastened to her, made eager magnetic passes about her face and neck, and propped up her head and shoulders on cushions. And there she lay like a person sick and suffering, occasionally moaning, turning restlessly, etc. I suppose a full half-hour then elapsed, 
during which she seemed to pass through all the phases of gradual death. This I was told was a reenacting of the death of Beethoven. It would be long to describe in detail, even if I could recall all. We watched as though assisting at a scene of real death. I will only say that her pulse ceased, no beating of the heart could be perceived, her hands first, then her arms became cold, while warmth was still to be felt under her armpits, even they at last became entirely cold, her feet and legs became cold in the same manner, and they swelled astonishingly. The doctor invited us all to come and recognize these phenomena. The gasping breaths came at longer and longer intervals, and feebler and feebler. At last came the end, her head fell sidewise, her hands, which had been picking with the fingers about her dress, collapsed also. The doctor said, she is now dead and so it indeed seemed. In vehement haste he produced, I did not see from where, two small snakes, which he seemed to huddle about her neck and down into her bosom, making also eager transverse passes about her head and neck. After a while she appeared to revive slowly, and finally the doctor and a couple of men's servants lifted her up and carried her off into the private apartments, from which he soon returned. He told us that this was all very critical, but perfectly safe, but that no time was to be lost, for otherwise the death which he said was real, would be permanent. I need not say how ghastly the effect of this whole scene had been on all the spectators. Nor need I remind you that this was no trickery of a performer paid to astonish. The scene passed in the elegant drawing-room of a respectable physician, to which access without introduction is impossible, while, outside of the phenomenal facts, a thousand indescribable details of language, manner, expression, an action presented those minute guarantees of sincerity and earnestness which carry conviction to those who witness, though it may be transmitted to those who only hear or read of them. After a time Madame Y returned and was seated in one of the two fauteuils before mentioned, and I was invited to the other by her side. I had still in my hand the unopened pellet of paper containing the three words privately written by me, of which, Beethoven, had been the first. She sat for a few minutes with her open hands resting on her lap. They presently began to move restlessly about. Ah, it burns, it burns, she said, and her features contracted with an expression of pain. In a few moments she raised one of them, and it contained a marguerite, the flower I had written as my second word. I received it from her, and after it had been examined by the rest of the company, I preserved it. Dr. X said it was of a species not known in that part of the country, an opinion in which he was certainly mistaken, as a few days afterwards I saw the same in the flower market of the Madeleine. Whether this flower was produced under her hands, or was simply in a port, as in the phenomenon we are familiar with in the experiences of spiritualism, I do not know. It was the one or the other, for she certainly did not have it as she sat there by my side, under a strong light, before it. p. 610. Made its appearance. The flower was perfectly fresh in every one of its delicate petals. The third word I had written on my bit of paper was the name of a cake plombier's. She presently began to go through the motions of eating, though no cake was visible, and asked me if I would not go with her to plombier's the name of the cake I had written. This might have been simply a case of mind reading. After this followed a scene in which Madame X, the doctor's wife, was said, and seemed to be, possessed by the spirit of Beethoven. The doctor addressed her as Monsieur Beethoven. She took no notice until he called the name aloud in her ear. She then responded with polite bows, etc. You may remember that Beethoven was extremely deaf. After some conversation he begged her to play, and she seated herself at the piano and performed magnificently both some of his known music and some improvisations which were generally recognized by the company as in his style. I was told afterwards, by a lady friend of Madame X, that in a normal state she was a very ordinary amateur performer. After about half an hour spent in music and in dialogue in the character of Beethoven, to whom her face and expression, and her tumbled hair, seemed to acquire a strange resemblance, the doctor placed in her hands a sheet of paper and a crayon, and asked her to sketch the face of the person she saw before her. She produced very rapidly a profile sketch of a head and face resembling Beethoven's bust, though as a younger man, and she dashed off a rapid name under it, as though a signature, Beethoven. I have preserved the sketch, though how the handwriting may correspond with Beethoven's signature I cannot say. The hour was now late, and the company broke up, nor had I any time to interrogate Dr. X upon what we had thus witnessed. But I called on him with Mr. Gledstain's a few evenings afterwards. I found that he admitted the action of spirits, and was a spiritualist but also a great deal more, having studied long and deeply into the occult mysteries of the Orient. 
so I understood him to convey, while he seemed to prefer to refer me to his book, which he would probably publish in the course of the present year. I observed a number of loose sheets on a table all covered with oriental characters unknown to me the work of Manawai. In trance, as he said, in answer to an inquiry, he told us that in the scene I had witnessed, she became, i.e., as I presumed, was possessed by, a priestess of one of the ancient Egyptian temples, and that the origin of it was this, a scientific friend of his had acquired in Egypt possession of the mummy of a priestess, and had given him some of the linen swathings with which the body was enveloped, and from the contact with this cloth of two thousand or three thousand years old, the devotion of her whole existence to this occult relation, and twenty years' seclusion from the world, his medium, a sensitive Madame Y, had become what I had seen. The language I had heard her speak was the sacred language of the temples in which she had been instructed, not so much by inspiration but very much as we now study languages, by dictation, written exercises, etc., being even chided and punished when she was dull or slow. He said that Jacqueline had heard her in a similar scene, and recognized sounds and words of the very oldest sacred language as preserved in the temples of India, interior, if I remember right, to the epoch of the Sanskrit. Respecting the snakes he had employed in the hasty operation of restoring her to life, or rather perhaps arresting the last consummation of the process of death, he said there was a strange mystery in their relation to the phenomena of life and death. I understood that they were indispensable. Silence and inaction on our part were also insisted upon throughout, and any attempt at questioning him at the time was peremptorily, almost angrily, suppressed. We might come and talk afterward, or wait for the appearance of his book, but he alone seemed entitled to exercise the faculty of. p. 611. Speech throughout all these performances which he certainly did with great volubility, the while, with all the eloquence and precision of diction of a Frenchman, combining scientific culture with vividness of imagination. I intended to return on some subsequent evening, but learned from Mr. Gledstains that he had given them up for the present, disgusted with his ill success in getting his professional colleagues and men of science to come and witness what it was his object to show them. This is about as much as I can recall this strange, weird evening, excepting some uninteresting details. I've given you the name and address of Dr. X confidentially, because he would seem to have gone more or less far on the same path as you pursue in the studies of your Theosophical Society. Beyond that I feel bound to keep it private, not having his authority to use it in any way which might lead to publicity. Very respectfully. Your friend and obedient servant. J. L. O'Sullivan. In this interesting case simple spiritualism has transcended its routine and encroached upon the limits of magic. The features of mediumship are there, in the double life led by the sensitive Madame Y, in which she passes an existence totally distinct from the normal one, and by reason of the subordination of her individuality to a foreign will, becomes the permutation of a priestess of Egypt, and in the personation of the spirit of Beethoven, and in the unconscious and cataleptic state into which she falls. On the other hand, the willpower exercised by Dr. X upon his sensitive, the tracing of the mystic circle, the evocations, the materialization of the desired flower, the seclusion and education of Madame Y, the employment of the wand in its form, the creation and use of the serpents, the evident control of the astral forces all these pertain to magic. Such experiments are of interest and value to science, but liable to abuse in the hands of a less conscientious practitioner than the eminent gentleman designated as Dr. X. A true oriental catalyst would not recommend their duplication. Spheres unknown below our feet, spheres still more unknown and still more unexplored above us, between the two a handful of moles, blind to God's great light, and deaf to the whispers of the invisible world, boasting that they lead mankind. Where? Onward, they claim, but we have a right to doubt it. The greatest of our physiologists, when placed side by side with a Hindu fakir, who knows neither how to read nor write, will very soon find himself feeling as foolish as a schoolboy who has neglected to learn his lesson. It is not by vivisecting living animals that a physiologist will assure himself of the existence of man's soul, nor on the blade of the knife can he extract it from a human body. What sane man, inquires Sergeant Cox, the president of the London Psychological Society, what sane man who knows nothing of magnetism or physiology, who had never witnessed an experiment nor learned its. p. 612 principles, would proclaim himself a fool by denying his facts and denouncing its theory? The truthful answer to this would be, two-thirds of our modern-day scientists. The impertinence, if truth can ever be impertinent, 
must be laid at the door of him who uttered it a scientist of the number of those few who are brave and honest enough to utter wholesome truths, however disagreeable. And there is no mistaking the real meaning of the imputation, for immediately after the irreverent inquiry, the learned lecturer remarks as pointedly, the chemist takes his electricity from the electrician, the physiologist looks to the geologist for his geology each would deem an impertinence and the other if he were to pronounce judgment in the branch of knowledge not his own. Strange it is, but true is strange, that this rational rule is wholly set at naught in the treatment of psychology. Physical scientists seem themselves competent to pronounce a dogmatic judgment upon psychology and all that appertains to it, without having witnessed any of its phenomena, and in entire ignorance of its principles and practice. We sincerely hope that the two eminent biologists, Mr. Mendeleev, of St. Petersburg, and Mr. Ray Lancaster, of London fame, will bear themselves under the above as unflinchingly as their living victims do and palpitating under their dissecting knives. For a belief to have become universal, it must have been founded on an immense accumulation of facts, tending to strengthen it, from one generation to another. At the head of all such beliefs stands magic, or, if one would prefer occult psychology, who, of those who appreciate its tremendous powers even from its feeble, half-paralyzed effects in our civilized countries, would dare disbelieve in our days the assertions of Porphyry and Proclus, that even inanimate objects, such as statues of gods, could be made to move and exhibit a factitious life for a few moments? Who can deny the allegation? Is it those who testify daily over their own signatures that they have seen tables and chairs move and walk, and pencils write, without contact? Diogenes Laertes tells us of a certain philosopher, Stilpo, who was exiled from Athens by the Areopagus, for having dared to deny publicly that the Minerva of Phidias was anything else than a block of marble. But our own age, after having mimicked the ancients in everything possible, even to their very names, such as senates, prefects, and consuls, etc., and after admitting that Napoleon the Great conquered three-fourths of Europe by applying the principles of war taught by the Caesars and the Alexanders, knows so much better than its preceptors about psychology, that it would vote every believer in animated tables and bedlam. p. 613. Be this as it may, the religion of the ancients is the religion of the future. A few centuries more, and there will linger no sectarian beliefs in either of the great religions of humanity. Romanism and Buddhism, Christianity and Mohammedanism will all disappear before the mighty rush of facts. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh writes the prophet Joel. Verily I say unto you, greater works than these shall you do, promises Jesus. But this can only come to pass when the world returns to the grand religion of the past, the knowledge of those majestic systems which preceded, by far, Brahmanism, and even the primitive monotheism of the ancient Chaldeans. Meanwhile, we must remember the direct effects of the revealed mystery. The only means by which the wise priests of old could impress upon the grosser senses of the multitudes the idea of the omnipotency of the creative will or first cause, namely, the divine animation of inert matter, the soul infused into it by the potential will of man, the microcosmic image of the great architect, and the transportation of ponderous objects through space and material obstacles. Why should the pious Roman Catholic turn away and discuss that the heathen practices of the Hindu Tamil, for instance? We have witnessed the miracle of San Gennaro, in good old Naples, and we have seen the same in Nagarcoil, in India. Where is the difference? The coagulated blood of the Catholic saint is made to boil and fume in its crystal bottle, to the gratification of the Lazzaroni, and from its jeweled shrine the martyr's idol beams radiant smiles and blessings at the Christian congregation. On the other hand, a ball of clay filled with water, is stuffed into the open breast of the god Saron, and while the Padre shakes his bottle and produces his miracle of the blood, the Hindu priest plunges an arrow into the god's breast, and produces his miracle, for the blood gushes forth in streams, and the water is changed into blood. Both Christians and Hindus fall in raptures at the sight of such a miracle. So far, we do not see the slightest difference. But can it be that the pagan learned the trick from San Gennaro? No, oh, Asclepius, says Hermes, that is the highest one is the father of the celestial gods, so is man the artisan of the gods who reside in the temples, and who delight in the society of mortals. Faithful to its origin and nature, humanity perseveres in this imitation of the divine powers, and, if the Father Creator has made in his image the eternal gods, mankind in its turn makes its gods in its own image. And, dost thou speak of statues of gods, O, oh, Trismegistus? Verily, I do, Asclepius, and however great thy defiance 
perceivest thou not that these statues are endowed with reason, that they are animated with a soul, and that they can operate the greatest prodigies? How can we reject the p. 614. Evidence, when we find these gods possessing the gift of predicting the future, which they are compelled to tell, when forced to it by magic spells, as through the lips of the divines in their visions, it is the marvel of marvels that man could have invented and created gods. True, the faith of our ancestors has erred, and in their pride they fell into error as to the precise essence of these gods, but they have still found out that art themselves. Powerless to create soul and spirit, they evoke the souls of angels and demons in order to introduce them into the consecrated statues, and so make them preside at their mysteries, by communicating to idols their own faculty to do good as well as evil. It is not antiquity alone which is full of evidence that the statues and idols of the gods at times exhibited intelligence and locomotive powers. Full in the 19th century, we see the papers recording the capers play by the statue of the Madonna of Lord. This gracious lady, the French Notre Dame, runs away several times to the woods adjoining her usual residence, the parish church. The sexton is obliged to hunt after the runaway, and bring her home more than once. After this begins a series of miracles, healing, prophesying, letter dropping from on high, and what not. These miracles are implicitly accepted by millions and millions of Roman Catholics, numbers of these belonging to the most intelligent and educated classes. Why, then, should we disbelieve in testimony of precisely the same character, given as a contemporary phenomena of the same kind, by the most accredited and esteemed historians by Titus Livy, for instance? Juno, would you please abandon the walls of Vey, and change this abode for that of Rome? inquires of the goddess a Roman soldier, after the conquest of that city. Juno consents, and nodding her head in token of acquiescence, her statue answers, yes, I will. Furthermore, upon their carrying off the figure, it seems to instantly lose its immense weight, adds the historian, and the statue seems rather to follow them than otherwise. With naivete, and a faith bordering on the sublime, de Musos, bravely rushes into the dangerous parallels, and gives a number of instances of Christian as well as heathen miracles of that kind. He prints a list of such walking statues of saints and madonnas, who lose their weight, and move about as so many living men and women, in presence unimpeachable evidence of the same, from classical authors, who describe their miracles. He has but one thought, one anxious and all-overpowering desire to prove to his readers that magic does exist. p. 615. And that Christianity beats it flat. Not that the miracles of the latter are either more numerous, or more extraordinary, or suggestive than those of the pagans. Not at all, and he is a fair historian as to facts and evidence. But, it is his arguments and reflections that are priceless. One kind of miracle is produced by God, the other by the devil, he drags down the deity and placing him face to face with Satan, allows the archenemy to beat the creator by long odds. Not a word of solid evident proof to show the substantial difference between the two kinds of wonders. Would we inquire the reason why he traces in one the hand of God and in the other the horn and hoof of the devil? Listen to the answer, the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolical Church declares the miracles wrought by our faithful sons produced by the will of God, and all others the work of the spirits of hell. Very well, but on what ground? We are shown an endless list of holy writers, of saints who fought during their whole lives with the fiends, and of fathers whose word and authority are accepted as word of God by the same church. Your idols, your consecrated statues are the abode of demons, exclaims Saint Cyprian. Yes, it is these spirits who inspire your divines, who animate the bowels of your victims, who govern the flight of birds, and who, mixing incessantly falsehood with truth, render oracles, and, operate prodigies, their object being to bring you invincibly to their worship. Fanaticism and Religion Fanaticism in science, or fanaticism in any other question becomes a hobby, and cannot but blind our senses. It will ever be useless to argue with a fanatic. And here we cannot help admiring once more the profound knowledge of human nature which dictated to Mr. Sergeant Cox the following words, delivered in the same address as before alluded to, there is no more fatal fallacy than that the truth will prevail by its own force, that it has only to be seen to be embraced. In fact the desire for the actual truth exists in very few minds, and the capacity to discern it in fewer still. When men say that they are seeking the truth, they mean that they are looking for evidence to support some prejudice or prepossession. Their beliefs are molded to their wishes. They see all, and more than all, that seems to tell for that which they desire, 
they are blind as bats to whatever tells against them. The scientists are no more exempt from this common failing than are others. We know that from the remotest ages there has existed a mysterious, awful science, under the name of Thepia. This science taught the art of endowing the various symbols of gods with temporary life and intelligence. p. 616. Statues and blocks of inert matter became animated under the potential will of the Hierophant. The fire stolen by Prometheus had fallen down in the struggle to earth, it embraced the lower regions of the sky, and settled in the waves of the universal ether as the potential akasha of the Hindurites. We breathe and imbibe it into our organic system with every mouthful of fresh air. Our organism is full of it from the instant of our birth. But it becomes potential only under the influx of will and spirit. Left to itself, this life principle will blindly follow the laws of nature, and, according to conditions, will produce health and an exuberance of life, or cause death and dissolution. But, guided by the will of the adept, it becomes obedient, its currents restore the equilibrium in organic bodies, they fill the waste, and produce physical and psychological miracles, well known to mesmerizers. Infused in inorganic and inert matter, they create an appearance of life, hence motion. If to that life an individual intelligence, a personality, is wanting, then the operator must either send his skin like a, his own astral spirit, to animate it, or use his power over the region of nature spirits to force one of them to infuse his entity into the marble, wood, or metal, or, again, be helped by human spirits. But the latter except the vicious, earthbound class will not infuse their essence into these inanimate objects. They leave the lower kinds to produce the similitude of life and animation, and only send their influence through the intervening spheres like a ray of divine light, when the so-called miracle is required for a good purpose. The condition in this is a law in spiritual nature is purity of motive, purity of the surrounding magnetic atmosphere, personal purity of the operator. Thus is it, that a pagan miracle may be by far holier than a Christian one. Who that has seen the performance of the fakirs of southern India, can doubt the existence of Theopia in ancient times? An inveterate skeptic, though more than anxious to attribute every phenomenon to jugglery, still finds himself compelled to testify to facts, and facts that are to be witnessed daily if one chooses. I dare not, he says, speaking of Sheeb Chandor, a fakir of Jaffnapatnam, describe all the exercises which he performed. There are things one dares not say even. p. 617. After having witnessed them, for fear of being charged with having been under an inexplicable hallucination. And yet, ten, nay, twenty times, I saw and saw again the fakir obtain similar results over inert matter. It was but child's play for a charmer to make the flame of candles which had, by his directions, been placed in the remotest corners of the apartment, pale and become extinguished at will, to cause the furniture to move, even the sofas on which we sat, the doors to open and shut repeatedly, and all this without quitting the mat upon which he sat on the floor. Perhaps I will be told that I saw him perfectly. Possibly, but I will say that hundreds and thousands of persons have seen and do see what I have, and things more wonderful, has one of all these discovered the secret, or been able to duplicate these phenomena? And I can never repeat too often that all this does not occur on a stage, supplied with mechanical contrivances for the use of the operator. No, it is a beggar crouched, naked, on the floor, who thus sports with your intelligence, your senses, and all that which we have agreed among ourselves to style the immutable laws of nature, but which he appears to alter at will. Does he change its course? No, but he makes it act by using forces which are yet unknown to us, say the believers. However that may be, I have found myself twenty times at similar performances in company with the most distinguished men of British India professors, physicians, officers. Not one of them but thus summarized his impressions upon quitting the drawing room. This is something terrifying to human intelligence. Every time that I saw repeated by Fakir the experiment of reducing serpents to a cataleptic state, a condition in which these animals have all the rigidity of the dry branch of a tree, my thoughts have reverted to the biblical fable, which endows Moses and the priests of Pharaoh with the like power. Assuredly, the flesh of man, beast, and bird should be as easily endowed with magnetic life principle as the inert table of a modern medium. Either both wonders are possible and true, or both must fall to the ground, together with the miracles of apostolic days, and those of the more modern popish church. As for vital proofs furnished to us in favor of such possibilities, we might name books enough to fill a whole library.
If Sixtus V cited a formidable array of spirits attached to various talismans, it was not his threat of excommunication for all those who practiced the art, uttered merely because he would have the knowledge of the secret confined within the precincts of the church? How would it do for his divine miracles to be studied and successfully reproduced by? p. 618. Every man endowed with perseverance, a strong positive magnetic power, and an unflinching will? Recent events at Lord, of course, supposing them to have been truthfully reported, prove that the secret is not wholly lost, and if there is no strong magician mesmerizer concealed under frock and surplice, then the statue of Notre Dame is moved by the same forces which move every magnetized table at a spiritual seance, and the nature of these intelligences, whether they belong to the classes of human, human elementary, or elemental spirits depends on a variety of conditions. With one who knows anything of mesmerism, and at the same time of the charitable spirit of the Roman Catholic Church, it ought not to be difficult to comprehend that the incessant curses of the priests and monks, and the bitter anathema so freely pronounced by Pius IX, himself a strong mesmerizer, and believed to be a jeditor, evil eye, have drawn together legions of elementaries and elementals under the leadership of the disembodied Torquemadas. These are the angels who play pranks with the statue of the Queen of Heaven. Anyone who accepts the miracle and thinks otherwise blasphemes. Although it would seem as if we had already furnished sufficient proofs that modern science has little or no reason to boast of originality, yet before closing this volume we will adduce a few more to place the matter beyond doubt. We have but to recapitulate, as briefly as possible, the several claims to new philosophies and discoveries, the announcement of which has made the world open its eyes so wide within these last two centuries. We have pointed to the achievements in arts, sciences, and philosophy of the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Chaldeans, and Assyrians, we will now quote from an author who has passed long years in India studying their philosophy. In the famous and recent work of Krishna et le Christ, we find the following tabulation. Philosophy. The ancient Hindus have created from the foundation the two systems of spiritualism and materialism, of metaphysical philosophy and of positive philosophy. The first taught in the Vedantic school, whose founder was Vyasa, the second taught in the Sankhya school, whose founder was Kapila. Astronomical Science They fixed the calendar, invented the zodiac, calculated the precession of the equinoxes, discovered the general laws of the movements, observed and predicted the eclipses. Mathematics They invented the decimal system, algebra, the differential, integral, and infinitesimal calculi. They also discovered geometry and trigonometry, and in these two sciences they constructed and proved theorems which were only discovered in Europe as late as the 17th and 18th centuries. It was the Brahmins in fact who first deduced the superficial measure of a triangle from the calculation of its three. p. 619. Sides, and calculated the relations of the circumference to the diameter. Furthermore, we must restore to them the square of the hypotenuse in the table so improperly called Pythagorean which we find engraved on the Karama of the majority of great pagodas. Physics. They established the principle which is still our own today, that the universe is a harmonious whole, subject to laws which may be determined by observation and experiment. They discovered hydrostatics, and the famous proposition that every body plunged in water loses of its own weight a weight equal to the volume which it displaces, is only a loan made by the Brahmins to the famous Greek architect, Archimedes. The physicists of the pagodas calculated the velocity of light, fixed in a positive manner the laws which it follows in its reflection. And finally, it is beyond doubt, from the calculations of Surya Siddhanta, that they knew and calculated the force of steam. Chemistry. They knew the composition of water, and formulated for gases the famous law, which we know only from yesterday, that the volumes of gas are an inverse ratio to the pressures that they support. They knew how to prepare sulfuric, nitric, and muriatic acids, the oxides of copper, iron, lead, tin, and zinc, the sulfurates of iron, copper, mercury, antimony, and arsenic, the sulfates of zinc and iron, the carbonates of iron, lead, and soda, nitrate of silver, and powder. Medicine. Their knowledge was truly astonishing. In Charaka and Susruta, the two princes of Hindu medicine, is laid down the system which Hippocrates appropriated later. Suzruta notably enunciates the principles of preventive medicine or hygiene, which he places much above curative medicine too often, according to him, empirical. Are we more advanced today? It is not without interest to remark that the Arab physicians, 
who enjoyed a merited celebrity in the Middle Ages Averroes among others constantly spoke of the Hindu physicians, and regarded them as the initiators of the Greeks and themselves. Pharmacology. They knew all the simples, their properties, their use, and upon this point have not yet ceased to give lessons to Europe. Quite recently we have received from them the treatment of asthma, with the detura. Surgery. In this they are not less remarkable. They made the operation for the stone, succeeded admirably in the operation for cataract, and the extraction of the fetus, of which all the unusual or dangerous cases are described by Chiraka with an extraordinary scientific accuracy. Grammar. They formed the most marvelous language in the world to Sanskrit which gave birth to the greater part of the idioms of the Orient, and of Indo-European countries. Poetry. They have treated all the styles, and shown themselves. P. 620. Supreme Masters in all. Shakuntala, Avrita, the Hindu Phaedra, Saranga, and a thousand other dramas have their superiors neither in Sophocles nor Euripides, in Corneille nor Shakespeare. Their descriptive poetry has never been equaled. One must read, in the Megadatta, the plaint of an exile, who implores a passing cloud to carry his remembrances to his cottage, his relatives and friends, whom he will never see more, to form an idea of the splendor to which this style has been carried in India. Their fables have been copied by all modern and ancient peoples, who have not even given themselves the trouble to color differently the subject of these little dramas. Music they invented the gamut with its differences of tones and half-tones much before Gui Daritso. Here is the Hindu scale. Sariga Mapadanisa. Architecture. They seem to have exhausted all that the genius of man is capable of conceiving. Domes, inexpressibly bold, tapering cupolas, minarets, with marble lace, Gothic towers, Greek hemicycles, polychrome style all kinds and all epics are there, betokening the origin and date of the different colonies, which, and emigrating, carried with them their souvenirs of their native art. Such were the results attained by this ancient and imposing Brahmanical civilization. What have we to offer for comparison? Besides such majestic achievements of the past, what can we place that will seem so grandiose and sublime as to warrant our boast of superiority over an ignorant ancestry? Beside the discoverers of geometry and algebra, the constructors of human speech, the parents of philosophy, the primal expounders of religion, the adepts in psychological and physical science, how even the greatest of our biologists and theologians seem dwarfed. Name to us any modern discovery, and we venture to say, that Indian history need not long be searched before the prototype will be found of record. Here we are what the transit of science have accomplished, and all our ideas in process of readjustment to the theories of force correlation, natural selection, atomic polarity, and evolution. And here, to mock our conceit, our apprehensions, in our despair, we may read what Manu said, perhaps ten thousand years before the birth of Christ. The first germ of life was developed by water and heat. Manu, Book I, Sloka 8. Water ascends toward the sky in vapors, from the sun it descends in rain, from the rain are born the plants, and from the plants, animals, Book 3, Sloka 76. Each being acquires the qualities of the one which immediately precedes it, in such a manner that the farther a being gets away from the p. 621. Primal atom of its series, the more he is possessed of qualities and perfections. Book I, Sloka 20. Man will traverse the universe, gradually ascending, and passing through the rocks, the plants, the worms, insects, fish, serpents, tortoises, wild animals, cattle, and higher animals. Such is the inferior degree, Ibid. These are the transformations declared, from the plant up to Brahma, which have to take place in his world, Ibid. The Greek, says Jacolio, is but the Sanskrit. Phidias and Praxiteles have studied in Asia the chef's derve of Danthea, Romana, and Ariavasta. Plato disappears before Jmini and Veda Vyasa, whom he literally copies. Aristotle is thrown into the shade by the Porva Mimanza and the Altar Mimanza, in which one finds all the systems of philosophy which we are now occupied in re-editing, from the spiritualism of Socrates and his school the skepticism of Pyrrho, Montaigne, and Kant, down to the positivism of Latre. Let those who doubt the exactness of the latter assertion read this phrase, extracted textually from the Autar Mimanza, or Vedanta, of Vyasa, who lived at an epoch which the Brahmanical chronology fixes at 10,400 years before our era. We can only study phenomena, verify them, 
and hold them to be relatively true, but nothing in the universe, neither by perception nor by induction, nor by the senses, nor by reasoning, being able to demonstrate the existence of a supreme cause, which could, at a fixed point of time, have given birth to the universe, science has to discuss neither the possibility nor impossibility of this supreme cause. Thus, gradually but surely, will the whole of antiquity be vindicated. Truth will be carefully sifted from exaggeration, much that is now considered fiction may yet be proved fact, and the facts and laws of modern science found to belong to the limbo of exploded myths. When, centuries before our era, the Hindu Brahma Hupto affirmed that the starry sphere was immovable, and that the daily rising and setting of stars confirms the motion of the earth upon its axis, and when Aristarchus of Samos, born 267 years BC, and the Pythagorean philosopher Nisid, the Syracusan, maintained the same, what was the credit given to their theories until the days of Copernicus and Galileo? And the system of these two princes of science a system which has revolutionized the whole world how long will it be allowed to remain as a complete and undisturbed whole? Have we not, at the present moment, in Germany, a learned savant, a professor Schopfer, who, in his public lectures at Berlin, tries to demonstrate, 1, that the earth is immovable, 2, the sun is but a little bigger than it seems, and 3, that Tycho Brahe was perfectly right. p. 622. And Galileo perfectly wrong? And what was Tycho Brahe's theory? Why, that the earth stands immovable in the center of the universe, and that around it, as around its center, the whole of the celestial vault gravitates every 24 hours, and finally, that the sun and moon, apart from this motion, proceed on curved lines peculiar to themselves, while Mercury, with the rest of the planets, describes an epicycloid. We certainly have no intention to lose time nor devote space to either combating or supporting this new theory, which suspiciously resembles the old ones of Aristotle and even the venerable Bede. We will leave the learned army of modern academicians to wash their family linen among themselves, to use an expression of the great Napoleon. But we will, nevertheless, avail ourselves of such a good opportunity as this defection affords to demand once more of science her diploma or patents of infallibility. Alas! Are these, then, the results of her boasted progress? It was hardly more than yesterday when, upon the strength of facts within our own observation, and corroborated by the testimony of a multitude of witnesses, we timidly ventured the assertion that tables, mediums, and Hindu fakirs were occasionally levitated. And when we added that, if such a phenomenon should happen but once in a century, without a visible mechanical cause, then that rising is a manifestation of a natural law of which our scientists are yet ignorant we were called iconoclastic, and charged, in our turn, by the newspapers, with ignorance of the law of gravitation. Iconoclastic or not, we never thought of charging science with denying the rotation of the earth on its axis, or its revolution around the sun. Those two lamps, at least, in the beacon of the academy, we thought would be kept trimmed and burning to the end of time. But, lo! Here comes a Berlin professor and crushes our last hopes that science should prove herself exact in some one particular. The cycle is truly at its lowest point, and a new era has begun. The earth stands still, and Joshua is vindicated. In days of old in 1876 the world believed in centrifugal force, and the Newtonian theory, which explained the flattening of the poles by the rotatory motion of the earth around its axis, was orthodox. Upon this hypothesis, the greater portion of the globular mass was believed to gravitate toward the equator, and in its turn the centrifugal force, acting on the mass with its mightiest power, forced this mass to concentrate itself on the equator. Thus is it that the credulous scientists believe the p. 623. Earth to rotate around its axis, for, were it otherwise, there would exist no centrifugal force, and without this force there could be no gravitation toward the equatorial latitudes. It has been one of the accepted proofs of the rotation of the Earth, and it is this deduction, with several others, that the Berlin professor declares that, in common with many other scientists, he rejects. Is this not ridiculous, gentlemen, he concludes, that we, confiding in what we were taught at school, have accepted the rotation of the Earth around its axis as a fact fully demonstrated, while there is nothing at all to prove it, and it cannot be demonstrated. Is it not cause of astonishment that the scientists of the whole educated world, commencing with Copernicus and Kepler, should have begun by accepting such a movement of our planet, and then three and a half centuries later be searching for such proofs? But, alas, though we search, we find none, as was to be expected. All, all is vain. 
and thus it is that at one stroke the world loses its rotation, and the universe is bereaved of its guardians and protectors, the centrifugal and centripetal forces. Nay, ether itself, blown out of space, is but a fallacy, a myth born of a bad habit of using empty words. The sun is a pretender to dimensions to which it was never entitled, the stars are twinkling dots, and were so expressly disposed at considerable distances from one another by the creator of the universe, probably with the intention that they should simultaneously illumine the vast spaces on the face of our globe says Dr. Schoeffer. And is it so that even three centuries and a half have not sufficed the men of exact science to construct one theory that not a single university professor would dare challenge? If astronomy, the one science built on the adamantine foundation of mathematics, the one of all others deemed as infallible and unassailable as truth itself, can be thus irreverently indicted for false pretenses, what have we gained by cheapening Plato to the prophet of the Babinets? How, then, do they venture to flout at the humblest observer who, being both honest and intelligent, may say he has seen a mediumistic, or magical phenomenon? And how dare they prescribe the limits of philosophical inquiry, to pass beyond which is not lawful? And these quarreling hypotheses still reign as ignorant and superstitious those giant intellects of the past, who handled natural forces like world-building titans, and raised mortality to an eminence where it allied itself with the gods. Strange fate of a century boasting to have elevated exact science to its apex of fame, and now invited to go back and begin its ABC of learning again. Recapitulating the evidence contained in this work, if we begin with the archaic and unknown ages of the Hermetic Commander, and come p. 624. Down to 1876, we find that one universal belief in magic has run through all these centuries. We have presented the ideas of Trismegistus in his dialogue with Asclepius, and without mentioning the thousand and one proofs of the prevalence of this belief in the first centuries of Christianity, to achieve our purpose we have but to quote from an ancient and a modern author. The first will be the great philosopher Porphyry, who several thousand years after the days of Hermes, remarks in relation to the prevailing skepticism of his century, the following, we need not be amazed in seeing the vulgar masses, iota pi omicron lambda lambda omicron iota, perceive in statues merely stone and wood. Thus it is generally with those who, ignorant in letters, find not in style covered with inscriptions but stone, and in written books not but the tissue of the papyrus. And 1,500 years later, we see Mr. Sergeant Cox, and stating the case of the shameful prosecution of a medium by just such a blind materialist, thus expressing his ideas, whether the medium is guilty or guiltless, certain it is that the trial has had the unlooked-for effect of directing the attention of the whole public to the fact that the phenomena are asserted to exist, and by a great number of competent investigators are declared to be true, and of the reality of which every person may, if he pleases, satisfy himself by actual inspection, thus sweeping away, thus and forever, the dark and abasing doctrines of the materialists. Still, in harmony with Porphyry and other theurgists, who affirm the different natures of the manifesting spirits in the personal spirit or will of man, Mr. Sergeant Cox adds, without committing himself any further to a personal decision, true, there are differences of opinions, and perhaps ever will be, as to the sources of the power that is exhibited in these phenomena, but whether they are the product of the psychic force of the circle, or, if spirits of the dead be the agents, as others say, or elemental spirits, whatever it may be, as asserted by a third party, this fact at least is established that man is not wholly material, that the mechanism of man is moved and directed by some non-material that is, some non-molecular structure, which possesses not merely intelligence, but can exercise also a force upon matter, that something to which, for lack of a better title, we have given the name of soul. These glad tidings have by this trial been born to thousands and tens of thousands, whose happiness here, and hopes of a hereafter, have been blighted by the materialists, who have preached so persistently that soul was but a superstition, man but an automaton, mind but a secretion, present existence purely animal, and the future a blank. Truth alone, says Pomander, is eternal and immutable, truth is the first of blessings, but truth is not and cannot be on earth, it is possible that God sometimes gifts a few men together with the faculty of. p. 625 comprehending divine things with that of rightly understanding truth, but nothing is true on earth, for everything has matter on it, clothed with a corporeal form subject to change, to alteration, to corruption, and to new combinations. Man is not the truth, for only that which has drawn its essence from itself, and remains itself, and unchangeable, is true. How can that which changes so as not to finally be recognized, be ever true? 
Truth, then, is that only which is immaterial and not enclosed within a corporeal envelope, that which is colorless and formless, exempt from change and alteration, that which is eternal. All of that which perishes is a lie, earth is but dissolution and generation, every generation proceeds from a dissolution, the things of earth are but appearances and imitations of truth, they are what the picture is to reality. The things of earth are not the truth, death, for some persons, is an evil which strikes them with profound terror. This is ignorance. Death is the destruction of the body, the being in it dies not. The material body loses its form, which is disintegrated in course of time, the senses which animated it return to their source and resume their functions, but they gradually lose their passions and their desires, and the spirit ascends to heaven to become a harmony. In the first zone, it leaves behind itself the faculty of increasing and decreasing, in the second, the power of doing evil and the frauds of idleness, in the third, deceptions and concupiscence, in the fourth, insatiable ambition, in the fifth, arrogance, audacity, and temerity, in the sixth, all yearning after dishonest acquisitions, and in the seventh, untruthfulness. The spirit thus purified by the effect on him of the celestial harmonies, returns once more to its primitive state, strong of a merit and power self-acquired, and which belongs to it properly, and only then he begins to dwell with those that sing eternally their praises of the Father. Hitherto, he is placed among the powers, and as such has attained to the supreme blessing of knowledge. He has become a god, no, the things of earth are not the truth. After having devoted their whole lives to the study of the records of the old Egyptian wisdom, both Champollion Fijac and Champollion, Jr., publicly declared, notwithstanding many biased judgments hazarded by certain hasty and unwise critics, that the books of Hermes truly contain a mass of Egyptian traditions which are constantly corroborated by the most authentic records and monuments of Egypt of the hoariest antiquity. Closing up his voluminous summary of the psychological doctrines of the Egyptians, the sublime teachings of the sacred hermetic books, and p. 626. The attainments of the initiated priests in metaphysical and practical philosophy, Champollion Fijac inquires as he well may, in view of the then attainable evidence whether there ever was in the world another association or caste of men which could equal them in credit, power, learning, and capability, in the same degree of good or evil? No, never and this caste was subsequently cursed and stigmatized only by those who, under I know not what kind of modern influences, have considered it as the enemy of men and science. At the time when Champollion wrote these words, Sanskrit was, we may say, almost an unknown tongue for science. But little in the way of a parallel could have been drawn between the respective merits of the Brahmins and the Egyptian philosophers. Since then, however, it has been discovered that the very same ideas, expressed in almost identical language, may be read in the Buddhistic and Brahmanical literature. This very philosophy of the unreality of mundane things and the illusion of the senses whose whole substance has been plagiarized in our own times by the German metaphysicians forms the groundwork of Kapila's and Vyasa's philosophies, and may be found in Gautama Buddha's enunciation of the Four Truths, the cardinal dogmas of his doctrine. Commander's expression he has become a god is epitomized in the one word, nirvana, which our learned Orientalists most incorrectly consider as the synonym of annihilation. This opinion of the two eminent Egyptologists is of the greatest value to us if it were only as an answer to our opponents. The Champollions were the first in Europe to take the student of archaeology by the hand, and, leading him on into the silent crypts of the past, prove that civilization did not begin with our generations, for though the origins of ancient Egypt are unknown, she is found to have been at the most distant periods within the reach of historical research with her great laws, her established customs, her cities, her kings, and gods, and behind, far behind, these same epics we find ruins belonging to other still more distant and higher periods of civilization. At Thebes, portions of ruined buildings allow us to recognize remnants of still interior structures, the materials of which had served for the erection of the very edifices which have now existed for thirty-six centuries. Everything told us by Herodotus and the Egyptian priests is found to be exact, and has been corroborated by modern scientists, at Champollion. Once the civilization of the Egyptians came, will be shown in Volume 2, and in this respect it will be made to appear that our deductions, though based upon the traditions of the secret doctrine, run parallel. p. 627. With those of a number of most respected authorities. There is a passage in a well-known Hindu work which may well be recalled in this connection. Under the reign of Viswamitra, first king of the dynasty of Somavanga, 
in consequence of a battle which lasted five days, Manavina, heir of the ancient kings, being abandoned by the Brahmins, emigrated with all his companions, passing through Arya, and the countries of Barya, till he came to the shores of Mazra, history of India, by Kalo Kabata. Unquestionably this Manavina and Menes, the first Egyptian king, are identical. Arya, Isaran, Persia, Barya, is Arabia, and Masra, was the name of Cairo, which to this day is called, Masr, Mizar, and Misro. Phoenician history names Mazar as one of the ancestors of Hermes. And now we will bid farewell to Thaumatophobia and its advocates, and consider Thaumatomania under its multifarious aspects. In Volume 2, we intend to review the miracles of paganism and weigh the evidence in their favor in the same scales with Christian theology. There is a conflict not merely impending but already begun between science and theology, on the one hand, and spirit and its hoary science, magic, on the other. Something of the possibilities of the latter have already been displayed, but more is to come. The petty, mean world, for whose approving not scientists and magistrates, priests and Christians compete, have begun their latter-day crusade by sentencing in the same year two innocent men, one in France, the other in London, in defiance of law and justice. Like the Apostle of Circumcision, they are ever ready to thrice deny an unpopular connection for fear of ostracism by their own fellows. The psychomantics and the psychophobists must soon meet in fierce conflict. The anxiety to have their phenomena investigated and supported by scientific authorities has given place with the former to a frigid indifference. As a natural result of so much prejudice and unfairness as have been exhibited, the respect for scientists is waning fast, and the reciprocal epithets bandied between the two parties are becoming far from complementary to either. Which of them is right and which wrong, time will soon show and future generations understand. It is at least safe to prophesy that the ultima fool of God's mysteries, and the key to them are to be sought elsewhere than in the world of Avogadro's molecules. People who either judge superficially, or, by reason of their natural impatience would gaze at the blazing sun before their eyes are well fitted to bear lamplight, are apt to complain of the exasperating obscurity of language which characterizes the works of the ancient Hermetists and their successors. They declare their philosophical treatises on magic incomprehensible. Over the first class we can afford to waste no. p. 628. Time, the second, we would beg to moderate their anxiety, remembering those sayings of a spagnet truth lies hid in obscurity, and philosophers never write more deceitfully than one plainly, nor ever more truly than one obscurely. Furthermore, there is a third class, whom it would compliment too much to say that they judge the subject at all. They simply denounce ex cathedra. The ancients they treat as dreamy fools, and though but physicists and thaumatophobic positivists, they commonly claim a monopoly of spiritual wisdom. We will select irony as Philolitha to answer this latter class and the world or writing shall prove a curious edged knife, to some they shall carve out dainties, but to others they shall only serve to cut their fingers. Yet we are not to be blamed, for we do seriously admonish all who shall attempt this work that they undertaketh the highest piece of philosophy in nature, and though we write in English, yet our matter will be as hard as Greek to some, who will think, nevertheless, that they understand as well, when they misconstrue our meaning most perversely, for is it imaginable that they who are fools in nature should be wise in books? which are testimonies unto nature? The few elevated minds who interrogate nature instead of prescribing laws for her guidance, who do not limit her possibilities by the imperfections of their own powers, and who only disbelieve because they do not know, we would remind of that apothem of Narada, the ancient Hindu philosopher. Never utter these words, I do not know this therefore it is false. One must study to know, know to understand, understand to judge. End of Volume 1